The contents of my wardrobe were worth well above 100,000 francs. 100,000 crowns was the value of the jewelries and diamonds I wore. Wherever I went, every door was open to me, and that day the minister's domestics bowed low. He was awaiting me. He was alone. I began by mentioning the tokens of royal esteem which had been showered upon him. My congratulations were of the sincerest, and I sought leave to kiss. His hand he accorded it, provided I kneel while doing so familiar with the dimensions of his pride. His arrogance I catered to them and adjusted my nag. Behavior to his wishes, it is by base flattery and abjectness that the courtesan, like the courtier, buys the right to be insolent to everybody else. Spoke he, madame. You see me in the hour of my glory the king has dealt largely with me. And I dare say, according to my deserts, my position has never been so solid, nor my fortune so great. If, as I propose to do, I make you the beneficiary of some small part of His Majesty's bounty, it shall be upon the obvious. Conditions in view of the projects we have executed jointly. I believe I can rely upon you. You have acquired my total confidence. But, before I descend to particulars, kindly look at these two keys, madame. This first one opens the vault where is stored all the gold due to be yours, if you serve me well, and this other is to the Bastille in it there is a vacant cell. It is reserved for your lifelong occupancy, should you fail of obedience or discretion. Confronted by such alternatives, one of doom, the other of glittering prosperity, hardly need indicate which of the two I elect unhesitatingly. So place your whole trust in her who shall be absolutely your slave, and put away all doubts of her loyalty. You will have the charge of two important functions, madame. Be seated, please, and heed me. Not thinking what I was about, I was taking an armchair when St. Fawn gestured me toward an ordinary. Straight back chair he cut me short in the middle of my profuse apology. And continued in this wise, the post I hold, and in which it is my aim to remain yet a good while, for it is a rewarding one, obliges me to sacrifice no. End of victims in this casket, there are various poisons. You shall employ them pursuant to the instructions I issue you. Upon those individuals who come actively at cross-purposes with me, the cruelest are you see. They are labeled the speedy upon those whose hoes. Existence is merely a vexation to me, and whom I prefer to waste no time dispatching from the world. And these, marked slow, are for those with whom I am obliged to proceed unhurriedly, whether because of political reasons or simply to divert suspicion away from myself. Depending upon the specific case, the envenoming will be accomplished either here in Paris, at your home or at mine, or in the provinces, or, again, abroad. Now, as to the second of your functions in all likelihood the more arduous of the two, it will also prove the more lucrative, however. Endowed with a very precent imagination, everyday pleasures meaning nothing to me anymore, nature having given me a very fiery temperament, eminently cruel tastes, and where means are concerned all that is needed to satisfy these furious passions, I shall, whether at your residence or at Norswell, or at the home of someone or other of my friends, Sup in the Liberty Manor twice a week at each of these routes. A minimum of three victims must infallibly and obligatorily be sacrificed. Her year, if we deduct the time spent in Travelangio, will accompany me on some of my journeys that comes, I believe, to approximately two hundred whores, the procuring whereof is to be your concern only howbeit. These victims must meet certain specifications. Firstly, Juliet. The ugliest of them all has got to be at least as well favored as yourself. I accept none younger than not. Nor above sixteen years of age, each must be a virgin, of excellent birth, titled if possible, wealthy in any case. And you mean to say, my lord, that you destroy all those? Indeed I do, madame. Murder is the sweetest of all my voluptuous practices. There are no limits to my fondness for blood. Shedding it is the foremost of my passions, and to satisfy them all, come what may and hang the price, there's the foremost of my principles.
Seeing that St. Fond was waiting for my response, I said, My lord, what I have revealed to you so far of my character must, I should think, be sufficient proof that I cannot possibly fail you my self-interest and tastes are your guarantee of my good faith. Yes, my lord, it is very true. Nature gave me the same passions, she gave you the same cast of mind, too, and he who indulges in these things out of love of them will surely serve you better than he who obeys in order to please you rather than himself the bond of friendship. A similarity of taste such, be sure of it. Such are the ties that most powerfully bind a woman like me. As regards friendship, ah, refrain from alluding to it, Juliet, the minister said very sharply. I hold that sentiment as empty, as illusory as love. Whatever originates in the heart is false for my part. I believe in the senses alone. I believe alone in the carnal habits and appetites in self-seeking, in self-aggrandizement, in self-interest. I, self-interest, of all possible bonds, shall always be the one in which I shall place the greatest faith, and I would, therefore have it that the arrangements I am going to conclude with you be overwhelmingly to your personal advantage. Should taste develop later on, as decoration to the self-interest structure, well and good, but tastes are fickle. They change with the years. The time may even come when one is guided by them. No longer but one always is by self-interest. So let us reckon up your little fortune, Madame Marceau has assured you ten thousand livres. Per annum, I've provided you with three. You had twelve before, that makes twenty-five. And here are twenty-five thousand more put this contract in a place of safekeeping. Where are we now? Fifty? Fifty. Now let's enter into a few details. The minister was not displeased to have me prostrate myself before him when I was done airing my thanks. He bade me return to my chair and hear him out. I am quite as aware as you, Juliet, that with such a slender revenue, you could not hope to provide for the two weekly suppers I shall require, nor dream of maintaining the house I ordered you to take hence. I shall give you a million to defray the cost of those suppers, but bear it well in mind that they are to be of unparalleled magnificence, the most exquisite meats, the rarest wines. The most extraordinary fowl and fruits will be served at them always, and immense quantity must be joined to the finest in quality, even if we were only two to dine. Fifty courses would obviously be too few. You will have twenty thousand francs apiece for the victims, and that is not overmuch in view of the standards they shall have to meet. You will be allotted a further thirty thousand francs gratuity for every ministerial victim you immolate personally. There will be roughly fifty of these each year. This article thus coming to some fifteen hundred thousand francs annually, to which I am adding a monthly twenty thousand francs for your appointments. And thus I have erred in my computations. This, madame, totals to a yearly six million seven hundred ninety thousand francs. We shall throw in two hundred ten thousand more for your pocket money. Supplementary charges and divers trifles, so rounding the sum out to an even seven million, whereof, if you like, you may bank fifty thousand yours by contract. Will this do, Julia? Suppressing all outward signs of a tremendous elation, for greater yet was the greed consuming me. I was silent a moment, pursing my lips and seeming to take counsel with myself then, I ventured to draw the minister's attention to certain facts the duties he was prescribing me were, to say the least, quite as onerous as the sums of which he was making me mistress, were considerable I was eager, that he never be caused the slightest disappointment it seemed to me altogether possible, nay, likely, that the huge expenses I was going to have to incur would largely exceed the resources at my disposal, and that, besides, you need say no more. The minister interrupted. You have spoken in an idiom I apprehend perfectly, and you have persuaded me that you have your own interest ever in view. That, Juliet, is precisely what I wish for. I now know that I shall be irreproachably served. Stint on nothing, madame, and you will have ten million a year. We have no reason to be niggardly. A contemptible fool. That statesman who neglects to have the state finance his pleasures, and if the masses go hungry, 
if the nation goes naked. What do we care so long as our passions are satisfied? Mine entail inordinate spending if I thought gold flowed in their veins. I'd have every one of the people bled to death. And true on. Two. Adorable man, I cried. Your philosophy positively inflames me. A moment ago you detected the motive of selfishness in me. It is now doubled by that of taste. Believe me. And be persuaded also that my zeal in your service shall be owing a thousand times more to worship of such pleasures than to any other cause. I have witnessed you in action. St. Fond, rejoined your conduct augured well. And indeed, how could you help but be enamored of my passions? The human heart is capable of engendering none more delicious than they. And he who is in a position to say no prejudice hinders me. I have overcome them all on the one hand. I possess the influence that legitimate. My every gesture on the other, the means necessary to committing every crime, I tell you. Juliet, such a one is the happiest of mortals. Ah, um, mes eyes, the... That reminds me, madame, of the patents of impunity Dalbert promised you when last we supped together. I have the papers here. They arrived this morning. It was I who requested them of the Chancellor. Not Dalbert, whose habitual forgetfulness, you understand, goes with his post. This multitude of favorable developments, this windfall, the prospects opened up to May, was as though spellbound and quite speechless. St. Fon brought me forth from my trance when he drew me to him and asking, How long shall it be ere we begin, Juliet? kissed me and ran his hand down my behind, into which he promptly popped a finger. My lord, said I, I must have three weeks at least to ready all the organization. Three weeks, then. Today is the first of the month, Juliet. I shall sup at your residence on the twenty-second, at seven. There is something else, my lord, I went on. You have deigned to describe your taste to me, I may perhaps tell you something of mine. You are already aware of those concerning the crimes I shall be able to commit with you. This document allows me to steal to my heart's desire. Pray furnish me the wherewithal to revenge myself against an eventual enemy. Come with me, said St. Fond. We entered the office of a clerk. My good sir, said the minister. Your attention, please. Look closely at this young lady, remember her. I order you to sign and to deliver to her, upon her simple request, as many letters de cachet as she wishes, whenever and for whatever places of detention she chooses. We return to the chamber we had formerly been in. There, you are prettily equipped, said the minister. Now show what you can do. Burn, trample, hack away, all France is yours, and whatever crime you perpetrate, regardless of its magnitude, its gravity, Perpetrate it intrepidly. For fear you need not. You shall get away scot-free. You have my word. You shall have more as I have told you already. Thirty thousand francs for every crime you commit on your own initiative, on your own behalf. My friends, I shall not attempt to describe the impact these promises, these prospects had upon me. It is well nigh incredible, said I to myself. From the outset, blessed by nature with an imagination tending to extravagance. Here am I now, rich enough to satisfy my every whim, to achieve my every ambition, strong enough to defy any retaliation. No, there are no inward joys comparable to this knowledge that I am powerful, and hence free no lubricity to equal the effect of this one upon the soul. So now, madame, let us seal the bargain, said the minister. Here is a little gift for you, a mere bauble, he went on, handing me a casket where there were five thousand louis in gold, and twice that in gems and jewelry take it along, and don't forget the box of poisons. Then he led me into a secret room, where the furnishings were both sumptuous and bizarre. Henceforth upon entering this place, and while you are here, your condition will be that of a common whore, and at all other times, you will be one of the greatest ladies in the kingdom. Wherever I am, my lord, I shall be your slave, your admirer, eternally, and the very soul of your most exquisite pleasures. 
I undress, thrilled at having found a suitable accomplice at last. St. Fond performed horrors. Of his ways I have told you something. I now discovered more leaving his house I might feel as though I had not my peer in all the world. But when I was in his company, he degraded me unutterably when it was a question of lust. He was truly the filthiest man that can be conceived, the most despotical, the crudest. He had me do reverence to his prick, his ass he shat. I had to make a god of his very mard, but he also had this curious mania. He had me soil those very things. That symbolized all that his pride was founded upon. He insisted that I shit upon various honorific insignia and badges. And he wiped my ass with his cordon blue. I own to him my surprise at this last gesture. I would have you see, Juliet, that such rags and ribbons designed to dazzle fools do not overrow a philosopher. But a short moment ago you obliged me to kiss them. True enough. But just as I pride myself on what these little fripperies represent, so it also flatters my pride prodigiously to profane them. All fist is just a quirk, such as makes sense only to libertines of my species. St. Fon's prick was up in extraordinary size I discharged in his embrace, for those with an imagination like mine. The question is never whether this or that is repulsive. Irregularity is the sole valid consideration, and anything is good provided it be excessive. Something told me he had a burning desire to have me eat his shit. I sought his permission to do so, obtained it. He was in ecstasies he devoured mine, between mouthfuls tonguing my vent at length. He showed me a portrait of his daughter, scarcely fourteen years old, and as lovely a creature as one could behold, I begged him to include her at one of our foregatherings. She is not here, he told me, were she. You'd have already seen her in our midst. I take it you are not sending her to Norcell without having enjoyed her first. That is quite correct, he replied. I would be heartbroken to allow someone else to pluck such delicious first fruits. So you have ceased to love her. Love her? Juliet? I love nothing, nobody, none of us libertines loves anything at all. That child gave me a good many erections. She no longer excites me nowadays. I've wearied myself toying with her. I am giving her to Noircel, whom she heats exceeding light as a matter of mutual convenience, that's all. But when Noisoil tires of her, why, you know the usual fate of his wives, in all likelihood I shall participate in the ceremony myself. I have in others, they are always stimulating. They are always worthwhile. That's the sort of thing I like. And his prick soared another inch. My lord, said I, it seems to me that if I were in your position, I'd be tempted to abuse my authority at certain moments. When stiff, you mean to say? Yes, it sometimes happens. Oh, my lord, I began. Then let's massacre some innocents, shall we? The idea makes my brain whirl. I was frigging him. One of my fingers was tickling his asshole. One moment, said he, removing a sheet of paper from his pocket and unfolding it. I have but to put my signature to that, and a very attractive person dies tomorrow. She is in prison at the moment I issued the warrant upon the request of her family. Their single grievance is that she prefers women to men. I have seen her, she is charming, I amused myself with her the other day. And since then, I have been so anxious lest she blabbed, that my one thought, or rather desire, has been to get rid of her. Ah, my lord. Shall talk if given the chance. Shall talk. Your fears are only too well founded so long as that girl is alive. You will be in constant danger. Therefore, and if I implore you to do so, it is because your safety depends on it. Sign that paper. And taking it from his hand, I placed it flat against my buttocks. There is a quill on that desk, and an inkhorn. He signed his name. I am quite willing to carry it to the clerk myself, I said. As you like, said he. But one thing at a time. Presently, I must discharge Juliet. That all reach its proper climax, I have need of further assistance. He read. Pray be not alarmed, he went on. It is a ritual. And the next moment, a pretty youth appeared in the doorway. Kindly kneel, Juliet. 
This young man is to bestow three blows of a cane upon your shoulders. The traces will last only a few days afterward. He will hold you steady while I embugger you. And the newcomer, having stripped off his pantaloons, straightway gave his behind to be called by the minister, who licked it complacently. In the meantime, I knelt down the youth picks up his cane, and so smart were the three cuts he gave me the marks, showed for the space of a fortnight. While the boy was laying on, St. Fond, sitting opposite me, watched with lewd curiosity. Then he came up and examined the stripes on my skin, grumbled about their faintness, bade the boy take hold of me, and while sodomizing me, vigorously, very vigorously, kissed the hinder parts belonging to him, who was accessory to the operation. Ah, f my eyes, he cried, loosing his seed. Ah, uh, God be double f the whole marked. The mysterious youth withdrew. It was not until long afterward that an event I will relate in due course shed light on his character and identity. Saint Fond escorted me out of the boudoir, and once we had left it, reassumed his former thoughtful air. Take the caskets with you, madame, said he, and remember that our schedule calls for operations to begin three weeks from today. Very well. Libertinage, crime, discretion. Juliet, and your welfare is assured. Adieu. The very first thing I did was examine the order of execution whereof I was the bearer. Great heavens! What was my amazement to discover that here in black and white were instructions to the supervisor of the convent prison, in question secretly to poison who? None other than Saint Tilma. That charming novice I had fairly worshipped during my sojourn at Panthema. Another person would perhaps have torn up that baneful piece of paper, not I, I. For I was too far advanced in my criminal career to quail. I did not even pause. No, nor waver for an instant. With determined step, I betake myself to Santa Pelagie, where St. Tilm had been languishing three long months behind bars. I transmit the order into the hands of the head warden. Ask to see the culprit, I interrogate her. She declares the minister offered to arrange her liberation in return for her favors, and that she did with him all that it is possible for a woman to do. The lecherous monster had omitted not a single episode in his repertory of abominations mouth. Ass! Cunt the beast had defiled her everywhere, and as consolation for this evil treatment, she had been given nothing but the hope of having her freedom restored to her. I have with me the document. That will put an end to your misery, I say, kissing her. Santiuma thanks me, repays my caresses tenfold. I notice that betraying her is moistening my cunt. The following day, she was dead. Faith, said I to myself upon learning of the outcome of my scurvy deed. I can do better than that. I was made for great things. I feel it and setting myself promptly to work, preparing the stage for the scenes St. Fond, was to enact, within the space of three weeks I was, as I had promised, able to provide the first of his suppers. Six excellent procuresses I had taken into my employ supplied me, for my debut. Three young sisters spirited away from a pious retreat in Mo, twelve, thirteen, and fourteen years of age, and positively celestial in face and figure. That first evening the minister appeared in the company of a man in his sixties. Upon arriving he encloseted himself for several minutes with me, inspected my shoulders, and appeared irritated at finding no traces left of the stripes he had had inflicted upon me at our last encounter. Scarcely did he touch me, but he advised the greatest respect and the profoundest submissiveness in my behavior. Toward the individual who had come with him, he being one of the foremost personages at the court, a prince. The latter entered the room as soon as St. Fond left it. Forewarned by my lover, I turned and exhibited my behind as soon as he had shut the door. He approached, a spyglass in his hand. Farsh, he commanded, or be bitten. Unable to satisfy him with all the celerity he desired, I felt a sudden pain in my left buttock. His teeth had caused it. They left deep marks in my flesh. 
He walked around to in front of me. It was a severe and unlovely visage I looked into. Put your tongue in my mouth. I did so. Whereupon, he said belch. Or be bitten. But seeing that I couldn't obey, I backed away quickly enough to avoid the trap. The old rascal flies into a fury. He catches up a bundle of withes and belabors me for a quarter of an hour. Then he stops and walks around to in front of me again. You behold the little effect even these activities I am fondest of have upon my senses nowadays, consider. Said he, this limp prick, nothing hoists. Nothing. To bring it at all aloft, it'll be obliged to cause you much hurt. There'll be no need for that, my prince, said I, since you're soon to have at your disposal three delicious objects whom you can torment in whatever way you like. I. But you are attractive, your ass, said he, fondling it apace. Pleases me infinitely, I'd like to stiffen for its sake. So saying, he rids himself of his clothing, and upon the mantel lays a diamond-studded timepiece, a gold snuff-box, his purse overflowing, two hundred louis, and two superb rings. Let's have another try now. Here, take hold of my ass. You must pinch and bite it hard, fearfully hard. And why you do that, frig me with the supplest possible risk. Good. Excellent. He cried upon perceiving some slight improvement in his state. Now stretch out on this couch, will you? And let me prick your buttocks with this hat pin. I lie down. Steady, says the prince. But I emit a loud scream and seem about to faint away at a second thrust, confused and a flutter and dreading lest by using hiss. Mr. Somewhat too roughly, he give offense to the minister. The prince scurries from the room, hoping his departure will quiet me. I fling his clothes into an adjoining chamber, pounce upon his valuables, and hurriedly rejoin St. Fond, who inquires of me, Is there anything amiss? Nothing at all, say I. But from being in too great haste fetching his highness' clothes, I let the door to my boudoir shut to, the key is inside, and these English locks there's no opening them. But never mind, monsieur has his shirt and breeches here. We can defer the interview he desires until some later time. And I draw my two guests out into the garden, where everything has been put in readiness to receive them though all. Prince forgets his belongings, dons the costume I tender him, and is mindful only of the pleasures yet to come. The weather that evening was faultless, we were beneath a bower of roses with lilac bushes all around us. A multitude of candles furnished the light. Our seats were three thrones supported on artificial clouds. Whence came the scent of the most delicious perfumes. In the center of the table was a very mountain of the rarest flowers. Set amongst which were the jade and porcelain cups and plates. We were to drink from and dine off the service was of gold. No sooner had we taken our places than the bower opened overhead, and before our eyes there descended a fiery cloud upon it. The three furies, imprisoned in the coils of their serpents, the three victims destined to be sacrificed at this feast. The furies alighted from their aerial car, each chained the victim in her keeping to boxwoods near where we were sitting, then stood by in readiness. No previously established program decided the order of that meal. It was to shape itself according to the wishes. Of my guests, anything you happen to wish you simply demanded, and the Furies brought it to you instantly. Above eighty widely varying dishes are called for. Every one is served up in a trice ten kinds of wines are requested. All ten flow. Everything is there in plenty, in profusion. Nicely done, my lover remarked. I trust your grace is satisfied with my directress' initial effort? Enchanted, answered the sexagerian, his head reeling from the abundance of food and spirits, and his tongue thick already. Indeed, St. Fond, I envy you your divine Juliette, have never clapped eyes on a fairer ass. Nor have I. The minister owned that I suggest we leave it alone for a while, and concern ourselves with those belonging to our furies, who, if I'm not greatly mistaken, are superbly fleshed also. And at that hint, the three goddesses, 
impersonated by the three loveliest girls my purveyors had been able to locate for me after ransacking the whole of Paris, immediately bared their behinds to the two libertines, who kissed them, licked them, gnawed them, with much relish and complete abandon. My good Saint Fond, the prince stuttered, shall we have ourselves flogged by these furies? With rose branches, Saint Fond proposed, and there are a lecher's backsides exposed, being cruelly lashed now by garlands of flowers, now by the fury snakes. Very lubricious indeed, these exercises, remarked Saint Fond, resuming his chair and pointing to his towering device, say now, my prince, are you stiffening a little? No, the hapless old dotard answered, I require more potent stimulants than any of these immediately when I enter into debauch. I like to be environed by atrocities in uninterrupted sequence. I like to have all that men hold sacred violated in the interests of my pleasure, all that is wholly soiled by my doing. You are not a humanitarian then, my prince. I abhor mankind. I strongly doubt, St. Fawn continued, whether at any moment in the day I, for my part, am not animated by the most vehement impulse, or caressing some black scheme. To cause harm to humankind, there is no more execrable species. Be he powerful, then man is dangerous, and no tiger in the jungle can match him for wickedness. Is he puny, weak, woe begone? Then how base he is, how vile, how disgusting within and without. Oh, many a time have I blushed at having been born in the midst of such creatures. My one comfort is that nature loathes them no less than I, for she destroys them daily. I wish only that I had a sass. Many means is she at my command for contriving their undoing had I, I.D., wipe the lot off the face of the earth. But you august beings that you are, I broke in. Do you really think of yourselves as human? Why no? No, when one bears so little resemblance to the common herd, when one dominates it so absolutely, it is impossible to be of its race. You know, said Saint Fond, she is quite right we are so many gods as it is with them. So is it with us though we not have but to formulate desires to have them satisfied instantly. Ah, is it not obvious that among men, or rather above men, there is a class so superior to the weaker sort as to be what of old the poets term divinities. As for myself, I am no Hercules. I sense that I am not, said the prince. But I fain would be Pluto. It would please me mightily to have the task of dismembering mortals in hell. And I should like to be Pandora's box, that the ills emergent from the depths of me might destroy them all piecemeal. Some groans were heard at this point they had been uttered by the three chained victims. Unloose them, said Saint Fond, and bring them hither. The Furies detached them, and led them before my two guests, and since no females can combine grace and beauty in a higher degree, I leave you to imagine to what lecherous attentions they were subjected straightway. Juliet, said the minister, transported, you are a charming and able creature plainly. You have the touch of a master. These results authorize the statement. Come, let's lose ourselves amongst these arbors, amidst these flowers. Come, in shadow and silence, let us give ourselves up to all our brains may dictate. You had some ditches, Doug? Suitably close by, every spot likely to become a theater for your atrocities. Good and no lights along the pathways. None darkness beseems crime. You shall enjoy it in its full horror. Let us be off, my prince and stray into these labyrinths, and accept the challenge to do our worst. We all of us set forth together, the two libertines, the three victims, and I. Entering an alley flanked by hedges, St. Fond exclaimed that he could not proceed. Another step without first find seizing the youngest of the girls. The villain blasted both her maidenheads before rejoining us ten minutes later. During his absence, I sought to excite the old prince, but in vain. Nothing seemed able to rouse his prick. Do you then intend not to fight? St. Fond asked him, laying hands on the second girl. No, no, go on, depucillate, answered the old lecher, 
I'll restrict myself to vexations, pass them on to me one by one when you're through with each. And getting the youngest of those little girls into his clutches, he torments her in the unkindest manner while I suck him with might and main. The while Saint Fawn carries on with his deflowering, and having put the second girl in the same state as the first and turned her over to the prince, he grabs the fourteen-year-old. You have no idea how much I enjoy f in darkness this way, says he. The shades of night are a goad to crime and enormously facilitate, committing it satisfactorily. Saint Fond, who had got this far without discharging, now let fly into the eldest girl's ass, and then he and the prince held parley. It was agreed between them that Saint Fond should retain for himself her, who had just drained out his sperm in exchange. He ceded the two other girls to the prince, and that worthy, armed with all the equipment necessary for the tortures he was contemplating, staggered off in an ecstasy, leading his victims by their chains, while I accompanied my lover and the one who was to die by his hand. When we were gone off a distance, I told him of my theft. We both laughed heartily, and he assured me that, as was his custom, the prince, prior to coming to our party, had visited a brothel with a view to putting himself in the appropriate mood and that nothing would be easier than to convince him his treasures had been stolen there. You are a friend of this man, I suppose? I am friend to no one, the minister gave me answer. My connections with this original have been advantageous so far. He is on the best of terms with the king. But when that changes, let him fall into disgrace tomorrow. And ill be the first to tread upon him. He divined my tastes. I don't know how he gave me to understand his were similar. He proposed we collaborate. I acquiesced hats the extent of our relationship. What is it, Juliet? Do you dislike the fellow? I find him unbearable. Upon my soul, were it not for the political considerations I've just mentioned, I'd be only too happy to see him in your power. Nevertheless, we can perhaps arrange his downfall. For, my dear, you please me to such a degree... There is nothing I am not willing to do for you. You were saying, were you not, that you have obligations toward him? I have a few. Well then, how in the light of your principles, how can you for one instant tolerate being in his debt? Leave everything to me, Julia. And then, Saint Fond, changing the subject, praised me anew for the manner in which I had conducted this feast. You are, said he. A woman of taste and wit, and the better I come to know you, the more I am persuaded that I must attach you to me. And then for the first time he addressed me in the familiar too, and he granted me the yet greater favor of employing that term with him. I shall serve you my whole life long if such be your wish, Saint Fond. I replied, I know your tastes. I shall satisfy them, and if you desire to bind me more closely to you, you will concur in the satisfying of mine. Kiss me, heavenly creature, one hundred thousand crowns shall be delivered to you tomorrow morning, see, if I do not guess your heart's desires. It was at that point an old beggar woman accosted us, asking for alms. What's this? cried St. Fawn, surprised. Do they let the rabble in? The minister gazed inquiringly at me, he detected the smile upon my lips, and grasped the jest at once. Delicious, delicious he murmured. Eh, then, what is it you wish? He went on, turning to the crone. Alas, my lord, a few pennies out of charity, replied she. Come, deign to look upon my misery. And catching the minister by the hand, she guided him into a mean little hut, lit by a lamp, hung from the ceiling. And where two children, one male and the other female, and no older than eight or ten, were lying naked on some rotten straw. Behold this unhappy family. The pauper said to us, it's been three days since I was able to give them a crust of bread. Have the kindness, you who are reputed so very rich, to give me the wherewithal to sustain my children a while in their sorry existence. Oh, my lord, I know not who you are, but are you acquainted with Monsieur de saint Fon? I am, said the minister. Ah, then. You see his handiwork before you. He had my husband taken off to jail. He deprived us of the little that we possessed of goods. Such are the cruel circumstances we are reduced to, since above a year. 
The great thing about this scene, my friends, the thing in which I could take pride, was its complete authenticity. I had unearthed these wretched victims of St. Fon's injustice and rapacity. I now presented them to him in the flesh, to reawaken his wickedness. Ah, the scoundrel, exclaimed the minister, staring fixedly at the humble woman. Yes, I know him well, by God I do, and you shall come to know him too, he stands before you. Oh, Juliet, tis cleverly you have prepared this confrontation, my soul is in a very ferment. How then? What is your complaint? I've sent your husband to prison. He is innocent, that is true. I've done better, yet your husband is no more. Until now, you have eluded me, for I meant to treat you likewise. What wrong have we done you, my lord? That of dwelling in my neighborhood, and of owning a small property you were not disposed to sell to me. But it is mine now. Ruining you, I have dispossessed you. And now you come begging to me. Do you think I care if you die of starvation? But these poor children. France contains about ten million too many of them. Weeding the garden is to render society a service. Peering down at the children, he rolled first the one, then the other over with his foot. Not bad stuff, though. It needn't to go entirely to waste. Whereupon, his prick prodigiously stiffened by all the foregoing, the wag bends, seizes the little boy, and embuggers him on the spot next catching hold of the little girl. He does the same with her. Then very heatedly he cries, Lousy old bitch, show me your be-wrinkled bum. I require the sight of your flapping buttocks in order to unload. The old woman weeps. She resists, I lend St. Fond my aid. Having heaped insults upon that woebegone ass, the libertine penetrates it, while trampling on the brats, literally crushing them beneath his boots as he sodomizes their mother, and at the moment of his discharge he fires a bullet into her brain, and we depart from that denim of misfortune, dragging along the fourteen-year-old victim, whose buttock St. Fond had been kissing the whole time he was in action. Well, sire, I said as we were strolling away, from now on that family's property is yours to do with as you like. That was not the case until this evening. Those people had solicited help. Their pleas had obtained a hearing. Trouble was brewing not, to be sure that they could have caused you any serious worries, but they would have proved a nuisance. I found them out at work. I lured them here now, you're rid of them. St. Fawn was in a state of inconceivable exaltation. Ah, how sweet is crime, said he, the sincerest feeling manifest in his tone, and how voluptuous its aftermaths. Juliet, you cannot imagine how my every fiber has been electrified by the deed you have just led me to commit. My angel, my divine creature, my one God, only say what is it you would have me do for you. You are pleased, I know. When one gives voice to one's longing for money, Will, you then increase the promise sum? It was a hundred thousand crowns, I believe? Yes. You'll have twice that amount, O oh Juliet. But wait, what is this? cried the minister, recoiling at the sight of two masked men who were approaching us, pistols in their hands. I shudder I am not one of your courageous fools. Ho oh, there, gentlemen. What do you want? You'll soon see replies one of the two, binding Sam Fond fast to a tree and pulling his breeches down to his heels. But what do you intend to do? To give you a lesson, said the other man. He's brandishing a cat nine tails and already swinging it at the ministerial behind. To teach you to deal as you have just done with those poor folk in the cottage. And after he has laid on three or four hundred strokes, which serve mainly to bring St. Fond's weary tool into the air again, the other hoves up and completes his ecstasy by introducing a Degontian prick into his anus. Having f the f takes up the whip in his turn and whips, when he is done whipping, his companion bumped ups my lover who, throughout, pates the young girl's buttocks to the right and mine to the left. Saint Fond is untied. The two men vanish into the night, and we wander off again down obscure lanes. Oh, Juliet. I must say it to you ever and ever again. You are divine. But, you know, that last episode gave me a fright. There is nothing like subjecting one's nerves to an initial commotion before. 
imparting that of voluptuousness to them, the average man will always remain in total ignorance of such contrasts and gradations. Fear acts powerfully upon you. Prodigiously, my dear. Improbably the greatest coward on earth. The you which I own without the least twinge of shame. Being afraid is an art. It is a science. The art and science of self-preservation. And of capital importance to man. So that it is a patent absurdity to link honor to bravery in the face of dangers. I place my honor rather in dreading them all. Ah, Saint Fond, if fear can have such an effect upon your senses, think what must be its effect upon those who are the victims of your passions. Exactly. And it is thence comes my keenest pleasure. The minister rejoined the very essence of my enjoyment, is in making those victims so suffer, in the selfsame way, from the thing which plagues my existence. But where are we? This garden of yours, Juliet, is vast indeed. We are at the edge of one of the pits prepared for the victims. Ah, yes, said Saint Fond, stooping and reaching out a hand. The prince must have performed a sacrifice hereabouts. I do believe I feel a corpse. Let's pull it out, I suggested, and see who it is. She seems to be the youngest of the three sisters and not quite dead either. I dare say the rascal throttled her, then buried her alive. Well, well, revive her, and you'll have the fun of slaying, too. Our attentions did indeed bring the poor child back to life, but she was unable to tell us what the prince had done to her, once she had lost consciousness. The two sisters hugged each other, shedding many tears, and the barbarous Saint Fond informed them that he was about to kill them both. Which is what he went ahead and did, however, since I have a good many adventures of this kind to relate. Rather than risk being tedious, I shall forego a description of this one. Suffice it to say that the monster discharged into the ass of the younger of the two creatures, while finishing her off, we tossed some dirt into the pit, and we pursued our way. Innumerable are the fell deeds which may afford pleasure, but to my knowledge there is none that causes it more deliciously than destruction. Wanton murder, that arch libertine affirmed. No, there is no ecstasy to compare with the one you taste as you indulge in this divine infamy were. This amusement, to become more generally widespread, I can assure you the earth would be depopulated inside a dozen years. Dear Juliet, your performance of a moment ago encourages me to suppose that you are as fond of crime as I. And I gave Saint Fond plainly to understand that it stimulated me not one whit less, and if anything more, than it did him. It was then we perceived in a clearing among the trees, and by the light of the moon, what appeared to be a little convent. And now what have we here? asked Saint Fond. Does she mean to drown me in delight? Truth to tell, said I, I do not know where we are. I knocked on the door. It was opened by a nun advanced in years. Venerable and beloved mother, I said to her, will you show your hospitality to two strangers who have wandered off the beaten path? Enter, the good lady replied. Though this be a nunnery, the virtue you invoke is not alien to our hearts, and we shall as willingly practice it with you, as we have done with an elderly seigneur who a short while ago made the same request he is with the women of the house who have just risen for matins. From what she told us, we realized that the prince was there too. We joined him, he was surrounded by a group made up of another nun and half a dozen pensioners aged from twelve to sixteen. Yet, covered with the blood of his latest victim, the old lecher was already beginning to behave disrespectfully. Quickly we entered the room. The nun who was there addressed herself to Saint Fon. Monsieur, will you put a halt to this ungrateful person's effrontery? In return for the kindness we have shown him he has done naught but insult us. Madame, replied the minister, my friend, scarcely more moral than I, and like myself detesting virtue, is very little disposed to reward it your pensioners look exceedingly attractive to me, either we set your damned convent afire this instant, or by God we raise the six of them. Thereupon, with one hand seizing the smallest, and with his fist lashing out at two nuns who seek to protect her, 
Saint Fond violates her there, and then, frontwardly, need more be said. The five others had soon undergone the same fate, except that Saint Fond, fearing lest his tool weaken, ignored cuts and perforated assholes only. As one by one they emerged from his clutches, the prince took charge of them and flogged them till they bled, synchronizing that ceremony with the other of kissing my buttocks, which he oft repeated. He prized. He cherished. He adored. Saint Fond, keeping a firm grip upon himself, had discharged not a drop he has at the two nuns, one of whom is over sixty, shuts himself up with them in an adjoining cell, and comes back thirty minutes later, alone. Eh, hey, my friend, what have you done with those duennas? I inquire of the minister, who rejoins us in a very overwrought state. Remaining in control of this establishment, he informs us, meant getting rid of those warders I started by sporting with them in that cell? I have a passion for weather-beaten asses. Then, discovering a stairway that leads down to a well, I cast them in. And these pullets, what's to be done with them? I trust we aren't going to leave them alive, says the prince. Further horrors were perpetrated, whereof ill say only that they were ghastly the convent was empty. The two libertines, having by now emptied their balls also, and seeing day about to break, desired to return to my house. There, a sumptuous breakfast, served by three naked women, was awaiting us. We all had hearty appetites. The prince asked St. Fons, Leave to spend a few hours in bed with me and my lover, flanked by two manservants, had himself fought until the sun was well up in the sky. The old nobleman's struggles and wigglings constituted no great threat to my modesty. After going to great pains and lengths, he contrived to introduce himself into my asshole. Though it was not for long he stuck their nature, dashed my hopes. The instrument bent, and the villain, who hadn't even the strength to discharge for he had, he maintained, shed his foot twice in the course of the evening fell asleep, his snout wedged in my behind. As soon as we rose, St. Fond, more enchanted with me than ever, gave me a draft for eight hundred thousand francs, payable at the royal treasury, and he and his friend quitted my house. Generally speaking, all the succeeding parties resembled that inaugural one. Save for particular episodes, I, with my fertile imagination, took care to vary constantly. Noisseuil was almost always present, but apart from the prince I had not seen any strangers at any of them. I had been at the helm of that great vessel for three months, steering it with all possible success, when Saint Fond informed me I had a ministerial crime to commit on the morrow. Oh, dread consequences of a barbarous policy. The victim? Surely, my friends, you would be hard-pressed to guess his identity. Twas Saint Fon's own father, a gentleman of sixty-six. In every way the soul of respectability he had been disturbed at his son's irregularities of comportment. Dreading lest they prove his undoing, he had argued with him, warned him, even spoken to his disadvantage at court with the aim of constraining him to leave the ministry, very rightly believing that it were better for this scoundrel his son to retire of his own accord, rather than be banished from the stage. From the outset, St. Fon took his interference ill. He stood to gain a yearly three thousand from his father's death, and accordingly did not long delay coming to a decision. Norseul arrived with the particulars, and noticing that I appeared somewhat to waver at the prospect of this major crime, he thought by means of the following speech to cleanse the projected deed of the taints of atrocity, my weakness idiotically ascribed to it, the evil you fancy you'd do in killing a man, and the further evil you imagine, exists where the question is of parricide these. It seems to me, my dear, are the two notions I ought to endeavor to combat. However, I need waste no time examining the former of the two. A mind such as yours— can only scorn the prejudices that hold criminal the destruction of one's fellow beings. 3. This homicide is a simple affair for you. Since between your existence and the victim's, no tie exists it only becomes complicated for my friend. You are awed by the stain of parricide he is only too willing to incur, and therefore it shall be from this viewpoint alone ill consider the deed. Parricide is it, 
or is it not a crime? Assuredly, if there is in all the world a single deed, I esteem justified, legitimate. It is this one, and, pray, tell me, what relationship can there be between myself and him who brought me into the world? How would you have me think myself in any way beholden to a man? Merely because, once upon a time, some whimsy moved him to discharge into my mother's cunt. Nothing is more preposterous than this piece of foolishness. But what now if I am unacquainted with him? What if I do not know the identity of this individual, this father of mine who sired me? Does the voice of nature perhaps speak up in me and tell me who he is? Never. And in Zenman in a chai zown, I o and sim to see. So should I not be as distant in my attitude toward him as toward anybody else? If this fact is sure, and thereof I do not believe any doubt can subsist, parricide in no wise increases the supposed evil in homicide. One does no worse murdering one's own father than murdering some other person. If I kill the man who, unbeknownst to me, begot me, the fact that he is my father contributes nothing to my remorse hence. It is merely because I am told we are kin that I pause or repent well. I ask you, how can opinion worsen a crime? And can opinion possibly alter its nature? What? I am free to slay my father and feel no remorse, provided I am not aware he is my father. But cannot in that other case where I know him to be see the implications of such reasoning, even if it be an errant lie? Others have but to convince me it is the truth, that the man I have just slain was my father, and lo, I am to be filled with regrets and dread discomfort as sheer nonsense. And further, if remorse exists, though grounds therefore do not, that remorse cannot properly exist when the alleged grounds for it are present. If you can so very easily deceive me in all this, then I tell you, the crime you speak of is no crime at all. It is illusory, since nature herself does not give me certain indication of who. The author of my days is. Tis surely because she would not have me feel any greater tenderness for him than for some other person who is of no particular concern to me, if your opinion alone creates occasion and cause for remorse. And if your opinion can deceive me, then this remorse is a paltry business, insignificant, no, and I am a fool, if I consent to succumb to it. Do animals cleave worshipfully to their fathers? Have they even a bare inkling of which male begot them? Searching for motives to warrant filial gratitude, will you cite the care my father took of me during my infancy and childhood? Another error. Complying with them, he ceded to the customs of the country, to his pride, to his sentiment, which, as a father, he managed to conceive for his handiwork, but which there is. No need whatever that, I conceive for the artisan for that artisan, acting uniquely at the behest of his own pleasure, had no thought at all for me when it so pleased. Him to proceed to the act of propagation with my dam. His sole concern was for himself, and I fail to see therein any basis for especially ardent feelings of gratitude. Ah, they... Let us entertain no more illusions on this article. The prejudice is unworthy of mature minds to the person who gave us life. We owe no more than we do to the remotest, chilliest stranger. In us nature prompts absolutely no feeling for him. None I shall go farther. She could not possibly imbue us with any feeling for him. Friendship is not something that can be imposed. Upon us from outside it is false that one loves one's father, it is equally false, indeed, that we can love him you fear him. Yes, but love him you do not usually a threat to you. Always onerous. His existence cannot but disquiet and inconvenience you. Personal interest, the most sacred of the laws of nature, puts us under invincible compulsion to desire the death of the man from whom we await our inheritance and the problem envisaged from this angle. Not only would we hate that man as a matter of course, but, very probably, it would be even more natural still to attempt his life, for the excellent reason that everybody deserves to have his turn, and that if my father has for two score years enjoyed they, fortune come down to him from his father, 
and that if I find myself growing old in everlasting expectancy of the substance whereupon my welfare dances attendance, I should definitely, and without a trace of remorse, aid a nature that is sometimes behindhand or remiss, and myself, employing whatever means, accelerate the process whereby I enter into the exercise. Of rights nature accords me but may well delay transmitting to me. Out of some caprice, neither I nor anyone else in his senses will refrain from taking steps to counteract. If self-interest is the general rule by which man measures all his actions, there is, necessarily, much less evil in killing one's father than in killing some other human being for our personal reasons for ridding ourselves of him who brought us into the light must always be stronger and more valid than those we have for putting any other person out of the way. Here also there exists another metaphysical consideration. We ought not lose sight of old age. Is the road to death causing a man to age? Nature speeds him toward his grave, he. Therefore, who slays an oldster does not but carry out her intentions whence it is. That among many nations, murder of the aged is accounted a virtue. Useless to the world, so much excess baggage in society. Consuming provender that is scarce already. That is lacking to the young, or which the young must buy dearly. Because of the overgreat demand, their existence is demonstrably to no purpose. It is harmful, and the wisest course is to liquidate them. That is self-evident. Hence, not only is it no crime at all to kill one's father, it is an excellent thing to do. It is a meritorious deed from the point of view of oneself, whom it serves having regard now to nature. It is also meritorious, for it is to free her of an unwelcome burden and it is praiseworthy, since it supposes that a man be vigorous enough, philosophical enough to value himself, who may be of some use to humanity, above that dotard humanity has all but forgotten. And so, Juliet, you are about to perform a handsome deed in destroying the enemy of your lover, who I am sure serves the state to the utmost of his ability for it. As I would be the last to deny, he is now and again guilty of some petty prevarication. Some petty peculation? St. Fond is a very great minister, nonetheless, he is bloodthirsty. He is rapacious. Fierce is his grip. He considers murder indispensable to the maintaining of good government. Is he mistaken? Zola, Marius, Richelieu, Mazarino, history's great statesmen, have they thought otherwise? Did Machiavelli lay down different principles? There is no room for doubt bloodshed there must be if any regime, a monarchical one especially, is to survive the throne of the tyrant must be cemented with blood. And St. Fun has yet to begin to spill anything like the quantity of it that should be flowing this very minute. Finally, Juliet, perform this gesture and you remain in the good graces of a man who keeps you in what I believe may be accurately. Termed a state of prosperity, you increase the fortune of him who is responsible for yours. I really wonder that you even hesitate. No, I say, said I very pertly, who told you I was hesitating? Twas merely some involuntary reflex in me, no more. I am young yet. I am but a fledgling. My career has only just begun that I stumble a little, backslide now and then should this surprise my mentors. But they'll soon see I am worthy of the pains they take with me. Let St. Fond make haste, and send his father to me. Here's a dead man two hours after he crosses the threshold of my house. However, my dear, there are three categories of poison in the assortment your friend entrusted to me. Do you know which I am to employ? The crudest, the one that causes the greatest suffering, answered Nor Shui. I am glad you reminded me. St. Fond was adamant on that score. He wishes that, in going to his death, his father be punished for having intrigued to his detriment. He wishes his agony to be hideous. I understand, I said, and you may tell him that the thing shall be handled to his satisfaction. But what is the plan? As follows, Norisil replied, As the friend of the minister, you will invite the old man to dinner. That is, you will send him a note. In it you will make it clear that your design is to bring 
about a conciliation you yourself sharing his views regarding his son's retirement from public office. You'd like to discuss the matter with St. Fond Sr.? He will come ill. He will be born out of your house. St. Fond Jr. will attend to the rest. Here is the sum agreed upon for the execution of the crime, a draft for 100,000 crowns on the treasury. Will that suffice, Juliet? St. Fond gives me that much for a supper, said I, handing back the scrap of paper. Tell him ill do this for nothing. I simply wish to be helpful. And here is another draft for the same amount. Nor Sue went on your lover, anticipated your objection indeed. He would have been disappointed had you made none. I want her to be paid, and paid according to her desire Softin has. He repeated that to me. So long as she evinces selfishness, and so long as I satisfy that selfishness, I am sure not to lose her. St. Fawn seems to know me very well, was my reply. I have a liking for money. I don't hide the fact from myself. Neither do I from you. But I shall never ask him for more than is necessary. These 600,000 francs will go into carrying out the project. I want 600,000 more for myself. The day the old man expires, you'll have them. Never fear. Oh, Juliet, what a splendid situation is yours. Do nothing to spoil it. Do everything to deserve it. Enjoy it. And if you know how to conduct yourself intelligently, you'll soon be the wealthiest woman in Europe. I have given you a marvelous friend. Out of respect for your principles, Noiseau, I refrain from thanking you. You arranging this liaison pleased you. You gained therefrom as well. It flatters you to have among your intimate acquaintances a woman whose social position, riches, and name have already started to eclipse those of the court princesses. I do be ashamed to show myself at the opera dressed as the Princess de Nemours was yesterday evening. Not a soul so much as glanced at her. Everybody's eyes were upon me. And you are relishing all this, Juliet? Infinitely, my dear. To begin with, I am rolling in gold, which, for me, is the foremost of enjoyable things. But are you doing sufficient fun? A great deal precious few are the nights when the best Paris can boast, in the one and the other. Sex does not come to offer me the greatest homage. And your favorite crimes? They are being committed. They are being committed. I steal every chance I get. I don't let an odd franc get by. You'd think, from my graspingness, from my thievery, I was in imminent danger of starving to death. And vengeance. I have been particularly active on that score. The fearful unpleasantness that has befallen Prince de Ex Rouvet heard the news. The whole town and is talking about nothing else. Was I alone arranged that? Five or six ladies who in the past few months have thought to challenge my social position are presently lodged in the Bastille. Next, we entered into a few details touching the parties I gave for the minister. I must tell you, said Noircel, that of late, there are signs you are relaxing your efforts. St. Fond has noticed it. There were fewer than fifty dishes at the last supper you are, of course aware that only by eating well can one hope to discharge copiously, he continued. And for us libertines, the quality and the quantity of our sperm is of crucial importance. Gluttony fares wonderfully well, with all the tastes it has pleased nature, to instill in us and experience. Shows that the prick is never so rigid, the heart never so staunch, as after one has sumptuously died. I would say a word, too, about the choice of girls. Although those you place before us are without doubt very pretty, St. Fond feels that more research would improve the selection. I cannot but attempt to impress upon you the care that must be taken in this matter. We require that the game furnished us not only be of the finest breed, but that in addition it possess all those qualities, moral as well as physical, which make bagging it interesting. For answer to this, I outlined the excellent measures I was taking instead of six. Now I had two dozen women working around the clock, and under them they had an equal number of subalterns combing the provinces. I was the mainspring of the entire mechanism, and I was putting forward a great effort. Before contracting for an object, Norsewell recommended, even if it involve a thirty-league journey, 
Make it there is no substitute for personal inspection, and never accept anything but what meets with your total approval. All very well, said I, but that formula is not always so easy to follow. The object is frequently kidnapped before I have had a description of it. Why then? Noah Scheel rejoined. Kidnap twenty to obtain a yield of five. But what am I to do with the rejects? Whatever you wish sport with them yourself, sell them to your friends, to procuruses, to panders. With the apparatus you will have built up, you should be able to traffic on a broad scale and, it would seem to me, even create a virtual monopoly at any rate. There ought to be a good hundred thousand a year in this for you. True, if St. Fond paid me for every object acquired. As things stand, he only remits for three per supper. I think I can induce him to pay for the lot. He'll be far better served if he does. Now, Noisir, I said, there are some other matters I should like to discuss, and they relate to me. You know the kind of mind I have. I need hardly tell you that with all these means for mischief-making, I indulge very heavily in it the ideas which occur to me. The things I imagine are beyond description, but, my friend, I require your advice. Don't you suppose that, ultimately, my behavior may make St. Fond jealous? Never an oise answered at once. St. Fond is an exceedingly reasonable person. As such, he senses you cannot attain self-expression, save through much wrongdoing. The idea itself amuses him, and only yesterday he was telling me that he was afraid you were not enough of a trollop. Oh. In that case, let him be easy, you may assure the minister, that it is seldom one finds a person with a more pronounced taste for every sort of vice. I have now and then heard it asked, said Norsui. Whether the jealousy she inspires speaks in favor of or against a woman. And I have always thought the question odd, for my part it has. From the beginning, been obvious to me that the impulse leading to this mania being purely personal. Women assuredly have nothing to gain from the tumult it produces in their lovers' breasts. It is not by any means fondness for a woman that brings on jealousy. It is dread of the humiliation her change of heart would cause one, and to prove there is nothing but sheer egoism. In and behind this passion, I have simply to remind you that no lover, if he be of good faith and sincere, will deny he would prefer to see his mistress dead than unfaithful. Hence, it is rather her fickleness than the loss of her that afflicts us. And tis hence our own selves we are thinking of when the event takes place. Whence I conclude that, second only to the inexcusable folly of falling in love with a woman in the first place, the greatest extravagance a man can commit is to be jealous of her. With regard to her, this sentiment is dishonest, demonstrating, as it does, one's lack of esteem for her with regard to oneself. It is regularly painful and inevitably useless since the surest way to breed in a woman the wish to fail us is to intimate to her our fear, lest she do so. Jealousy and the terror of cuckoldry are two things, based entirely upon our prejudices pertaining to the enjoyment of women were it not for this accursed habit of fawn, stubbornly and it idiotically wanting, whenever it is a question of woman, to associate the moral and the physical, wed long ago have had done with these vile notions, what? It is not possible, you say, to lie with a woman without loving her? And it is not possible to love her without lying with her? But why must you embroil the heart in something where it is exclusively the body that acts? They are two desires. They are two very different needs, so it seems to me. Araminthi has the world's most beautiful figure. Her face is endearing. Her big brown sultry eyes promise an ample age of her sperm once. The walls of her vagina or the interior of her anus, are electrified by friction from the rubbing of my prick, I poke her, and sure enough, behold, I was right. She squirts a quart. Why? Pray tell. Need anything heartfelt accompany the act whereby I take this creature's body? It does appear to me once again that loving and enjoying are distinct and separate affairs and that not only is it unnecessary to love in order to enjoy, but that it suffices to enjoy in order not to love. For dreamy, tender sentiments rise out of compatibility of humor and expediency, 
but are in no wise due to the beauty of a bust or the pretty contours of a bum, and I would not allow these latter objects, which, depending upon our peculiarities of taste, can sharply excite the physical affections, to be able to exert a similar prize upon the moral affections. To complete my comparison, Belinda is ugly. She's forty-two. Not one hint of the gracious anywhere about her person. Not a single attractive feature. No. She's a slug. Grossly ill-favored. But Belinda is clever. She has wit. A delicious character. A million things which mate nicely with my sentiments. And tastes I d have no desire to bed with Belinda. But I d be wild about her conversation nonetheless. I d intensely desire to have Araminth. But I d cordially detest her the moment the fever of desire had abated. Because in her I have found a body only. And none of the moral qualities which could win her a place in my heart. All this, however, is quite irrelevant to the present case in St. Fon's tolerant attitude toward the infidelities you commit there is an element of libertine sentiment for which none of the foregoing provides an adequate explanation. The idea of you lying in another's arms entrances St. Fond. He himself puts you there, knowing you there, imagining you there, seeing you there hardens his prick you multiply his pleasures. As proportionally you augment the size and number of your own, and St. Fond will never cherish you, so much as when you do to the utmost that which would earn you the hatred of a clod. Here it is a question of one of those mental anomalies comprehensible, and indeed common, only to cerebral individuals like ourselves, but which are not on account of their rarity any the less delectable. What you tell me is reassuring, said I St. Fond, will love my tastes, my mind, my character, and shan't be at all jealous of my person. Very great is my relief to hear you say it, for, I confess to you, countenance would be impossible for me. My temperament requires satisfaction. My thirst requires to be slaked at all costs, hot-blooded as I am, energetic and imaginative as you know me to be. With this colossal wealth at my command, how ever could I resist passions aroused by everything, Inflamed continually. Surrender to them, Juliet. Surrender to them. You cannot do more. You should not do less, but in your dealings with the public at large, I would urge you to be somewhat the hypocrite. Remember that in this world, hypocrisy is an indispensable vice for him who has the fortune of possessing all the others with art and deceit. One succeeds at anything, for it isn't your virtue society needs. It is simply a pretext for supposing you virtuous. For every two occasions when this virtue will be necessary to you, there will be thirty others when y'all only have to simulate it, therefore don the mass. Debauched women, study to perfect the appearance expected of you, but only to the point of indifference to crime, never so far as enthusiasm for virtue, because the former attitude leaves you more prey of others in peace, whilst the latter exasperates it. Moreover, it is quite enough to hide what one loves without having to fame what one deets. If all men were vicious in better faith, there'd be no need for hypocrisy, but falsely persuaded that from virtue there are advantages to be reaped, they must absolutely cling to some shred or vestige of it. One must do as they, and to secure their good opinion, Conceal all one can of one's misconduct under the cloak of that wormy and ridiculous idol quits. Of course, to revenge oneself for this enforced homage by making that many the more sacrifices to its rival. In addition, hypocrisy, teaching one craft and guile, facilitates countless crimes your disinterested heir invites trust. The adversary lowers his guard, and the less you give him to suspect you are armed with one the easier it is to drive home the dagger. This covert and mysterious manner of thus satisfying the passions increases a thousandfold the enjoyment you derive from them. Cynicism has its piquancy, I am aware of it, but it does not lure into your net. It does not assure you victims as certainly as hypocrisy does. And then, too, effrontery. All that comes under the head of the criminally crapulous is not truly to be savored except in debaucheries. These the hypocrite, 
secure within the four walls of his house and his solid reputation, may perfectly well indulge in once he has answered the requirements of his libertinageurly, who's to stop him? But it will be generally agreed that elsewhere than in the sanctuary of the home cynicism is out of place. It is bad form and poor taste, and by creating a breach between society and yourself, it incapacitates you for the enjoyment of all society has to offer. The crimes of debauchery are not the only ones that afford delight, you understand. There are quantities of others, of the highest interest and often very lucrative, which hypocrisy makes available to us, but cynicism unattainable. Was there ever a falser, adroiter, more unscrupulous wench than Madame Brumilliers? That pillar of society in her day? It was in the charity hospitals she used to make trial of her poisons. It was behind the shield of piety and the screen of philanthropy she would experiment with the delicious means to her crimes. Her father said to her, as he lay upon his deathbed, where he had been brought by a poisoned drink administered by her, Oh, my beloved daughter, my one regret in taking leave of life is that I shall no longer be able to do for you all the things I would like. And the daughter's response was a supplementary dose in the cup of tea she handed to the sinking patient. For the world boasted no more artful, more subtle creature she played at devotion. She was ever at mass. She distributed a fortune in alms, and did all that to cover her crimes, and so it was a long time before she was found out. And perhaps she never would have been but for the incaution and misfortune of her lover. 5. Let that woman serve as an example to you, my dear. I couldn't propose a better. I know the whole story of that famous creature by heart, I replied, and you may be sure I aspire to follow in her footsteps. But, kind friend, I'd like to have a more contemporary model, I'd wish her to be somewhat older than me. I'd want her to love me, to have tastes like mine, passions like mine, and though wed ma together, I'd want her to allow me all my other follies, without being in the slightest bit jealous be that as it may. I do want her to have a certain ascendancy over me, but that without seeking to dominate me, I do want her to give me sound advice, to cooperate at all times in my caprices, to be profoundly experienced in libertinage, to be irreligious as well as unprincipled, as much a stranger to good manners as to virtue, to have great warmth of wit and a heart of ice. I have just what you are looking for. Noisuer, replied a widow of thirty. Lovely. Nay, beautiful, criminal to the core, arrayed with all the qualities you list, and who will be of invaluable aid to you in your chosen career. She can replace me as your tutor for, you realize, separated as we are, I can no longer attend to your needs with the same ardor as before Madame de Clare will. That is the name of the person I have in mind, and she is a millionaire, knows everybody worth knowing, everything that can possibly be known and I am convinced she will agree to take you under her wing. Charming Noisei, you are too good. But there's yet more to it, my friend. I do like to share my knowledge with another I keenly. Zen's my need of instruction. I no less keenly desire to educate someone. I must have a teacher. Yes, and I must have a pupil, too. Of course. My fiancé. What? I cry it enthusiastically. Would you entrust me with Alexandrine's education? Could I put her in better hands? I'd be delighted to have you take charge of her. Moreover, is St. Fon's wish that she keep the most intimate company with you. And what is causing the delay in this marriage? I am in mourning for my last wife, you know. Do you defer to conventional usages? Occasionally, for the sake of appearances, though it goes fearfully against the grain. One further word, dear Noircelle. You are very sure this woman you propose to introduce me to will not become my rival. You are thinking of your position with St. Fon. Fear not. St. Fon knew her long before he met you. He still amuses himself with her. But Madame de Clairwell would not consent to undertake your functions. And, for his part, the minister would not obtain anything like the same pleasure from having her exercise them. Ah! I exclaimed. You are divine, both of you, 
and your generosity toward me will be very fully rewarded by my zeal in the service of your passion. Issue me orders. I shall be only too happy, always to be the instrument of your debauches and the main accessory to your crimes. I was not to see my lover again until after I executed the task he had assigned me. On the eve of the appointed day, I was exhorted to be firm, and on the morrow, the dear old gentleman appeared. Before we sat down at table, I employed all my skill to mend his opinion of his son, and was quite taken aback to discover that, indeed, it would not be at all difficult to set things straight between them. Therefore I hastily shifted my tack. Tis not a reconciliation we want now, said I to myself if that happens. I lose both the opportunity for the crime I am in a perfect itch to commit, and the twelve hundred thousand franc promised me for bringing it off let cease negotiations and start to act. Administering the drug was child's play the old man collapses. He is trundled out, and two days later I learn to my considerable satisfaction that he is no more. His death having been hideously painful. It was but an hour or so after he expired that his son arrived for one of his semi-weekly suppers at my house. Poor weather forced us to hold it indoors, and Orsua was the one other guest present. I de-readied three little girls of fourteen or fifteen, prettier than you can imagine a Paris convent had supplied them to. Me at the price of a hundred thousand francs, I headed stopped bargaining ever since saint Fond had agreed to cover costs. These, said I, presenting them to the minister, will console you for the loss you have just sustained. It does not overly affect me, Juliet, said the minister, kissing me. I d willingly send fifteen such blackguards to their death every day, and without an ace of compunction. My one regret is that he suffered so little. He was a most contemptible clown. But, you know, I said, it wouldn't have taken much to change his attitude. You acted properly in not encouraging him to do so. I shudder at the thought of still having to endure the beggar's existence. I even resent having to bury him, but for some loathsome prejudices. I do he have the pleasure of flinging his corpse on the dung heap and watching it devoured by vermin. And, and as if eager to forget, the libertine turned immediately to the job. My three maids were assessed. There was nothing the fiercest critic could find fault with size, shape, birth, mint condition, youth, looks. They were all there, but I noticed that neither of the two friends was stiffening in the least. And satiety is not easy to please. T'was apparent they were not content, but did not, however, dare complain. Speak up, said I. If these objects don't satisfy you, you must tell me what you want. For you must admit I cannot hope to guess what it would be that outdoes this. No, sighed St. Fond, who was having himself handled by two of the little girls, whose efforts were proving fruitless. There's no one to blame unless it's Norshua and myself. We're exhausted. We've just been performing horrors, and I haven't the faintest idea what's to be done to revive us now. Perhaps, I suggested, if you were to recount your feats, you might, from the telling, rediscover the strength to commit fresh infamies. We can at least try, said Norseal. Well then, off with the clothes, said St. Fond. You too, Juliet. Undress yourself and listen to us. Two of the girls converged upon Norseal. One sucked him. He tongued the other and palpited both their asses. The frigging of the narrator was confided to me. And while speaking, he spanked the third maidens behind, and here follow the atrocities St. Fond divulged. I led my daughter to where my father lay dying. Noisil was with me, we drew the shutters, we bolted the doors, and then Anne the lecher's prick rose, nodding as though in confirmation of what he was saying, and then I most barbarously announced to my father that this that had befallen him, and the agonies he was undergoing, were my work upon my instructions, I told him. You had poisoned him, and I advised him to think on death. Then, raising my daughter's skirts, I sodomized her before his eyes. Noirceau, who adores me when I commit infamies, had been funny very briskly, but when the rascal saw Alexandrine's ass bared to the light, he soon replaced me in the breach, and I, bending over the bed, forced the old man to frig me, 
and while he fisted my prick. I slowly strangled him. I gave up my fuck at the same moment he gave up the ghost. And Norswill simultaneously discharged into my daughter's fundament. Ah, the joy that was mine. Foul accursed unnatural son who all at one stroke was guilty of parricide, incest, murder, sodomy, pimping, prostitution. Oh, Juliet, Juliet. Never in my life had I been so happy. See what it does to me. Just to recite those voluptuous exploits. My prick's as stiff as it was this afternoon. Whereupon the lecher has at one of the little girls, and while he proceeds to maculate her in every part, he would have Norsul and me abuse another of the children within his view. We improvise awful things, nature. Outraged in those girls, becomes frenziedly operative in St. Fond, and the scapegrace is near to shedding his f when, so as not to squander his forces, he prudently withdraws from the ass of the novice in order to perforate the other two. Exercising faultless self-control that day, he triumphed six times in a row, and for his share Norsul had no buds, but full-blown roses only. How be it? The lad made the most of the little that was left to him, and the whole while he f and he f at a leisurely pace. He kissed my ass in St. Fon's too. He pumped them both, and drank up the farts we amused ourselves producing for him. Then twas supper time. I alone was invited to partake of the feast, but knew the little girls lay scattered about the table. Light was provided by the candle. We had stuck in their asses, and as these candles were none of them very long, and as the supper lasted on and on, all their thighs were severely scorched. Earlier we had bound them fast to the table to hold them still, and the gags of wadded cotton we had inserted in their mouths saved our conversation from being disturbed by their clamorings. The three candelabras diverted our libertines throughout the meal, and I, reaching out from time to time to verify their state, found them both in very merry form indeed. Noisieux, said saint Fon, while our little novices were a-roasting, do please explain to us manipulating your metaphysics prettily as you are wont to do. Do explain to us how it is possible we arrive at pleasure, in the one case through the sight of others undergoing pain, and in the other through suffering pain ourselves. Pay me, close heed, said Moisseau. It'll give you the thing detailed and demonstrated. Pain, logically defined, is nothing other than a sentiment of hostility in the soul toward the body it animates. The which it signifies through certain movements that conflict with the body's physical organization. So says Nicole, who perceived in man an ethereal substance, which he called soul, and which he differentiated from the material substance we call body. I, however, who will have none of this frivolous stuff, and who consider man as something on the order of an absolutely material plant, I shall simply say that pain is the consequence of a defective relationship between objects foreign to us and the organic molecules, composing us in such wise that instead of composing harmoniously with those that make up our neural fluids, as they do in the commotion of pleasure, the atoms emanating from these foreign objects strike them aslant, crookedly, sting them, repulse them, and never fuse with them. Still, though the effects are negative, they are effects nonetheless. And whether it be pleasure or pain brewing in us, you will always have a certain impact upon the neural fluid. Now, what prevents this painful commotion infinitely sharper and more active than the other from exciting in thee? said Fluid, the same conflagration propagated there by the impact of the atoms emanating from objects of pleasure. And stirred for the sake of being stirred, what prevents me from becoming accustomed, through habit, to being no less suitably agitated by the atoms that repel than by the others that blend? Weary of the effects that only produce a simple sensation, why should I not become accustomed to receiving the same pleasure from those that produce a poignant sensation? Both categories of shock are sustained in the same place, the only difference between them is that one is violent, and the other mild, but from the standpoint of the blasé individual, is not the first greatly to be preferred to the second? Is there anything commoner than to see on the one hand people who have accustomed their palates to a pleasurable irritation, 
and next to them, others who couldn't put up with that irritation for an instant. Is it not now, true me hypothesis, once accepted that man's practice, in his pleasures, is an attempt to move the objects which procure him his enjoyment, in the same way he himself is moved, and that these proceedings are what are termed, in the metaphysics of pleasure-taking, effects of his delicacy? What then should appear odd in the man who, endowed with organs of the kind we have just depicted, through the same procedures as his adversary, and through the same principles of delicacy, fancies he moves the pleasure-procuring object by means whereby he himself is affected. He is no more wrong than the other. He has only done what the other has done. The consequences are different. I grant you that the initial motivations are identical. The first has been no crueler than the second. And neither of them is open to blame upon the pleasure-procuring object. Both have employed the same means they themselves use to procure their own pleasure. But, replies he who is subjected to a brutal emotion, but this doesn't please me. It is altogether possible it now remains to be seen whether force will succeed with you where persuasion has failed. If not, then be gone. Leave me alone if, to the contrary, my wealth, my influence, or my station gives me either some authority over you or some certainty of being able to stifle your complaints. Then submit without a murmur to everything it pleases me to impose upon you, for have my enjoyment I must and shall, and I can obtain it only by tormenting you and seeing your tears flow. But in no case have you the right to be surprised or to reproach me, because I am acting in accordance with the way nature designed me, and following the bent she imparted to me. And because, in a word, in forcing you to accede to my harsh and brutal lusts, they alone which are capable of leading me to the uppermost pitch of pleasure, I act pursuant to the same principle, of delicacy as the tepid swain who knows not but the roses of a sentiment whereof I recognize only the thorns for I torturing you, rending you limb from limb. I'm merely doing the one thing that is able to move me, just as he, sorrowfully encunting his mistress, does that which alone moves him agreeably, but he can have his effeminate delicacy. It's not for me why, because it cannot possibly move organs so solidly made, of such tough fiber as mine. Yes, my friends, Moiselle went on, it is, you may be sure, impossible for any person who finds authentic pleasure in lewd and voluptuous activities ever really to combine their practice with that of delicacy, which unto these delights is naught but the very kiss of death, and which is based upon the premise that joy is to be shared, a premise no one who intends seriously to enjoy himself can ever accept shared. All enjoyment becomes dilute, the wine becomes water. The truth is generally recognized in courage, or allow the object which serves for your pleasure to take enjoyment therein, and straightway you discover that it is at your expense there is no more selfish passion than lust, none that is severer in its demands smitten stiff by desire. Tis with yourself you must be solely concerned, and as for the object that serves you, it must always be considered as some sort of victim, destined to that passion's fury. Do not all passions require victims? Well, then, in the lustful act, the passive object is that of our lubricious passion. Spare it not, if you would attain your end the intenser. The sufferings of this object, the more entire its humiliation, its degradation, the more thorough will be your enjoyment. They are not pleasures you must cause this object to taste, but impressions you must produce upon it, and that of pain, being far keener than that of pleasure. It is beyond all question preferable that the commotion produced in our nervous system by this external spectacle be created by pain rather than by pleasure. There you have it explained, the mania common to that crowd of libertines, who, like us, must, if they are to obtain, successfully and emit sperm, commit acts of the most atrocious cruelty, gorge themselves on the blood of victims. Some there are whose pricks are not even faintly to be stirred, save when they contemplate that doomed object of their whole. 
Lubricious Furian save when they themselves are uniquely responsible for the violent sufferings it is undergoing. You wish to subject your nerves to a powerful agitation. You very rightly suppose that the painful commotion will prove stronger than the pleasurable so you employ it with favorable result. But, beauty. I hear some sentimental imbecile protest. Beauty melts, interests. It invites to sweetness. To forgiveness, how is one to resist the tears of the pretty girl who, clasping her hands together, implores mercy of her executioner? Indeed. This is precisely what one is after. It is from this agitation, this terror, the libertine in question extracts his most delicious enjoyment would he not be in a sorry plight if he were to have to act upon an inert, insensible body. And the objection cited is quite as ridiculous as that of the man who maintained you should never eat mutton because sheep are mild animals. Lust's passion will be served. It demands, it militates, it tyrannizes. It must therefore be appeased, and to its satisfaction all other conditions are totally irrelevant. Beauty, virtue, innocence, candor, misfortune. The object we covet will not be sheltered by any of these. To the contrary, beauty tends to excite us further virtue, innocence, candor, embellish the object misfortune, puts it into our power, renders it malleable hence, all those qualities tend only to inflame us the more. And we should look upon them all simply as vehicles to our passions. More. These qualities afford us the opportunity of violating another prohibition. I allude to the variety of pleasure derived from sacrilege or the profanation of objects that expect our worship. That beautiful girl is an object of reverence for fools, making her the target of my liveliest and rudest passions. I experience the double pleasure of sacrificing to that passion, both a beautiful object and one before which the crowd bows down. No need to expand upon this idea. It has only to enter the mind in one's brain whirls. But one does not always have such objects ready to hand, however. One has habituated oneself to achieving pleasure through tyranny, and one is anxious to enjoy oneself every day, what then? Why, one must learn to delight in other, lesser pleasures, hard-heartedness toward the downtrodden, the refusal to succor them, the act of plunging them oneself into misery, if one possibly can't these, in some sort substitute for the sublime pleasure of causing a debauchery object to suffer. The sight of these wretches is a spectacle which very well lays the groundwork for the commotion we are accustomed to experience upon receiving a dolorous impression. They reach out to us, implore our aid, we withhold it, there's the spark of further step, and there's the fire lit, thence are crimes born, and nothing is sure to touch off the explosion of pleasure, but I fulfilled my task. How, you wanted to know. How can one accede to pleasure through suffering pain, or making others suffer it? I have answered you with a theoretical demonstration. Let's now confirm it in practice, and hewing to the line of the argument, I would request that the tortures inflicted upon these young ladies be piercing. That is to say, as piquant as it is within our power to make them. We rose from the table, and rather more in the spirit of jest than of charity, the victim's hurts were briefly looked to. I can't say why, but that evening Norswell seemed more than usually enamored of my ass. He could not leave off kissing it, toying with it, praising it, sucking and f it twenty times over. He embuggered me he would suddenly snap his prick out and give it to be sucked by the little girl's next. He would return to me and slap my flanks and buttocks with extraordinary force. He forgot himself even to the point of frigging my clitoris. All this heated me prodigiously, and my behavior must have appeared frightfully whorish to my friends. But how was one to satisfy oneself with a trio of exhausted children and two worn-out, shrunk-pizzled libertines? I proposed the idea of having myself fucked before them by my valets, but St. Fond, reeling with wine and a boil with ferocity, objected, saying that head have nothing brought in from the outside unless it was a brace of tigers, and that since there was fresh meat available, it ought to be devoured before it spoiled. 
Thereupon he set upon those three charming maids little asses he pinched them. Bit, scratched, tore them blood was already flowing left and right when, whirling toward us, his prick lewed up against his belly. He declared very bitterly that it was a bad day. He simply could not think up the means to make the victims suffer in the way he wished. Everything that enters my mind today, he said, falls short of my desires. Can't we put our heads together and invent something that will keep these whole three days in the most appalling death agonies? Ah, I said, you'd discharge before they were halfway to the grave, and the illusion dispelled he would come to their rescue. I'm vexed. Vexed indeed, Juliet. St. Fond retorted. To see that you do not know me better than that, how? Very gravely you are mistaken, my angel, if you believe my passions are the sole element to my cruelty. Ah, like Herod, I should like to prolong my ferocities beyond life itself. I am frenziedly barbaric when I'm stiff, yes, and cold-bloodedly cruel when I've shed my f- Very well, Juliet, the villain continued. Look here, I'm going to discharge. Well, begin the serious torturing of these once every drop of f is out of my balls, and you'll see whether or not I relent. Saint Fond, you seem greatly aroused, said Noiseau. Your speech makes that amply clear. Sperm is to be darted. There is the crux of the thing it can be accomplished right away, if you take my advice. Tis this. And tis simple. We shall impale these young ladies on spits. And while they roast there over the fire, Juliet, frigging us, will baste three handsome joints of beef with our f- Oh, by Christ, said Saint Fond, rubbing his member on the bleeding buttocks of the youngest and prettiest of the trio. I swear to you that this one here will suffer worse than that. Yes? What the devil are you scheming to do to her? asked Noisio, who had just scabbarded his weapon anew in my ass. You'll see was the rascal's reply. And he sets to work upon her with his powerful hands. He breaks her fingers one by one, dislocates her arms and legs, and runs the point of a little stiletto about a thousand times into her, to the depth of about an inch. I think, said Norsell, still housed in my bowels, shed have suffered quite as much from a spitting. And spitted she is going to be, St. Fond rejoins. Now she's been gashed a bit. Punctured thus, shall be more sensitive to the heat than if she had been put to turn over the fire and tap. I dare say you are right, Noiselle agrees. Let's prepare the other two in the same manner. I seize one. He takes the other, and still solidly implanted in my ass, the rascal puts her in the same state as she, whom St. Fond has martyrized. I imitate him and we soon have all of them roasting before a blazing fire while nor seal, damning every god in the sky. Dishard is in my bum, and I, gripping St. Fawn's prick, spray his f*** upon the three charred bodies of the unhappy victims of lust, most dreadful. All three corpses were flung into a pit. We resumed our drinking. Invaded by new desires, the libertines called for men. My lackeys were summoned. They were the whole night long. Laboring in St. Fong's and Warswell insatiable asses and for all that weren't able to lift the pricks of those gentlemen, whose verbal outbursts, however, were astonishing, and it was in the course of that seance that I recognized more clearly than ever before how certain it was these monsters were as cruel upon cold principle as in the greatest heat of passion. A month after this adventure... Noirseal introduced me to the woman he wished to have become my soulmate. As his marriage to Alexandrin had been postponed yet again, this time owing to St. Fon's bereavement, and because I think best not to describe that charming girl before I reach the appropriate point in my story's point, that is, at which she came into my full possession well, now turn our attentions to Madame de Clairwill and the arrangements I made with that unusual person to cement our liaison. Representing her to me, Noirceau had been authorized in his use of superlatives. Madame de Clairville was tall, splendidly proportioned her glance, always keen, was often too fiery to withstand, but her eyes large, dark, 
were more imposing than pleasing, and in general the aspect of this woman was more majestic than agreeable. Her mouth, somewhat rounded, was fresh, her lips sensual, her hair, jet black, fell to her knees. Her nose was modeled to perfection, her brow was regal, rich were the lines of her bust, wonderfully smooth was her skin. Though t'was not untinged a little with sallowness, her flesh was ripe but firm in short. This was the figure of Minerva, adorned with Venus amenities. Nevertheless, whether because I was the younger, or because my physiognomy had in grace what hers had in nobility, men invariably found me the more pleasing. Madame de Clairwell astonished. I was content to beguile she compelled men's admiration. I seduced them. To these imperious looks, Madame de Clairwell joined a very lofty intelligence she was exceptionally knowledgeable. I have never known her peer. For an enemy to prejudices, which she had rooted out of herself, while yet a child and I have never known a woman to carry philosophy so far. As well, she had numerous talents. Her command of English and Italian was complete. She was a born actress, danced like Terpsichore, was an accomplished chemist, physicist made verse prettily, drew nicely, was well-read in history, had geography at her fingertips, was no mean musician, wrote like Sevigny, but went perhaps a trifle too far in her witty sallies, the regular consequence being an insufferable overbearing way with those who failed to come. Up to her level and almost no one ever did she used to say that I was the one female in whom, until now, she had detected a trace of true intelligence. This splendid personage had been five years a widow. She had never borne any children. To them she had an aversion, which, in a woman, always denotes lack of feeling. One might fairly say that, for lack of sensibility, Madame de Clawil had not an equal. She indeed prided herself upon never having shed a tear, upon never having been touched in the least by the fate of the unlucky. My soul is callous. It is impassive, said she. I put any sentiment whatever at defiance to attain it, with the exception of pleasure. I am mistress of that soul's movements and affections, of its desires, of its impulsions with me. Everything is under the unchallenged control of mind, and there's worse yet, she continued. For my mind is appalling, but I am not complaining. I cherish my vices." I abhor virtue, I am the sworn enemy of all religions. Of all gods and godlings, I fear neither the ills of life, nor what follows death, and when you're like me, you're happy. With such a character, Madame de Clairville, one was swift to guess, might have adulators in good number, but very few were her friends she no more believed in friendship than in benevolence, and no more in virtue than in gods. Along with all this went enormous wealth, a splendid house in Paris, an enchanting one in the country, luxuries of every kind, the age when a woman is at her peak, an iron constitution, faultless health. If there be any happiness at all in this world, then it cannot but belong to the individual in command of all these advantages and attributes. At our very first meeting, Madame de Clairville confided in me, giving evidence of a frankness I found startling in a woman who, as I have just done telling you, was so proudly persuaded of her superiority, but she was never aloof toward me. I must say it out of fairness to her. Noiseul described you accurately. She said, "'Tis evident we have similar minds, similar tastes we seem made to live together. So let us join forces. We shall go far. But above all, let's banish all restraints from the start they were invented for fools only. Elevated characters, proud spirits, quick intelligences like ours. Make short shrift of all those popular curbs they are aware that happiness lies on the farther side. They march courageously to its attainment. Flouting the paltry laws, the sterile virtues, and the harebrained religions of those abject, worthless, swinish men who, so it does seem, exist only in order to dishonor nature. Several days later, Claire will with whom I was already grown infatuated, came to supper. We were two and alone. It was then at this second encounter we poured out our hearts to each other, acknowledged our peculiarities, detailed our sentiments. 
Oh, what a soul she had, that Claire will. I believe that if vice itself could dwell in this world, it would have chosen the depths of that perverse being for the seat of its empire. In a moment of mutual confidence before we were to betake ourselves to table, Claire will leaned close to me. We were indolently reclining in a nook paneled by mirrors. Velvet-covered pillows supported our heaving flanks. The soft light seemed to beckon to love and to favor its pleasures. Is it not true, my angel? said she kissing my breasts, licking my nipples, that tis through me each other to such women as ourselves must become acquainted. And drawing up my skirts and petticoats as she uttered those words, the tribade darted her tongue deep into my mouth and libertine fingers touched the mark. It is, she observed, their pleasure lies. It slumbers there, on that bed of roses. My sweetest love, wouldst have me wake it? Oh, Juliet, I shall put you in ecstasies, Will you permit me to catch fire from their heat? The long minx! Your mouth gives me answer. Your tongue hunts mine, invites it to voluptuousness. Ah! Do unto me that which I have done unto you, and let's die in pleasure's embrace. Let us undress, I suggested to my friend. Lude de Bosch calls for nakedness and. Do you know, I've not the faintest idea how you are made. I wish to see everything. I must. I must. Let's be rid of these inopportune raiments, ah. I want to see your heart throb, your breast quiver from the excitement I cause in you. What an idea, Clarewell murmured. It hints at your character, Juliet. I adore it well, do just whatever you like. And in a trice my friend was as naked as I several minutes went by, during which we studied each other in silence. The sight of the beauty's nature had lavished upon me began to inflame Clarewell. I feasted my eyes upon hers. Never has there been such a lovely figure. Never such a bosom. Those buttocks! Oh, God! Twas the ass of that Aphrodite the Greeks reverenced, and how deliciously it was cleft. Unwearyingly, I kissed those wonders and my friend. At first letting me most obligingly have my way with her proceeded next to pay back my caresses a hundredfold. Now don't fret. Leave everything to me, she said, having me lie down on the ottoman and spread my legs wide. Let me show you. I am capable of giving a woman pleasure. Whereupon two of her fingers began to work my cl and my asshole, the while her tongue plunged a goodly depth in my cunt, avidly lapped up the f- These titillations started. Never before had I been thus frigged three times in a row. I discharged into her mouth with such transports, I thought. I de faint away. Claire will, insatiable in her thirst for my f- and making ready to procure herself a fourth round, deftly and knowingly altered her approach, so that it I was now one finger she inserted into my cunt, another wherewith she played trills on my clitoris, and her agile, her voluptuous tongue probed into my anus. What skill! What consideration! I exclaimed. Ah, Claire Will, you are like to be my undoing. And further spurts of way were the product of that divine creature's industry. Eh, then, she demanded, when I had returned somewhat to my senses. What say you? Do I not know how to frig a woman? I adore women, is it, then? Any wonder that I am versed in the art of giving a pleasure? What else could you expect? Indepraved, dear heart. Is it my fault if nature gave me tastes that differ from the ordinary? I find nothing more unjust than a law that prescribes a mingling of the set in order to procure oneself a pure oneself. Pleasure, and what says more apt than ours in doing unto each other, that which we do singly to delight ourselves. Must we not? of necessity be more successful in pleasing each other than that being. Our complete opposite, who can offer us none but the joys at the farthest remove from those our sort of existence requires. What? Claire will. Do you mean to say that you dislike men? I use them because my temperament would have it so. But I scorn and detest them nonetheless. I did not be. Adverse to destroying every last one of those by the mere sight of whom I have always felt myself debased. What pride! It's a characteristic of mine. Juliet, that pride is coupled with frankness. 
I am plain spoken. It is a means to facilitate our early acquaintance. Cruelty is implied in what you say if your desires were to be translated into actions. Is. But they very often are. My heart is hard. And I am far from believing sensitiveness preferable to the apathy I luckily enjoy. Oh, Juliet, she continued, donning her clothes. You perhaps entertain illusions regarding this dangerous soft-heartedness. This compassion. This sensibility. The having whereof is thought creditable by so many churls. Sensibility, my dear, is the source of all virtues and likewise of all vices. It was sensibility brought Cartouche to the scaffold. Just as it caused the name of Titus to be writ guilt-lettered in the annals of benevolence. Owing to excessive sensibility, we behave virtuously owing to excessive sensibility. We take joy in misbehaving the individual. Lacking sensibility is an inert mass, equally incapable of good or evil, and human only in so far as he has the human shape. This purely physical sensibility depends upon the conformation of our organs, upon the delicacy of our senses, and more than all the rest, upon the nature of our nervous humors, within which I locate all the affections of man in general. Upbringing and have afterward habit mold in this or that direction. The portion of sensibility everyone receives from nature and selfishness, or the instinct of self-preservation, aids upbringing and habit to settle permanently upon this or that choice. But as the sort of education we are apt to receive unfailingly, prepares us ill, and indeed, misleads us, the moment that education is over with, the inflammation produced. In the electrical fluid by the impact of foreign objects, an operation we term the effect of the passions, begins to determine our habitual bent for good or for evil. If this inflammation is slight, whether because of the organ's denseness, which softens the impact and lessens the pressure of the foreign object upon the neural fluid, or because of the brain's sluggishness in communicating the effect of this pressure to the fluid, or again because of this fluid's reluctance to be set in motion, its turgidity, then the effects of our sensibility dispose us to virtue. If, in that other case, foreign objects act in a forceful manner upon our organs, if they penetrate them violently, if they stir into brisk motion the neural fluid particles which circulate in the hollow of the nerves, then our sensibility is such as to dispose us to vice. If the foreign object's action is stronger yet, it leads us to crime, and finally to atrocities, if the effect attains its ultimate intensity. But we notice that in every case the sensibility is simply a mechanism, that some degree or other other virtue or vice originates with it, that it is the sensibility which is responsible for whatever we do. When we detect an excess of sensibility in some young person, we may predict his future with confidence, and safely wager that some fine day this sensibility will see him. A criminal for it is not, as some may be prone to imagine, the species of sensibility, but the degree of sensibility that leads to crime and the individual in whom it squi. Action is slow will be disposed to good, just as, very certainly, he in whom this action wreaks havoc will do evil, evil being more piquant, more attractive than good. Therefore tis toward evil that violent effects tend, following the general principle according to which all like effects, moral no less than physical, seek each other out and combine. And so there appears to be no doubt that the necessary procedure with a young person one was endeavoring to train up for life would be to blunt that sensibility blunting it. You will perhaps lose a few weak virtues, but you will eliminate a great many vices and under a form of government which severely castigates all vices and which never rewards virtues. It is infinitely better to learn not to do evil than to strive to do good. There is nothing dangerous whatever in not doing good, whereas the doing of evil may be fraught with perils when one is still too young to appreciate the importance of concealing those acts of wickedness. Invincible nature constrains us to commit. I may go farther doing good is the most useless thing in the world, and the most essential thing in the world is not doing evil.
and this, not from the standpoint of one's self. For the greatest of all joys is often born in excessive evil only, nor from the standpoint of religion. For nothing is so irrelevant to worldly well-being as what relates to this mummery about God, but solely from the standpoint of the law of the land, whereof the infraction. Delightful as it may be, always when discovered, precipitates the beginner into serious difficulties. Hence there would be no danger developing in our hypothetical young individual a heart oriented in such wise that he would never perform a good deed, but at the same time would never feel the impulse to perform an evil one either until, at least, he had attained the age when experience would make him realize the indispensability of hypocrisy. Now, in such a case, the appropriate steps to take would be radically to deaden the sensibility immediately when you notice that, too lively, it was threatening to lead to vicious conduct. For here I suppose that from the very apathy to which you would reduce his spirit, some dangers could issue these dangers. However, will always be far smaller than those his excessive sensibility might be. Granted a sufficient subduing of sensibility, a consequent lowering of sensitivity and temperature, what crimes are committed will always be committed dispassionately, and hence the hypothetical pupil will have time enough to cover up his traces and avert suspicion, whereas those committed in a state of effervescence will, before he has the opportunity to collect his wits, tumble him into the gravest trouble. The cold-blooded crimes will be perhaps less splendid than somber, but they will be less ready of detection, because the phlegm and premeditation wherewith they will be perpetrated will guarantee leisure. To so arrange them as not to have to fear their consequences the other category, those perpetrated barefacedly, brashly, thoughtlessly, impulsively, will speedily bring their author to the gibbet. And your chief concern shall not be whether your pupil, when a mature man, commits or doesn't commit crimes, because in fact crime is a natural occurrence to which this or that human being is the accidental and often involuntary instrument. For whether he will or no, man is as a toy in nature's hands, when his organs put him there your chief concern, I say must be to see to it that this pupil commits the least dangerous offense, having regard to the laws of the country wherein he resides, in such sort that if the pettiest is punished and the most frightful is not, then tis very assuredly the most frightful you must let him commit. For, once again, it is not from crime you must shelter him, but from the sword that smites the perpetrator of crime crime, entails no disadvantages, its punishment entails many. To a man's welfare, it is all one whether he does or does not commit crimes, but it is most essential to this. Same welfare that he not be punished for those he commits, whatever their kind or degree of wickedness. A teacher's foremost duty to the pupil in his care would then be to cultivate in him a disposition toward the less dangerous of the two evils, since, unfortunately, it is but too true that he must incline in the one direction, or in the other, and experience will make it very clear to you that the vices proceeding from hard-heartedness are much less dangerous than not. Those caused by excess of sensibility. The excellent reason for this being that the lucidity and calm characteristic of the former ensure the means to avoid punishment, whereas there is nothing more obvious than that he will be punished too, lacking the time to make suitable provisions, to take the basic precautions, flies blindly into action in the heat of passion. Thus, in the first case, that is, where the young person is left to be impelled by his whole sensibility, he will perform a few good deeds which practice reveals utterly futile in the second. He will perform no good deeds which will mean not the slightest loss to him, and owing to the way you've shaped him, he will commit none but those infractions which may be committed without risk. But your pupil will become cruel, and what shall the effects of this cruelty be? With one who has a little substance to him, they will consist in a stout refusal to act at the behest of a pity his mind and heart, molded by you, will not acknowledge or even register, I see no danger in that. Tis but a matter of one or two virtuous performances the fewer, and there is nothing more useless than virtue. 
since unto him who exercises it, it is a cross to bear, and since, in our climes, it is never rewarded. With a bold and rigorous spirit, this cruelty in action will consist in furtive crimes, whose sharp impact will, by its friction, heat the electrical particles in the fluid in his nerves, and will perhaps mean death for a number of persons of little account. Where's the danger here? For in full possession of his faculty of judgment and right reason, he will proceed coolly, carefully, with such secrecy, with such art that the torch of justice will never be able to bring the thing to light, thus will he be happy. And at no risk what else does he want? It isn't evil, but the news thereof leaked out. That is perilous and the most odious crime of all. If well concealed, causes infinitely less embarrassment than the slightest foible become public. Now consider the other case. The entirety of his sensitive faculties at his command and operative, this pupil espies an object, and takes a liking to it, he would have it. His parents stand in his path accustomed to. Giving the freest possible rein to his sensibility, hell poison, hell butcher, every one who, keeping him from that object, frustrates his purposes, and hell perish broken on the wheel. You observe that in treating of both cases I have supposed the worst come into the worst I have merely offered. One example of the dangers inherent in either situation, and I leave you to imagine as many others as you like. If, after you have done calculating, you end by approving, as I am very sure you shall, the extinction of all sensibility in a pupil, then the first branch to lop off the tree is necessarily pity. And actually, what is pity? A purely egotistical sentiment seeing others beset by woe. We pity them because we fear lest that same woe befall us. Show me the man who, owing to his nature, is exempt from all the ills that afflict humankind. And not only will that man have no pity whatever, he won't even know the meaning of the word. A yet greater proof that pity is no more than a purely passive commotion, excited in persons of the skittish hysterical sort, owing to, or in proportion to, the misfortune of our fellows, is that, if we are immediate witnesses to it, we are always more sensitive to this misfortune. Even though the sufferer be a total stranger, than we are to the calamity sustained a hundred leagues away by our very best friend. And how explain the difference in our reactions save by the fact that this feeling is nothing but the physical result of the accidental commotion inspired in our nervous system? Well, I ask whether such a feeling can be deserving of any respect, and whether it can be viewed otherwise than as feebleness. More, it is an exceedingly painful feeling, since it occurs only through a comparison which harks us back to misfortune and causes us to brood thereon. Contrariwise, its extinction procures us joy, since as we extinguish it, in our sangfroid we glimpse a situation we are exempted from, and this permits us a favorable comparison destroy the moment we soften to the point of pitying the unlucky which we do when tormented by the cruel thought that perhaps we ourselves may be in a similar plight tomorrow. Defy this annoying fear. Learn to confront this danger undreadingly, and there's an end to your pity for others. A further proof that this feeling is naught but sheer weakness and pusillanimity is the particular frequency with which it is found in women and children, and its rarity in those individuals whose organs have acquired all suitable strength and vigor. For the same reason, the poor man is commonly he of the open heart dwelling closer to misfortune than the rich man, more familiar with it. He is of readier sympathy, all of which thus demonstrates that pity, far from being a virtue, is but a weakness born of fear and of woe a weakness which must be combated with especial severity when one sets about the task of blunting excessive nervous sensitivity, this sensibility that is so completely incompatible with every tenet of philosophy. There, Juliet, there they are, the principles that have led me to this tranquility, this equanimity, to this stoicism which now enables me to do anything and to endure anything without batting an eyelash. Make haste to initiate yourself into these mysteries, continued that charming woman, 
as yet unaware of the point I had advanced to in these articles. Make haste to annihilate this stupid commiseration, which will upset you every time you catch sight of woe, howsoever trivial. Arriving at that stage, my angel, by dint of continued tests, which will soon have you convinced of the extreme difference between yourself and the alien object whose sad fate you lament. Be persuaded the tears you shed over that individual cannot meliorate his circumstances one iota, and can only cause you affliction be equally. Sure that the succor you were to give him would mean no more than an insipid sensual pleasure for you, whereas the refusal of aid may produce a very keen one. Be furthermore persuaded that you will be tampering with the natural scheme by rescuing from the indigent class those persons nature deliberately placed there that wise and entirely logical in all her operations. Her designs regarding human beings are neither for us to fathom nor to thwart that her designs are substantiated by the unequal distribution of puissance among men, this necessarily implying unequal means, resources, conditions, and destinies. Avail yourself of examples out of history, Juliet, Consult the authority of the ancients you have been trained in the classics. Recollect your reading. Remember the Emperor Licinius, who, prescribing the harshest penalties, forbade all compassion toward the poor, and any sort of charity toward indigence. Remember that sect of Greek philosophers who maintained there was crime in seeking to meddle with the various shades in the nature-ordained spectrum of social classes. And when you have walked Developed your thought to the point I have. Cease to deplore the loss of pity-prompted acts of virtue for these virtuous acts. Founded on egoism exclusively, are utterly unworthy of respect. Since it is by no means sure that there is good in extricating from misfortune the wretch nature put there, it is far simpler to nip in the bud, the sentiment whereby we are rendered sympathetic to his sufferings than to let it flower and be all the while apprehensive lest our compassion, interfering with the order of things, be outrageous to nature the best course is to cultivate in ourselves such a frame of mind as will enable us to look upon those sufferings with indifference and unconcern. Ah, dear friend, were you, like me, strong enough to advance one step further? Had you the courage to take pleasure contemplating the sufferings of others, merely from the agreeable thought of not experiencing them yourself, a thought which necessarily produces a very decided joy were you able to go that far? No doubt but that it would represent a great achievement, since you'd have succeeded in turning some of life's thorns into roses. Be equally certain, my heart, that men of the stamp of Dennis, Nero, Lula the Vest, Tiberius, Wenceslas, Herod, Andronicus, Heliogabalus, Retzix base their happiness upon similar principles, and that if they were able without shuddering, without qualms to do all they did in the line of atrocity, it is obviously because they had mastered the technique of exploiting crime for lustful purposes. Those men were monsters, a fool will tell me. So indeed they were, according to our ways of thinking and behaving, but from the point of view of nature and in terms of her dictates, they were simply the instruments of her intentions, endowing them with their ferocious and bloodthirsty characters. She appointed them to execute her laws. Thus, though they appear to have performed much evil, as that is defined by man-made law, they acted in admirable conformance to the law of nature, whose aim is to destroy, at least as much as she creates. No, no, those worthies wrought a substantial wheel, since they put her desires into effect, whence it results that the individual who has a character like these so-called tyrants, or he who manages to raise his character to this level, will not only not steer clear of evil, but may even discover in the fulfillment of his designated or elected role, a source of very potent joy, which he will savor all the more fearlessly, the more certain he is that, by means either of his cruelties, or his disorders. He is rendering nature a service no less useful than that a saint performs to the exercise of his capacities for good doing and virtue. Fortify all this with examples, feed it upon practice gaze often and long upon spectacles of woe. Accustom yourself to refusing aid to the downtrodden, to the unlucky, 
so that you become habituated to the idea and the sight of sufferers abandoned to their sufferings be the direct cause of some, of a few which are somewhat crueler, more atrocious than the everyday and icti. Won't be long before you recognize that between the sufferings you provoke, and which do not affect you in the least, and the voluptuous vibration of your nerves, thrilled by the impact of these sufferings, even if this be merely the thrill that comes of contrasting weal and woe, and finding the comparison heavily in your favor, you have no cause for a moment's hesitation. Little by little, your sensibility will deaden you all not have prevented great crimes, since, to the contrary, you will have caused some to be committed, and will yourself have perpetrated not a few, but at least you'll have done so phlegmatically with this apathy which permits the veiling of the passions, and which, safeguarding lucidity, indispensable to the avoidance of disagreeable repercussions, is your guarantee against all dangers. Oh, Claire Will, I can't imagine that with such attitudes you have impoverished yourself through good works. I am rich. That extraordinary woman replied, so rich that I am not even sure how much I have. Well, Juliet, I swear to you that I would prefer to throw all the money I own into the river than employ a penny of it in what fools call charities, prayers, or alms, I believe such. Things are most harmful to humanity, fatal to the poor whose energies are sapped by the practice of bestowing largesses, and more dangerous yet for the wealthy man who believes he has secured title to every virtue once he has given a crown or two to some priests or shiftless rascals, a certain means for masking his every vice the while encouraging the vices of others. Adorable woman, I said to my friend, knowing the position I hold in the minister's entourage, as I think you must. You cannot doubt that my moral outlook as regards the subjects you have been discussing is not a great deal purer than yours. Certainly, said she. I know all the services you render St. Fond, I have been his friend as well as Norswell. For ad show could I help but be familiar with those two scoundrels' debauches? You collaborate in them, and that is laudable where I need E.I.D. do the same. And I.D. do it happily, for I positively worship crime. But I also know, Juliet, that by laboring much in behalf of others you have, so far, labored little in your own, and with but two or three petty thefts to your credit. You can still benefit from examples and lessons, so let me encourage you and steal you to more considerable undertakings, if indeed you really wish to be worthy of us. Ah, said I, I am already much in your debt. Pray continue to instruct me, and rest assured you will nowhere find a more attentive nor an apter student. I am in your hands. There is nothing ill not attempt at your side, guided by your advice. And from now on my whole ambition shall be some day to surpass my teacher. But, my best beloved, we are already forgetful of our pleasures. I receive divine ones from you. You've not yet given me a chance to reciprocate. And I am keenly impatient to instill into your soul some spark of the heavenly fire you lately caused to blaze in mine. Juliet, you are delicious, truly, but I'm too old for you. Are you aware that I am thirty? Ordinary things have long since palled. To be moved ever so slightly, I must have recourse to refinements so coarse, episodes so potentera, the sweet sap rise in me there. Must be such a quantity of preliminaries, of monstrous thoughts, of obscene gestures, actions, and if I am to discharge, I require. But enough my habits will affright you, my transports will shock you, my exigencies will fatigue you. And then a brightness entered her eyes. A lewdness wetted her lips, she asked. Have you women in the house? Are they lascivious? Pretty or not? That doesn't matter, you'll arouse me. But I could use a bevy of tolerably roguish, immodest, patient, vigorous, foul-mouthed creatures, and they needn't bother to come into the room if they're wearing a stitch of clothing. How many such women can you provide me? I have only four in my permanent hire, I answered. Four being enough for my emergency requirements. That's exceedingly few. You can't pretend to be poor. My dear, 
You ought to maintain a staff of at least twenty, and change them all every week, furthermore. Ah, tis clear ale have to teach you how to use the money you're swimming in. Are you, um, miserly? Not that there's anything wrong with that. I idolize money. I've often frigged myself sitting amidst the heaps of Louis d'Or I've amassed. It's the idea that I can do whatever I like with the money before my eyes. That's what drives me wild. I find it quite natural that others have the same taste. But nevertheless, I won't have you deprive yourself. Only fools are unable to understand that. One can be simultaneously niggardly and lavish. That one can love wasteful squandering upon one's pleasures and refuse a farthing to charity. Well, then, then for your four women, and if you wish to see me discharge, find some switches. Switches? Switches, rods, lashes, however you please to call them. Gee whip, my dear, until blood flows, my darling, and I endure like treatment. It's the most delicious passion I know of none sure to inflame my entire being. Nobody doubts nowadays but that passive flagellation is of prime efficacy. It is a matchless restorative, supplying new vitality to the frame, wearied by overindulgence. No wonder, then, that all those who have worn themselves to a frazzle in riot and sport have regular and avid recourse to the painful and invigorating operation of flagellation, supreme remedy for exhaustion from feebleness about the loins or total loss of strength or for a cold, vicious, and oddly organized constitution. This operation necessarily implies a violent commotion in the lax or deficient parts. It procures a voluptuous irritation which heats them, and causes the sperm to leap with infinitely increased force, the keen sensation of pain in the parts upon which the blows are applied, subtilizes the blood, and accelerates its circulation quickens the spirits by furnishing excessive heat to the genitals. In short, to the libidinous person in quest of pleasure provides, at such times as they are not naturally forthcoming, the means for consummating the libertine act and for multiplying his impudicious joys beyond the limits imposed by that unkind nature. As regards active flagellation, in all the world can there be a greater delight for hard-hearted, tough-minded individuals like us? Is there another that so clearly bears the stamp of ferocity, that briefly, more fully satisfies our natural given penchant for cruelty? Oh, Juliet! To break into this degradation some youthful object, appealing and mild, and who, when possible, is somehow related to us, harshly to inflict upon her this form of torture, all the characteristics whereof are so emphatically voluptuous, to be amused by her tears excited by her distress, irritated by her capers, inflamed by her writhings, by that voluptuous dancing seven performed to the music of pain, to make her blood flow, her sweat, her tears, to feast upon them, upon her pretty face to mark and exult at contortions of sufferings, and the twitching caused by despair, with one's tongue to lap up those floods in carnadine, so nicely contrasting, with the lily fairness of a soft white skin, to feign to relent for an instant, only to inspire terror the next by threats, to carry them out, and in doing so, to use yet more outrageous and more atrocious means, to spare nothing in your rage, to have at the most delicate parts, those very ones nature seems to have created to be venerated by fools, such as the breasts or the interior of the vagina, such as the face itself, oh, Juliet. That is joy. Tis it not, as it were, to encroach somewhat upon the public hangman's domain? Is it not to play his role? And by itself, does not this idea suffice to provoke an idiot with people who, unspeakably jaded as are we, indifferent to everything simple and commonplace, must study deeply and seek far if we are to find again that which our excesses have caused us to lose? Nor ought you be surprised to discover this taste in a woman. That same Brantome, from whom we borrowed a term a moment ago, with charming candor and naivete, offers us various examples in support of these theses. Eight there was, says he, a fashionable and distinguished lady, equally beautiful 
and rich for several years, she had been a widow, and her moral corruption was astonishing. She used to hold parties to them. She would invite girls of high social rank and always of exceptional beauty. It was her pleasure to undress her guests and give them fierce spankings. To obtain the right to punish them, she would accuse them of imaginary misbehavior, would then beat them with switches, and her whole joy consisted in seeing Thema quiver and squirm beneath the blows. The more they capered about, the louder their plaints, the more abundantly they bled and wept, the happier was the whole. Sometimes she was content to bear their behinds instead of stripping them altogether naked from the act of lifting their wow. Skirts and keeping them raised, deriving yet more satisfaction than that afforded her when they were nude. And hence, easy prey. A great nobleman, Brantome tells us farther on, also indulged in this same pleasure of fustigating his wife, either nude or with her skirts pulled out. A mother, the same writer assures us, had the habit of whipping her daughter twice every day, not for anything the girl had done but uniquely for the pleasure of contemplating her sufferings. When the young thing reached the age of fourteen, she so inflamed her mother's concupiscence that she wouldn't let four hours go by without flogging her cruelly. Of contemporaries, we have examples enough, do we not? And better ones at that. And could not your friend St. Fond, who never misses giving his daughter her daily lashing, serve as the subject for an entire corpus of modern research? I've been the victim of that taste, I observed, but I rather fancy it nonetheless, and may well adopt it some day in my turn. Oh, yes, Claire will. Ill acquire all your tastes. I wish, if I possibly can, to become identical to you. Henceforth, Juliet shall know no happiness until she has taken on all your vices. The four women made their entrance. They were naked, in accordance with my friend's desire and as a group they surely presented a stirring sight to lewdness. The eldest was not quite eighteen, the youngest fifteen. There were lovely bodies and most agreeable faces. They will do, said Clarewell, glancing briefly at each. Each had a bundle of switches in her hand. These Clarewell examined rather more closely. Very well, we shall proceed by order of age. Approach, she said to the youngest. Come here and prostrate yourself at my feet. Now humbly beg pardon for your clumsy behavior yesterday. Clumsy behavior? Madame, I don't believe I. And Claire Wheel gave her a resounding slap across the face. I tell you, you behaved clumsily. I order you to kneel and ask forgiveness. Oh, indeed, madame, said the little girl, falling to her knees. I ask it with all my heart. But I don't intend to forgive you without first punishing you. Stand up and turn your ass obediently this way. Thereupon, having softly stroked the pretty ass with the palm of her hand, Claire will smote it so forcefully that she left there the impress of her five fingers' tears began to flow down the girl's cheeks. The poor thing had had no forewarning of what was in store for her. She had never experienced anything like it, this reception was affecting her dolorously. Claire Will peers at her and licks her eyes as soon as she sees the tears well forth from her own eyes flames dart. Her breathing quickens and becomes hoarse. Her breasts heave in cadence with the beating of her heart. She stabs her tongue into the girl's mouth, sucks her tongue, then further animated by this caress, applies another blow to her ass, and this one is harder than the first. You're a little slut, says Claire Will. I saw what you were doing yesterday. I did indeed frigging pricks, and don't deny it. Ill or not have you committing such outrages. I favor morality. I do. I expect modesty in young girls. Madame, I swear to you. No swearing, whore, and no excuses either, Clarewell interrupted, punching the girl's flank. Guilty or not, you're due to be vexed, for I aim to amuse myself. Wretched little creatures of your sort are no use whatever, except for providing entertainment to women of mine. So saying, Claire Will pinches the fleshy parts of the victim's pretty body. This ring shrieks from her, each of which gets no farther than her lips, for our libertine is there to collect them in her mouth. Her wrath grew apace. She gave utterance to the foulest words, 
They came forth spasmodically, like her gasps of joy she bent her victim down over the couch. Lubriciously investigated her bum, pried it open, thrust her tongue there into, then concentrated on her buttocks afresh, bit them in four places, the which the girl did not endure, without much jerking to and fro in sudden starts that greatly diverted my friend and made her laugh one of those wicked laughs, wherein the mischief outweighs the gaiety. Little bum, you're in for a thrashing, says she. Yes, by the bum-stuffed almighty. I'm going to flay you, and this cunning little shit-sump of yours is going to show every stripe for an age. Catching up a bundle of switches, she pulls the girl to her feet, takes her around the waist with her left arm, and thrusting a knee against her belly, bends her so that her ass is in the fairest position. Clarewell pauses for a minute, seems to reflect, to brood, then, without a word, begins to lay on and applies five and twenty stinging cuts so nicely distributed that every square inch of this formerly fresh pink ass is covered with welts. That done, she summons the other three women one after the other, has each stick her tongue in her mouth, ordering each to fondle her buttocks while embracing her, to tickle her asshole, to poke into it, to approve her punishment of the delinquent, and above all to furnish additional information upon her misconduct. After she was finished with the three girls, my turn came. I kissed her in similar wise, socratized her, praised her firm handling of the victim, and by means of a string of arrant calumnies, fanned her lubricious rage against the unfortunate creature. When I kissed her, she wanted me to fill her mouth with my spittle. I did so, and she swallowed it next, returning to work. She laid on a second series of blows, twice as numerous as the first then immediately, a third series, bringing the total to 150 strokes. The little girl's ass was but one bleeding wound. She bade the three other women lick it and convey the blood into her mouth. And she kissed me, transferring that blood into mine. Juliet, said she, the fever of delirium is taking fast hold of my senses. I must warn you that these other hussies are going to be more uncompromisingly dealt with. She loses the little girl, and from her receives a light tonguing about the cut in anise. Very well, says she, pointing to the second. I believe your age puts you next in line. Step up, whore. The latter, terrified by what has just been done to her comrade, instead of obeying, shrinks back. But Claire Will, who was in no merciful mood, seizes her by the arm, and gives her several very violent slaps. She begins to weep. Good, says Claire Will. That's what I like. And since this charming creature, sixteen years of age, had prettily formed breasts already, Claire Will squeezed them until she screamed then, kissing them the very next moment. She worried them with her teeth. And now, she said with a curse, well, have a look at your ass, it proved very pleasing to Clarewell's eye, and she could not help but exclaim before bringing them under the fire of her scourge, What splendid cheeks! Greatly impressed by their excellence, she rendered them new courtesies she stooped forward, nuzzled that miracle of nature, and sucked the hole she rolled the girl onto her back, sucked her clitoris, then promptly returned again to her ass. But they are not slaps she now applies. They are jarring blows of her clenched fist she drives home, pounding this frail body until it is all black and blue from thigh to shoulder. Bugger fuck, cries she, in going out of my mind. This little slattern has one of the loveliest asses I've seen in my life. She seizes the switches and lays frantically on. But after a few score strokes, she employs a tactic she has not used hitherto. Claire will prize open the patient's buttocks with her left hand, so that the blows she is delivering with her right hand fall upon the exposed asshole and the sensitive sector adjoining it wherefore it is, that the entire area is soon bloody. And while all this was going ahead, Claire will required kisses upon her mouth and fingers in her bum. The three other girls and I attended to these matters, however. She would allow no one but me to swallow her saliva. The third girl was treated like the first, the fourth, like the second they were all flogged, virtually, to ribbons. When these ceremonies were over, Clarewell, in an ecstasy, and as beautiful as Venus to behold, 
ranged the four girls in a line so as to compare their asses and verify whether they were all sufficiently lacerated. Finding that one had been somewhat neglected, she rained another fifty blows upon it, looked, and satisfied herself that it was presently in a state as deplorable as the others. Juliet, do you wish me to thrash you too? By all means, yes, I answered at once. How can you suspect me of not passionately desiring whatever adds to the sum of your delights? Sigh! Whip away. Here is my ass. Here is my body. My whole being is yours to do with as you like. In that case, she said, climb upon the shoulders of the youngest of these tarts, and while I flog you, the three others will heed my orders. Take up your switches. She went on. Which of you has the stoutest arm? You will be the last to operate, and you, she said, nodding to the most slender of the three, you shall be the first. So listen to me. This is what you are to do. You will kneel facing my ass. You will praise it loudly, unreservedly. You'll kiss it. You'll divide my buttocks. We'll introduce your tongue far into the hole. While doing so, rubbing my clit with one finger, then you will stand up, and to the tune of threats and invectives, you will bestow two hundred strokes upon my ass. They must come in swift succession, and in steadily mounting force, and you over there. You've heard what I've just said when this girl is done. You will promptly imitate the performance we begin. With nips, pinches, scratches, Claire Will was harrying the behind of the little girl upon whose shoulders I was perched, and in the meantime was flailing me in the most determined fashion concurrently. The others were carrying out her instructions to the letter, and the whore, anxious to make use of everything available, was kissing the mouths of those who were not whipping her. As the stripes accumulated upon my ass, the ferocious creature kissed and licked the marks avidly, and when she herself had received the number of strokes she had specified, she ordered positions to be shifted. The eighteen-year-old girl knelt in front of her, advancing her cunt. Claire Will pushed it into the girl's face, grinding the lips of her van hercs against the girl's nose, mouth, and eyes, and bidding her lick all her tongue could reach. Another girl stationed to the right, a third to the left, were vigorously scourging my friend who, swinging a bundle of switches in either hand, thus avenging herself upon the pair of asses ahead of her squatting astride the head of the girl busy, Licking her cunt? I offered Claire will mind to suck and hear the whole discharge. And that discharge, accompanied by shouts and shrieks, convulsions and blasphemies, was one of the most lubricious and most voluptuous frenzies. I have ever observed in all my days, the tribade fired point blank at the pretty visage fairly engulfed in her cunt, and drenched it with fire. Come along, thy Jesus, onto something else, Claire will cried not so much as pausing for breath. I never take time out when my sperm is started, so you whores, the labber me, rack me, suck me, whip me, frig me as hard as ever you can. The girl of eighteen lies down upon the ottoman. I seat myself upon her face. Claire will camps herself on mine. I sucked. And was sucked above me, the youngest girl gave her buttocks to be kissed by Claire will, whom another girl was embuggering with a dildo, the slenderest of the quartet. Bending over was finger-frigging Claire Will's clitoris, which was established hard by my mouth, and in the meantime was presenting her cut to my friend, whose hands were polluting it in similar style. So it was our libertine was simultaneously arousing an asshole by lecheries, having her anus tongued, being sodomized, and getting her teeth. Several minutes of this had gone by when she said to me, Juliet, I told you that if I am to stiffen, I must be imaginatively moved. One of the things that best excites my imagination is to hear much foul language uttered all around me. Your whores, are they dumb? We were arrived at an awkward pass for these girls, chosen out of the best ranks of the bourgeoisie, and never having been libertine except with me. Had poor acquaintance with any idiom apt to be agreeable to Claire Will's ears, they did the best they were able, however. But I was obliged to aid them and virtually all alone had to supply the C.I. Caustic insults she was pleased to hear addressed to the supreme being in whose existence the jade had no more belief than I. Consequently, she who had been clitoris frigging replaced me at my cunt-sucking post, 
and I concentrated on vilifying each member of the scurvy Christian trinity, as they had never been blasphemed in all their lives. The tribade squirmed and sighed incontinently, but nothing came of it. Postures and episodes had to be changed once again. I have never seen anything so majestic, nor so beautiful, nor so animated as that superb woman at the conclusion of this scene. Were you of a mind to paint? The very goddess of lewd love, you could not have looked elsewhere for your model. She throws her arms about my neck, hugs me, tongues me for a quarter of an hour, exhibits her ass to me, it was scarlet all over, and contrasted in the most agreeable manner with the alabaster whiteness of the rest of her body. Bryce bumstuffed. Holy god of buggery, said she, overwrought. How hot I am in the cunt, Juliet! And what things I could achieve in this state! There's not a crime of whatever sort or extent you can imagine. I did not commit on the spot. Oh, my lover. My horo. My dearest little companion. Oh, thou whom I love infinitely, and in whose embrace I want to shed a lifetime's f- Oh, Juliet! You must admit that nothing paves a surer or a smoother way a horror than the calm self-confidence. Impunity. Capital and good health we enjoy. So suggest me the idea for a few crimes. Ill accomplish them while you look on. Let's, oh, I beseech you. Let's perpetrate an infamy. Noticing that the youngest of the girls was arousing her, and that she was going from her mouth to her ass to her cunt, sucking them one after the other, I inquired in a whisper. Would you care to abuse her? No, was her reply. It wouldn't satisfy me I've nothing against giving a woman an occasional pummeling. But as for total material dissolution, you understand I do have to have a man. Only men rouse me to serious cruelties. I adore revenging myself for the horrors men subject us to when those brutes have the upper hand. You can't imagine with what delight I do now murder a male. Any male at all. My God. The tortures I de inflict upon him, the slow, winding, obscure path I de find to bring him to his final destination. Alack, tis plain to see, your mind has yet to reach full flower. You haven't any men about for me to kill, and so let's end the evening with a few exercises in libidinous nastiness, since we cannot close it with crimes. The libidinous acts performed with great precision, and all the desired conclusions, finally exhaust her, she refreshes. Herself in a bath of rose water, is dried, perfumed, draped in the most immodest of gowns, and we sit down to supper. Claire will, quite as eccentric in her comportment at table as in bed, quite as intemperate, no less curious in the article of eating than in the other of fed only on fowl and game, and they had to be boned, and then served up disguised in all sorts of forms her usual drink was sweetened water, and it had to be iced regardless of the season. And to every pint of this liquid she added twenty drops of essence of lemon, and two spoonfuls of orange flower extract. She never touched wine, but consumed large amounts of coffee and liqueurs she ate in excessive quantity furthermore. Of the better than fifty dishes put before her, she attacked everyone. Advised beforehand of her tastes, I saw to it that her desires were accommodated, and it defies belief, the tale of all she made away with. That charming person, whose custom was whenever and wherever possible to secure the adoption of her private tastes, recommended them to me so heartily that she induced me to observe her diet, but not her abstinence from wine. I still indulge very heavily in it, and shall doubtless continue to do so for the rest of my life. While we were supping, I confessed to Claire Will my amazement at her libertinage. You haven't seen much yet, she replied, little beyond a faint sketch of what I regularly accomplish in lewd debauchery. I am most eager that we essay truly extraordinary things together. I shall have you admitted into a society I belong to and whose members specialize in obscenities of a much superior dimension. To its meetings each husband must bring his wife, each brother his sister, each father his daughter, 
each bachelor a friend, each lover his mistress, and gathered in a spacious hall, each takes his pleasure with what pleases him most. Subject to no rule, save that of his desires, to no limit, save that of his imagination, the most praiseworthy. Is he who acquits himself of ah, the greatest and most numerous extravagances, and cash prizes are awarded to those who distinguish themselves in infamy, or who invent new ways and means for procuring oneself pleasure. Oh, dearest friend, I cried, taking Claire Will in my arms, you simply have no idea how those few details excite me, nor how happy I would be to join your circle. Yes? But will you be considered eligible? Candidates are submitted to the most arduous tests. Do you doubt of my capacity, of my determination? And whatever these initiations may be, do you suppose I will flinch, knowing as you do all that I have performed intrepidly in the company of Norshuil and St. Fond? True enough, she conceded. You're not shy, it must be owned. Your chances of being admitted are better than fair. Then a note of enthusiasm entered her voice. Oh, Juliet. As it is always to the disgust, to the restlessness, to the despair at not ever having found either a mutual understanding or mutual pleasure with Ua, the object to which we are conventionally bound that are owing all of wedlock's miseries, to remedy this hideous situation, to counteract the hideous social practices whereby mismatched individuals are imprisoned all their lives in nightmarish unions, it would be necessary that all men and all women federate into such clubs. A hundred husbands, a hundred fathers, cooperatively with their wives or daughters, are availed thereby of all they lack. When I cede my husband to Clemaine, she obtains everything her own husband cannot give her. And from the one she abandons to me, I derive all the delights mine is incapable of providing me. These exchanges multiply, and thus, you see, in a single evening every woman enjoys a hundred men. Each man as many women in the course of these foregatherings characters. Develop one has an opportunity to study oneself the most entire freedom of taste or fancy. Hold sway there the man who dislikes women, amuses himself with his fellows. The woman who is fond of persons of her own. Sex simply follows the dictates of her penchants, also no constraint, no hindrances, no modesty. The mere desire to increase one's pleasures ensures that each will offer all his resources. Thereupon, the general interest maintains the pact, and particular interest coincides straightly with the general, which renders indissoluble the ties forming. The society ours has been fifteen years in existence, and all that time I have never witnessed a single squabble. No, not one instance of ill-humor. Such arrangements annihilate jealousy, forever destroy the fear of cuckoldry, two of life's most pernicious poisons, and for that reason alone merit. Preference over those monotonous partnerships, in which husband and wife, pining their lives away one in the presence of the other, are doomed either to everlasting boredom and displeasure, or to grief at being unable to dissolve their marriage, save at the price of dishonor for them both. May our example persuade mankind to do as we. There are, I am aware, some prejudices to overcome, but prejudice cannot long survive when one of these groups, as is the case with ours, is injected with a strong philosophical temper. It was during my first year of marriage I was granted membership. I was just sixteen then. Oh, yes, making my debut. I confess I did indeed blush at having to appear naked before all those men and to participate in their carryings on and in those of the women who, because of my age and figure, were drawn to me like flies to sugar. But in three days I was acquitting myself like a veteran. The example of the others seduced me, and I can honestly affirm that no sooner did I see my lascivious companions vying for honors in the choice and the invention of lubricities. No sooner did I see them wallowing in filth and infamy than I plunged into the competition with ardent goodwill and shortly surpassed them all in theory and practice alike. The description of this delicious association had such an effect upon me 
that I was unwilling to take leave of Clarewell until she had sworn to secure my entrance into her club. The oath was sealed with fresh outpourings of f we both released before the eyes of three strapping lackeys. They held candelabras while we frigged each other. And though they were moved by the spectacle, Claire will forbade them from participating in it save as bystanders. There you have an instance, said she, of how one accustoms oneself to cynicism, a habit of mind whereof proof will be required of you before you are accepted into our society. We separated, enchanted with each other, and promising to meet together again at the very first opportunity. Norsey was impatient to find out how my liaison with Madame de Claire Will was progressing the warmth wherewith I spoke of her translated my gratitude. He wanted graphic particulars. I supplied them, and, as Claire Will had done, he criticized me for not having a more numerous complement of women in my household. I increased them by eight the very next day which gave me a seraglio of twelve of the prettiest creatures in Paris. I exchanged them against a dozen fresh ones every month. I mentioned the society Claire will belong to did nor sell attend its meetings. In the days when men were in the majority there, he replied, I never missed a single one. But I have given up going since everything has fallen into the hands of a set whose authority I dislike. St. Fon felt the same way and dropped out shortly after I did. But that is not particularly relevant, Norswell continued, if those orgies amuse you, and since Clarewell enjoys them. There is no reason why you shouldn't join in everything vicious must be given a fair try, and only virtue is thoroughly boring. At those meetings you will be frigged to perfection, exquisitely fuel, be nourished upon the very best principles only, and so I would advise you to gain admission as soon as you possibly can. Then he inquired if my new friend had recounted her adventures to me in detail. No, said I, philosophical in spirit though you are, and the fact cannot have escaped her notice, Morsieu remarked. She probably feared lest you be scandalized, for that Claire Will is a very paragon of lust, cruelty, debauchery, and atheism. There is no horror. No execration wherewith she is not soiled profoundly. Her social position and boundless wealth have always saved her from the rope. But she's merited it twenty times over, reckon up the sum of her daily activities, and there you have the total of her crimes. And had she been hanged every day of her life, it would never have been without cause. St. Fon thinks very highly of her nonetheless, and this I know, he prefers you for a number of reasons, therefore. Juliet, continue to, to be deserving of the confidence of a man in whose power it is to make your life a happy one, or an unhappy. Rest assured, I rejoined, all my efforts shall be bent in that direction. Noisseur had come to fetch me for supper at his little house, and we betook ourselves there and spent the night carousing with two other engaging persons, executing all the extravagances that occurred to that specialist in lubricious practices. It was shortly afterward that, mightily stirred by what I had been witness to, by the things I had been hearing, I reached the point where I simply could not restrain myself any longer. I had absolutely to commit a crime of my own, and I was eager to learn, moreover, whether I could truly rely upon the impunity that had been promised me. So I took counsel with myself, and decided to enact one such horror as I was being schooled in day, in and day out. Wishing to put both my daring and my savagery to the test, I got into man's attire and a brace of pistols in my pocket, went out alone, stood in a back street, and waited for the first comer, with the aim of robbing and murdering him for my pleasure. I was leaning against the wall, I was in that state of inner turmoil great passions provoke, and whose impact upon the animal spirits is necessary to the elementary criminal delight. I listened, Aswet. Every murmur, every footfall raised my hopes. The very faintest movement in the shadows made me think my prey was nigh, and then I heard sounds of lamentation. I sped in the direction whence they came. They were groans I approach. Tis a poor woman huddled upon a doorstep. And who are you? I inquired, drawing close to the creature. The most unfortunate of women, 
is her tearful reply, and I observe that she cannot be over thirty years of age, and if you are death's messenger, you bring me glad tidings. But your difficulties are of precisely what kind. They are frightful, she said, and as she sat up, the lamplight revealed her mild inviting features. Yes, few have ever been so unlucky as I. We've had no work for a week, no money. We had a room in this building. We weren't able to pay the rent, nor able either to buy milk for the baby they've taken it away from me, and put my husband in jail. I too would have been arrested had I not run away from those monsters who treated us so brutally. You see me lying on the threshold of a house that belonged to me once, for I've not always been poor. In those days, when I could afford to, I help the needy will you do for me now. What I used to do for them. I do not ask much. A subtle glow stole through my veins as I heard those words. Savored that accent. Oh, by God, I said to myself, what an occasion for a delectable crime. And how the idea stung my senses. Get up, said I. I'm a man, as you can see. You have a body left to you, don't you? I intend to amuse myself with it. Oh, sir, here am I beset by sorrow and distress in such a state kindle lust. It kindles mine all right, so do as I tell you, else you'll regret it. And taking strong hold of her arm, I forced her to stand still while I proceeded to an investigation. It brought agreeable things to light. Those skirts harbored charms very fair, very firm, very appetizing. Freak me, I ordered, conveying her hand to my cunt. I am a woman, but one who stiffens for her own sex. Put your fingers in there and rub. Oh, Lord. Leave me be, leave me be. I shudder at all these horrors. Though poor, I am honest, don't humiliate me. For pity's sake, she endeavors to break away from me. I seize her by the hair. Raise a pistol to her temple, be off buggerous, I say. Off to hell with you, and tell them there that Juliet sent you. And she fell, blood gushing from her head. Yes, my friends, I shot her dead, I won't deny it. Neither will I pretend that this deed did not cause a sudden rise in the temperature of my neural humors. For, as I enacted it, my f fairly spat forth. And so, these are the fruits of crime, I mused. How right they were to describe it to me in such glowing terms. God, what sovereign influence it can exert upon a brain like mine, and what gigantic pleasures it can afford. Hearing the pistol shot, people had come to their windows, I saw a few heads, and now began to think of my safety. Cries of police, police, went up on all sides. It was just after midnight, I was hailed, Ordered to halt the discovery of my weapons, eliminated all doubt I was asked my name. You'll be informed at the minister's, I said brazenly. Take me to the Hotel de saint fon dumbfounded. The sergeant does not dare refuse, I am manacled. I am pinioned and still the f seeps down. My thighs delicious are the fetters of the crime you adore, and wearing them causes one long spasm of joy. saint fon had not yet retired, a servant notified him. I was led in. The minister greeted me with a smile. That will do, he said to the sergeant. Had you not brought this lady here to my house, you were as good as hang. You may go now, sir, and resume your functions. Consider that you have done your duty. What has just transpired shall remain a mystery. You are not to intrude into it, I presume I need say no more. Alone with my lover, I related all that had passed. My account set his prick in the air he wished to know. When the woman had fallen to the ground, had I been able to appreciate the effects of her contortions? I answered that I had not had enough time. No, I suppose not. That's the trouble with performances of that sort. You weren't able to obtain any enjoyment from the victim. To be sure, my lord, but a street crime. I know, I know. I've a few of them to my credit disturbance of the peace. Scandal the street, the highway, the additional severity of the law. Towards such offenses, and they can be profitable as well on top of it all. That particular woman's circumstances, her indigence, her misery. No, it's not to be scoffed at. You could have taken her home with you. 
It would have been an evening's entertainment for us both. By the way, did not that sergeant mention having identified the corpse? Unless I am mistaken, my lord. Her name was Simon. Simon Dardoin. Of course. I handled that affair four or five days ago. That's it, Simon. I had the husband jailed, and the infant removed to the poorhouse. My stars, Juliet. I remember the woman, too. She was very pretty and very well behaved. I was reserving her for your pimps, and she told you the truth. That family was once quite prosperous. Bankruptcy altered all that. Well, UV simply added the finishing touches to my crime. And this conclusion makes the story delicious from beginning to end. I said, St. Fawn's standard was raised. My masculine dress was completing his delirium. He led me into the boudoir where he had received me the first time I had come to his house. A manservant appeared, and St. Fawn, his fingers trembling from delight, unbuttoned my breeches, and had his valet fondle my buttocks, he took charge of the fellow's prick, and prodded my asshole with its tip, then introduced his own therein to, and the lecher and buggered me, hotly enjoining me to suck his valet's prick the while, and when I.D. got it stiff as a poker, he packed it away in his ass. The operation over with, St. Fon told me that the excellence of his discharge was in large measure due to the knowledge that the ass he was fun merited the scaffold. That lad who fun me, the minister assured me, is a rascal of the first order six times over I've had to save him from the wheel. Did you notice his prick? Tis a magnificent article. He plies it masterfully. Here, Juliet, before I forget the sum I promised you for crimes of your personal commission, a carriage is waiting for you. Go home now, tomorrow. You will leave for the estate outside so which I bought for you last month. Take only a few companions along. Four of your female domestics should suffice the prettiest of the lot, however your cook too, your butler, and the three virgins listed for the next supper. Installed in the country, you'll await further instructions from me. That's all I'll tell you for the time being. I left very content with the success of my crime, full of pleasure at having committed it, and departed from Paris on the morrow. Scarcely was I established in that rural domain, completely isolated, as solitary as the Thebaid hermits, when there came one of my servants to inform me a stranger had arrived, a person of condition who said he had been sent by the minister and wished to speak with me. Ask him to wait, said I, and unsealed the message he had brought from St. Fon. It read as follows, have your domestic seize the bearer of this letter straightway. He is to be confined in one of the dungeons I have caused to be built in the cellars of your house. This individual is not to be allowed to escape, I hold you responsible for him. His wife and daughter will also appear, you will deal with them in the same manner. These are my orders. Execute them promptly, scrupulously, and do not hesitate to employ such treachery, such cruelty, as I know you to be capable of. Adieu. I had the stranger ushered in. Sir, said I, maintaining the appearance of perfect equanimity and graciousness, you are doubtless a friend of his lordship. Both my family and I have for a long time been the beneficiaries of his generosities and kindness, madame. Tis plain from his letter, monsieur. But allow me to give my servants instructions so that you may be received in such wise as the minister seems to desire. Bidding him be seated, I went out of the room. My servants, and they were rather more slaves than domestics, provided themselves with rope and were at my side when I returned to the visitor. Conduct this gentleman, I told them, to the quarters his lordship would have him occupy. And my retainers, powerful bucks they were, set upon our guest and dragged him off to a very abominable cell far underground. Madame, I protest, there is some mistake, cried the unlucky dupe of St. Fon's deceit and mine. Inflexible, deaf to his pleadings, I carried out the minister's instructions with zeal to captives. Anguished questions were left all unanswered. I myself turned the key in the lock. No sooner was I back in the drawing room than I heard carriage wheels on the drive. Out stepped the stranger's wife and daughter, and the letters of introduction they presented were exact replicas of his. Ah, St. Fond, I said to myself, casting a glance upon those two women, admiring the beauty of the mother who was a superb thirty-six.
The sweet modesty and grace of the daughter, only then entering her sixteenth year. Ah, Saint Fawn, your fell, accursed lust has much to do with these ministerial proceedings. That is but too certain. And in this, as in everything else you do, are you not guided far more by your vices than by the interests of your country? I would be hard-pressed to give an adequate description of the moans and tears those two wretches let forth when they beheld themselves dragged infamously off to thee. Dungeons readied for them, but no more moved by the weeping and wailing of the mother and daughter than I had been by the entreaties of the father. I was concerned only to take the greatest precautions for their safekeeping, and was not at ease until I had these important prisoners behind the stoutest bars, and all the keys in my pocket. Meditating upon what the fate of these individuals might be, I did not imagine that it would involve more than detention, inasmuch as executions were my affair and I had received no instructions to slay while I was in the middle of pondering these matters. The arrival of a fourth personage was announced to me. Heavens, what is my surprise upon recognizing the selfsame young man who, you will recall, the first time I held conversation with St. Fond, at the latter's bidding struck me three blows of a cane upon the shoulders. He, too, came bearing a letter. I opened it at once. Greet this man warmly, and entertain him well. I read you must surely remember him. For you carried his marks a while, and they were his hands that gripped you at our first voluptuous rencounter in your house. He is to take the leading role in the drama that will be staged tomorrow in him. Welcome the Executioner of Nantes who upon my orders has come to put to death thee. Three persons now, your prisoners, obliged under pain of losing my post, to produce these three heads the day after tomorrow before the queen. I would myself needless to say wield the axe, had not her majesty expressed the very keenest desire to receive the spoils out of none other than the hands of a public executioner. It is for that reason the latter, arriving in Paris, found his services not immediately required there, and has been dispatched post-haste to your residence, whither he comes in ignorance of the business he it is to attend to. You may instruct him now, but refrain absolutely from permitting him a glimpse of his prey. This is essential, expect me tomorrow morning. Meanwhile, treat the prisoners, and the women especially, very rigorously bred only, a little water and no daylight. Sir, said I, Turning to the most recent of my visitors, the minister mentions in his letter that we, you and I, are not unknown to each other. Tis true. Once upon a time, you. I, madame. Orders, alas, are orders. Indeed they are, and I harbor no grudge against you. I went on, giving him my hand, which he kissed with ardor. But it is dinner time. First to table well discuss afterward. Delcour was twenty-eight, a very pretty fellow. His air and calling pleased me mightily. I showered attentions upon him, and they were quite sincere when we finished dinner. I mounted as skillful an attack as ever you've seen. Delcour soon exhibited evidence of the success of my advances. There was a wonderful bulge in his breeches I was overpowered. For God's sake, my love, said I, have it out. I fain must see what you're hiding there. That magnificent prick has me all a flutter. Your profession sets my brain a whirl you've absolutely got to f me. He promptly fetches that marvelous device into view, and pursuant to my custom when dealing with a man, I catch hold of it with the intention of mouthing it to the balls, but that was a grandly proportioned tool, I tell you, and it was all I could do to accommodate half its length. As soon as he was lodged, Delcour got his hands on my cunt, buried his face in it, and two seconds later, we discharged in concert. Seeing me swallow his f- That handsome young man leapt excitedly upon me. Ah, by Jesus, said he. I was in too great a hurry, but ill make amends for my mistake. The rascal's stave was still holding true. He stretches me out upon a broad couch, fastens his lips to mine, which are yet sticky with his sperm and incunts me as only rarely you will be incunted by a still-leaking prick in all my life. I did never been so stoutly fought. Delcor cut and thrust for three quarters of an hour and more. Out of prudence he retreated on sensing another discharge, 
impending, but when. At last, my cunt's grip triumphed. He loosed a second dose of thick fu- And this too I swallowed with as much delight as I had the first. Delcour, said I, once I had resumed possession of my wits and could essay a rational analysis of my late behavior, you have been somewhat surprised. I fancy by the informal reception I have given you such frivolous conduct, such speedy advancasi venture to suppose you consider me a loose woman, nay a thorough whore. Despite my supreme disdain for that which fools call reputation, I would have you understand that your good fortune is owing far less to my coquetry or to anything physical in me than to my mentality. I have an exceptionally odd one. You kill by trade, you are a murderer, a handsome one besides. One such prick as you boast isn't come by every day. But your profession, it is that I wish to stress thanks alone to it. I flung myself into your arms, scorn me. Detest me. I don't give a damn. You f me, I've got all I wanted. Heavenly creature, Delcor replied. It isn't scorn I feel for you. No. Nor shall it be hatred. You inspire altogether different sentiments in me. You deserve to be worshipped, and worship you I shall. Regretting that your ecstasy had its origin solely in that which earns me the loathing of others. Tis of no importance. That, said I, a mere matter of opinion. And opinion varies, as you observe, since the source of my fondness for you is precisely this. Very thing which puts you at a remove from the rest of mankind, however. This is but debauchery on my part. You shouldn't interpret it as anything else. My attachment to the minister, my manner of living with him, bar me from intrigues, and ill certainly never contemplate any. Well, make the most of this evening, of the whole night, if you like, and there's an end to it. Ah, madame, the young man said with respectfulness, of you... I ask only your protection and your gracious kindness. You shall never want for either, but in return you must comply with all that results from my imagination. I must warn you, it is subject to all sorts of disorders, and they sometimes lead far. Delcour had gone back to fondling my breasts with one hand and frigging my clit the other, now and again darting his tongue down my gullet. After a few minutes of this I bade him refrain from wearying himself unduly, and to give truthful answers to certain questions I wished to pose him. Tell me, to begin with, just why St. Fond had you strike me upon the shoulder that first time I saw you? It puzzled me then, and still does. Libertinage, madame. Sheer libertinage. You know the minister. He has his quirks. He has you take part in luxurious scenes, then? Whenever I am in Paris, he has fucked you. He has, madame. And you've a him back? Most certainly. You have beaten him. Flogged him. Frequently. Sweet Jesus f How that excites Mefrig, Delcour. Frig away and has he had you beat and flog other women? Upon several occasions. Have you ever gone farther? Allow me to respect the minister's secrets, madame. In this connection, your guesses are very apt to be correct, since they would be based on a good acquaintance of his lordship. Can you say whether he has at any time formulated projects against me? Madame, toward you his attitude has always been, to my knowledge, one of affection and trust he is greatly attached to you. You may take my word for it. And so am I to him. I adore him. I hope he is fully aware of it. However, since you would not have me tempt you to indiscretion, well, talk of other things. Tell me, if you please, how are you able to take the life of some individual who has never wronged you in any way? How is it that from the depths of your soul, pity does not speak out in behalf of the poor wretches, the law enjoins you to assassinate in cold blood? Be very certain, Madame, was Delcour's answer, that in my calling none of us attains this degree of all. Rationalized and scientific ferocity, save through principles, that are largely unknown to folk in general. How so? Principles? I would have you tell me about them. They are rooted in a soil of total inhumanity. Our training begins early. 
From childhood on why, we are taught a system of values, wherein human life is nothing, and the law everything the result is that it gives us no more bother to cut the throats of our fellows than it does a butcher to cut the throat of a calf. Does the butcher have qualms? He doesn't know what they are. Neither do we. But carrying out the law is your work. Do you proceed in the same way when it is a question of pleasure? Certainly, madame. Could it be otherwise? Should it be? The prejudice once overcome in us, we cease to behold any evil in murder. Must one not necessarily esteem it an evil to destroy one's fellow beings? Madame, I might rather ask you how one can possibly impute any such thing to an act of destruction. If destruction of all human beings were not one of the fundamental laws of nature, then, yes, I should be able to believe that you outrage this unintelligible nature when you destroy but in view of the fact there does not exist a single natural process which does not prove that destruction is a necessary element to the natural order and that nature creates only by dint of destroying it is most obvious that whoever destroys acts in tune with nature it is no less obvious that whoever refuses to destroy offends nature very grievously for and of this there can be no doubt it is only by destroying we furnish nature the means for creating. And hence the more we destroy, the nicer the accord between ourselves and her workings if murder is basic to nature's regenerative operations. Certainly the murderer is the man who serves nature best and this truth grasped. We are moved to declare that the more numerous his murders, the better he fulfills his obligations toward a nature whose sole need is of murders. Nine. Such doctrines contain their element of peril. They are nonetheless true, madame. More learned thinkers would be able to develop them much further than can I. But you will find that the point of departure of their arguments is constantly the same. My friend, I said to Dalcour, you have already given me much food for thought. A single idea cast into a brain like mine produces the effect there of a spark upon salt petteries, I sense it. We have similar minds. We have three victims here. To sacrifice them is why you are sent to this chateau. It will, believe me, give me great pleasure to behold you in action. But my dear, you must possess a vast store of information and experience. Be so kind as to dilate upon the mechanics of the thing. Am I correct in believing that it is only with the aid of libertinage you succeed in vanquishing unnatural prejudice? For you just gave me clear proof that nature is much sooner served than outraged by murder. What do you wish to ask, madame? This if it is not very certain, as I have heard say, that only by transforming the whole affair into one of libertinage are you able to perform and enjoy the murders your trade obliges you to commit in fine. I ask you if tis not so, that the act of executing infallibly puts your prick erect? It is no longer contested, madame, that libertinage leads logically to murder, and all the world knows that the pleasure-worn individual must regain his strength in this manner of committing what fools are disposed to denominate a crime we subject some person or other to the maximum agitation. Its repercussion upon our nerves is the most potent stimulant imaginable, and to us are restored all the energies we have previously spent in excess. Murder thus qualifies as the most delicious of libertinage's vehicles, and as the surest, but it is not true that in order to commit murder, one has got to be mentally in a libertine furor. By way of proof, I cite to you the extreme calm wherewith the majority of my colleagues dispatch their business. They experience emotion. Yes, but it is quite as different from the passion animating the libertine as this latter, is from the passion in him who murders out of ambition, or out of vengeance, or out of greed, or, again, out of sheer cruelty. Which is simply to indicate that there are several classes of murder, the libertine variety being but one, however. This does not prevent us from concluding that none of these sorts of murder outrages nature, and that it is in far greater conformance to her laws than in violation thereof. All you say is just, Delcor. But I maintain nonetheless that, precisely in the interest of these very murders, it would be desirable were their perpetrator to be inspired by lust alone. For that passion is never followed by remorseful aftermaths. 
one's recollections of it are of joy and joyous, whereas with the others, once their fire has gone out, one is often devoured by regrets. Above all, if one happens to be something less than a veteran philosopher. And therefore it seems to me there is much to be said in favor of never murdering, save through libertinage. One would be free to kill for whatever the motive, but the error would always be there as a safeguard, and the better to consolidate the action, so as to avoid being troubled by serious remorse later on. In that case, said Delcour, you consider that every passion can be increased or nourished by lust. Lust is to the passions what the nervous fluid is to life it sustains them all. It supplies strength to them all. And the proof thereof is that a man who, as they say, hasn't any balls will never have any passions. And so you suppose that ambition, cruelty, greed, vindictiveness as motivations lead to the same thing as lust. Yes. I am convinced that all these passions cause erections, and that a lively and properly organized mind will be as readily inflamed by any of them as by lust. Mark you, I am speaking now from personal experience. The effect of concentrating upon mental images characterized by ambition, cruelty, avarice, revenge has been that of a thorough frigging. And each of these ideas has more than once made me discharge myself dry. I have not entertained the thought of a single crime, whatever the passion inspiring it, without feeling the subtle heat of lust circulate in my veins falsehood. Impiety, calumny, rascality, hard-heartedness, even gluttony have wrought those effects in me, and in a word, there is not one form or mode of mode. Viciousness which has failed to ignite my lust, or if you prefer, the torch of lust has at one time or another made all the vices in me blaze up with its sacred fire, to them all communicating that voluptuous sensation which, it appears, is never kindled otherwise in us curiously organized persons. There, numbed, that is my opinion. And it is mine also, madame, Delcour rejoined. He'll not attempt to conceal it any longer. I rejoice at your frankness, my dear. It helps me to know you. And from what I know of you already, I venture to say, and would be greatly surprised if I was in error here, that you require to enter into a libertine furor when you perform your official murders, which enables you to reap far more voluptuous satisfaction from your functions than is granted your colleagues who carry them out mechanically. Madame, I must own that you have fairly found me out. Scoundrel, I said, smiling and taking hold of this young man's tool, which I began to exercise so as to restore some of its energy. Oh, deep deed libertine that you are. Why not go on to say that your prick hardens for the sake of the enjoyment to be had from my existence today, and tomorrow depriving me of it would make you discharge? The young man was visibly embarrassed at this last question. I gazed at him for a moment, then came to his rescue. There, there, my friend, I have absolutely no quarrel with your principles. I must forgive you their results, instead of disputing about those results. Let's profit from them. At this point, I grew very hot indeed. Come now, look alive. We must try some extraordinary tricks. What would you have me do? Beat me. Outrage me. Lash me isn't that what you do with women every day aren't those the foul violences which, electrifying you, make you capable of the rest? Well, mm. answer. Ta, tis true. Of course. Well, you vey a job to perform tomorrow. Start preparing for it today. There is my body. It is at your disposal. And Delcor, following my instructions, having started in with a dozen slaps and kicks in the behind, took up a bundle of withes and slashed away at my ass for fifteen minutes or so, while one of my women cunt-sucked me. Delcor, I cried, O oh, divine destroyer of the human race, you whom I adore, and from whom I expect unheard of joys, lay on, lay on, I say, whip yours harder, faster, Imprint the marks of your savagery upon her, for she yearns to wear them. I discharge at the idea of my blood wetting your fingers. Shed it liberally, my love. It flowed. 
Oh, my friends. I was in ecstasies words cannot express the wild emotion that was cindering me without a brain. Like mine, there is no conceiving such a thing. Unless one has brains like yours, it is not to be comprehended. Unlimited were the quantities of fu- I loosed into the mouth of my fracatrice. Never in my life had I been in the throes of such disorder, such torment, such rapture. Delcour, Delcour, I went on. There is one last homage you must render me. Husband your resources for the purpose. This ass Juve just hacked to ribbons beckons you. Invites you to soothe, to console it. At Cythera Venus had more than one temple. You know come ope the most arcane. Come bugger me, Delcour. Make haste, for we must leave no delight untasted, no horror uncommitted. Great God, said Delcour, in transports. I didn't dare propose it to you, but behold how your desires inflame mine. And indeed, my f exhibited a prick harder, longer than any I.D. clapped eyes on hitherto. Beloved libertine, said I, are you then fond of ass? Ah, madame, is there anything that affords comparable pleasure? "'Tis all too plain, my dear,' said I. "'When you accustom yourself to defying one of the laws of nature, "'you do not take authentic pleasure any more "'except in transgressing them all, one after the other. "'And Delcour, master of the altar I abandoned to him entirely, "'covered it, though twas drenched in blood with the tenderest caresses. "'His tongue thrilled in the hole, my temperature soared, the s operating upon me frontwardly set my c a fire. Puck! Gushed out of me afresh. I was dry. I could bear no more, but I was not by any means easy. I suddenly lost all interest in Delcour, then all patience with him. Great had been my desire for the man. Great was my abhorrence for him now. And there's the effect of irregular desires, the greater the height they arouse us to, the greater the emptiness we feel afterward. From this Cretans derive proof of God's existence, whereas for my part, I find here only the most certain proofs in support of a materialistic attitude. The more you cheapen your existence, the less ill be inclined to believe it is the handiwork of a deity. Delcour sent off to his bedchamber. I retired for the night with my le hireling. St. Fon put in his appearance the next day around noon. He dismissed his servants and his coach and came directly into the salon to greet me we embraced. Uncertain what his reaction would be to the little prank I had played with Delcour, but anxious lest he hear the story from someone else, I told him everything. Juliet, he said when I had concluded, had I not assured you long ago that I would take the most indulgent view of your aberrations, L would scold you now. We can ignore the f- Tis natural to f- Your one mistake was in your choice of a partner. Are you so sure you can rely upon Delcour's discretion? I am glad, however, that you have made his acquaintance for two years. He was my bardash when he was fourteen. And fifteen. He is from Nantes, where his father was hangman, a fact which stimulated my interest in the boy I took his maidenhead. And when I was weary toying with his ass, I turned him over to the Paris executioner, whose aid he remained up until the time his father died. He inherited his post at Nantes. The lad is not without intelligence. He is excessively libertine, and as I just hinted, he isn't the sort who merits overmuch trust. But let me tell you something about the captives we are going to put to death. Of all the men in France, Monsieur de Clory has probably contributed most to my advancement. The year I was preferred to the ministry, he, though very young at the time, was sleeping with the Duchesse de G, whose power at court was immense and owing primarily to the maneuvering and intrigues of the two of them, I obtained from the king the position I still hold. As of that moment I contracted an insuperable loathing for Chloris. I would go to any lengths to avoid encountering him. I dreaded the sight of him. I hated him so long as his protectress was. Alive I postponed taking action, but she has just passed away. Or, perhaps... I have just put her out of the way. This brought Chloris to the top of my black list. He married my cousin German. What, my lord? This woman is your cousin? She is Juliet, and the fact has contributed not a little to her doom. I had designs upon that woman. She always resisted my desires. 
Little by little they shifted to her daughter here. I met with yet more stubborn resistance, with the result that my rage and my extreme desire to see the whole family gone to blazes reached the decisive pitch. To promote its undoing, I resorted to every known kind of cunning, baseness, lie, and calumny, and I have finally so aroused the queen's antipathies to the father and daughter. By giving her to understand that Chloris once sold his child to the king, that at our last interview her majesty, much wrought up, commanded me to arrange their deaths. She adamantly insists upon having their heads by tomorrow. My recompense has been fixed at three million apiece. I shall obey the queen's orders, and very joyfully, you may be sure, and very pleasurable will be the episodes wherewith I plan to accompany my revenge. My lord, tis this a dreadful complication of crimes. It puts my brain into an indescribable whirl. It affects mine likewise, my angel. And I arrive here with the most execrable intentions. I've not discharged for a week. No one is more adept than I in the art of wetting the passions through abstinence and having a good time the while. Over the past seven days, I've probably been f two hundred shots and had intimately to do with somewhere between a hundred and seven score individuals of both sexes. But during this interval, not a drop of f have I yielded. From thus playing coy with nature, I have achieved a pent-up state that bodes very ill for the persons upon whom the storm is due to break. Have you given orders that we be left alone, and that nobody, saving only those who are necessary to the scene, be under any circumstances admitted to the house? Yes, my lord. And I have added that anybody who ventures to intrude shall be hanged on the spot. A squadron of troopers is. Lying it so to lend me assistance in case of need never has stage, been more impeccably set for a crime. We shall, the two of us, be able to relish the pleasure of committing it under ideal conditions and in absolute security. Ah, you see into what state whatever you say puts me. In truth, I believe you are discharging. And you, whereupon, in search of proof positive of a crisis which I was indeed undergoing, the rake lifts my skirt above my navel, ferrets briefly about in my cunt. Then he examines his fingers and finds them slimed with damning evidence of my lewd agitation. You know, the minister confesses, I adore discovering such symptoms in you, for they roundly attest the similarity of our ways of thinking. But hold, I must bib at the tap I've set to flowing, and gluing his mouth to my cunt, the villain drank thereat a good quarter of an hour, then rolled me over. Ah, said he, there's what I like to kiss most of all the peerless hole. Eh, hey, rascal, it's been travelled recently, has it no? You've a been but of late, tis very plain to be seen. All the while he went on cooing and kissing about my vent, and the area environing now he has his breeches off, shows me his own ass, and I fall to licking it. You manage that wonderfully well, you little minx, says he. I do declare, I think you love my ass. Here is my prick. It's starting to stand. Suck it a bit, and suggest a few extravagances if you can the hour of Venus should be rung in by the bells of folly. The weather is warm, I said. I recommend that you adopt savage attire. Leaving your arms, thighs, and prick bare your headdress ought to resemble a dragon or serpent in the Patagonian manner. You'll smear red grease paint all over your face. Well, fit you with mustaches. You'll wear a baldric, girding on all the instruments required for. The tortures you plan to inflict upon your victims, this costume will terrify them for a certainty. And it is terror one should inspire when one wishes to wallow in crime. You are right, Juliet. You are quite right. He'll ask you to rig me out in that way. Apparel and gear are imperative. Tell me if in the courts of law, our precious buffoons, the judges, don't resemble heroes out of comedy or charlatans. My sole objection to the magistracy nowadays is that it is composed of men sorely lacking in sanguinary temper. And if these are such unruly times, we may lay it up to that. Rest assured, Juliet, better not even to try her hand at governing men, 
unless you are willing to immerse it in their blood. Dinner was announced. We repaired to table and pursued our conversation in the same tone. Yes, by all means. The minister proceeded. The laws must be made. More severe the only happily governed countries are those where the Inquisition reigns. They alone are really under their sovereigns control the purpose of sacerdotal chains, and the need for them is to reinforce political ones. The might of the scepter depends on that of the censor. It is hugely in the interest of both authorities, lay and clerical, to stay each other mutually, and only by breaking that common front will the people ever achieve their liberation. Nothing so effectively cows a nation as religious fears, nothing better than that it dread hell's eternal fires if it revolts against its overlord, and that's why the crowned heads of Europe are always in such admirable intelligence with Rome. We other great ones of this world do indeed despise and defy the fabulous thunderbolts of a contemptible Vatican. But we are well advised to keep our slaves in terror of them once again. Tis there the sole means to keep them under the yoke. Steeped in Machiavelli, I would want the disparity between the king and the mob to be no less considerable than that between a heavenly body and a cockroach, a mere gesture on the part of the monarch. And his throne would become an island in a very sea of blood, the held as a god on earth. His subjects would only dare crawl into his presence on their hands and knees. Who is fool enough even to compare the physical constitution? Yes, the mere physical constitution of a king with that of a commoner. I am willing to believe that nature gave them the same needs the lion and the earthworm have the same needs also. But does this create a resemblance between them? Oh, Juliet, do not forget that if kings are beginning to lose their credit in Europe, it's the vulgarity they'd become attainted with that has been t Their downfall had they remain aloof and invisible like the sovereigns of Asia. The whole world would yet tremble at the sound of their names. Contempt is bred of familiarity, and familiarity from what is daily within public view. The Romans must surely have stood in greater awe of Tiberius off on Capri than of a Titus wandering around the city, consoling the poor. But this despotism, I said to St. Fond, you favor it because you are so powerful. Do you suppose, however, that it is equally pleasing to the weak? It pleases everybody, Juliet, St. Fond replied. Mankind tends universally in that direction. To be despotic is the primary desire inspired in us by a nature whose law could not be more unlike the ludicrous one usually ascribed to her. The substance of which is not to do unto others that which unto ourselves we would not have done from fear of reprisals. They should have added, for very certain, it is that only weaklings, dreading to for tat, could have contrived this homily, and they must have been desperate, as well as insolent rogues to dare to fob it off as a natural law. I affirm that the fundamental profoundest and keenest penchant in man, is incontestably to enchain his fellow creatures, and to tyrannize them with all his might. The suckling babe that bites his nurse's nipple, the infant constantly smashing his rattle, reveal to us that a bent for destruction, cruelty, and oppression is the first which nature graves in our hearts, and that we surrender to it more or less violently according to the amount of sensibility we are endowed with from the outset. I therefore hold it self-evident that all the pleasures which ornament the life of a man, all the delights he is able to savor, all that makes for the extreme delectation of his passions, are essentially located in his despotic usage of his brethren. The sequestration in voluptuous Asia of the object's accessory to pleasure taking demonstrates to us, does it not, that lust gains with oppression and tyranny, and that the passions are more strongly fired by whatever is obtained through force than by anything granted voluntarily. When it is logically established that the degree of violence characterizing the action committed is the one factor for measuring the amount of happiness of the active person and this because where... The violence is greater, the shock upon the nervous system will be sharper as soon. I say, as that is proven, the greatest possible dose of happiness will necessarily consist in the greatest of... The effects of despotism and tyranny 
whence it will emerge that the harshest, the most ferocious, the most traitorous and the wickedest man will be the happiest man, and that stands to reason. For as Norsey has often told you, happiness lies neither in vice nor in virtue, but in the manner we appreciate the one and the other, and the choice we make pursuant to our individual organization. It isn't in the meal set before me, my appetite lies. My need is nowhere but in me. And two people may be very differently affected by the same fare it makes his mouth water, who is hungry. Excites repugnance in him who has just eaten his fill, however, as tis certain there must be some difference between the vibrations received, and that vice must procure much more intense ones in the individual with the vicious bent than virtue can give to the person whose organs are structured for its reception that, although Vespasian had a good soul and Nero an evil, Despite the fact both were sensitive, there was a great difference in the temper of those souls as regards the species of sensibility constituting. Them for Nerus was without doubt endowed with a faculty of sensation far superior to Vespasian's tis certain, I say. That of the two? Nero was the happier man by far why? Because that which affects more intensely will always produce the happier effect in man, and because a vigorous person— owing to his very vigor so structured as to be a better recipient of vicious than of virtuous impressions, will sooner discover felicity than a mild and peaceable individual, whose feeble complexion will deny him all possibilities other than the abject. Hangdog will be gone practice of the formulas of humdrum good behavior, and what the devil would the merit be in virtue if vice weren't preferable to it? Thus, I tell you, Vespasian and Nero were as happy as they were able to be. But Nero must have been much more so, because his pleasures were incomparably livelier and keener while Vespasian, in giving a name to some beggar simply because, as he himself said, the poor have got to live, was stirred in an infinitely less intense manner than Nero, a liar in his hand, watching Rome burn from atop the tower of Antonia. Ah, somebody will say, but deification was the reward of the one, disparagement and hate, that of the other. As you wish, however, it is not the effect their souls had upon others I am interested in. I am simply evaluating the inward sensation which the different penchants native to each must have made each experience, and discriminating between the vibrations each was capable of feeling. Thus, I am able to affirm that the happiest man on earth will inevitably be he who is addicted to the most infamous, the most revolting, the most criminal habits, and who exercises them the most frequently who, every day, doubles their force, triples their scope. The most outstanding service one could do to some young person, I observed after hearing the speech, would then be to pluck out of him all the weeds of virtue nature or education might have sown in his soul. That is exact. Snatch them out and, if possible, stifle them while they are yet in seed, St. Fond answered. For even supposing the individual in whom you annihilate these virtuous possibilities were to maintain he finds happiness in virtue, you, perfectly certain, you will cause him to find. Far greater happiness in vice ought never to hesitate to blot out the one in order to permit the other to waken. "'Tis a real and capital service, Hal, thank you, for sooner or later. And that is why, very different from my predecessor, I authorize the publication and sale of all libertine books and immoral works, for I esteem them most essential to human felicity and welfare, instrumental to the progress of philosophy, indispensable to the eradication of prejudices, and in every sense conducive to the increase of human knowledge and understanding. Any author courageous enough to tell the truth fearlessly shall have my patronage and support I shall subsidize his ideas. I shall see to their dissemination such men are rare. The state has great need of them, and their labors cannot be too heartily encouraged. But, I inquired, how does this sit with the severity you favor in government, with the inquisition you would establish? As nicely as you please, St. Fond replied. It is to keep the people in their place I urge severity. And if I so often imagine the autos de fe of Lisbon transferred to Paris, 
It is in the interests of subordination. My knife will never be drawn against the upper classes, the elite in substance or mine. But must not these writings, if generally read, pose a threat to those very persons you seem to wish to keep out of harm's way? Impossible, declared the minister. If these texts quicken in the weak the desire to break their bonds and mind you, lest they have that desire I cannot forge bonds at all. The strong, for their part, will find instruction therein upon how to load further and heavier chains upon the captive masses. In short, the slave will perhaps accomplish in a decade what the master will have accomplished in a night. You are widely accused, I now ventured to remark, of persistent condescension in everything that touches the growing depravity of manners nowadays never, so it is said, were they so corrupt as since you entered into office. Perhaps, though we still have an enormous task to achieve before they are as I.D., like to see them, and at the present. Time I am working upon some new police regulations which, I hope, will help matters along in the proper direction. I do not believe it is a secret. At any rate, it is a fact whereof you cannot afford not to be fully aware. Juliet, a vital chapter in the policy followed by all. Those at the head of any government is to foment and promote the extremest degree of corruption in the citizenry, so long as the subject wastes away body and soul. In the delights of gangrenous and feebling debauchery, he does not feel the weight of his irons, and you can heap fresh ones upon him without his even noticing. The true essence of statecraft is thus to multiply a hundredfold every possible means to debilitate and pervert the people. Lots of shows, much pomp and display, cabarets, brothels without number, a general amnesty for all crimes committed in debauchery. Those are the expedients for bringing the plebeians to heel. O oh, you who ambition to rule over them, beware of virtue within the frontiers of your empire. Only let virtue reign and your peoples will open their eyes. And your thrones, reposing as they do upon nothing but vice, will be very speedily overthrown. The free man's awakening will be cruel for the despots. And the day he ceases to fritter his leisure away in vice's hell, start to strive for domination like yourselves. And what are your proposed regulations? I asked. It's by means of fashion. I aim to mold public opinion. At first you know how the French are influenced by the latest in vogue. When I am launching a new style in masculine and feminine dress, which leaves all the lust-inspiring parts, and the ass especially, exposed in their virtual entirety. True, there will be spectacles after the model of the floral games they used to hold. In glorious Rome, at them lads and lasses will dance naked. Three, instead of morality and religion, which will be stricken from the curriculum, the pure and unadulterated principles of nature will be taught in the public schools every child of either sex who has reached the age of fifteen without having been able to get a lover will be very sharply reprimanded, penalized, held up to public scorn and dishonor, and declared if a girl forever ineligible for marriage, for holding any office, if a boy in default of a lover, the boy or girl will be obliged to present a certificate proving pr and non-possession of virginity in any shape or place. For Christianity will be rigorously banished out of the land, none but libertine rites and feasts will ever be celebrated in France. It'll be rid of Christianity, I say, but not of religion. This I intend to retain, for its chains are useful to the preservation of order, as I proved to you a moment ago. The object of worship doesn't matter in the slightest. The thing that counts is clergy. But I'd rather see the dagger of superstition wielded by the priests of Venus than by the admirers of Mary. 5. The common herd will be kept in a state of subservience, of prostrate bondage, which will render them powerless even to strike for, let alone to attain to domination, or to encroach upon or debase the prerogatives of the rich. Tied to the glebe as in olden days, the people will be held like any other property, and like it, will be subject to all the various mutations of value and ownership. Only the people will be liable to punishment at the hands of the law, and it will be inflicted for the most trifling offenses. The commoner's proprietor will have the right of life, 
or death over him and his family, and neither his complaints nor his recriminations will ever receive hearing. Never will free schools be available to him tilling the soil does not require knowledge. The blindfold of ignorance is made for the peasant's eyes. Showing him the light is always a risky business. The first individual, regardless of his class, who were to think to stir up the people or to invite them to break their chains, will be thrown to wild beasts and eaten alive. Six in every town and city of the land, there shall be opened public houses containing specimens of both sexes, the number of these houses to be proportional to the population of the district or agglomeration, there being at least one male and one female establishment per every thousand inhabitants, the dial, personnel of each shall be three hundred individuals, who will begin their internment at the age of twelve, and not retire from service before twenty-five. These establishments will be subsidized by the government. Only members of the free class will have the right of entrance, and they will of course be empowered to do in these places whatever they please. 7. Everything denominated crime of libertinage at present. To wit murder and debauch, incest, rape, sodomy, adultery, etc., will be reprehensible only if committed by a member of the slave castes. Eight prizes shall be awarded to the most celebrated courtesans in the body houses, likewise to the young boys there who have got themselves a name in the art of pleasing. Similarly, bonuses and stipends shall be granted to each inventor of a new lubricity, to every author of cynical books, to all libertines recognized as professed in their order. 9. The slave class shall exist as did the helots in ancient Lacedaemon. There being no difference whatsoever between the human slave and the brute beast, why should you punish the murderer of the one more than the murderer of the other? My lord, I put in. This last, it seems to me, deserves some slight explaining. I would like to have you prove to me there is no real distinction to be drawn between the human slave and an animal. Glance at the works of nature, this philosopher answered me, and judge for yourself whether she has not informing the two classes of men, made them vastly unalike, I ask you to put aside partiality, and to decide have they the same voice, the same skin, the same limbs, the same gait, the same tastes. Have they, I venture to inquire, have they the same needs? It will be to no purpose if someone attempts to persuade me that circumstances or education have made for these for these. Differences and that the slave and the master, in a state of nature, as infants, will be indistinguishable. I deny the fact, and it is after having pondered the matter, and sifted much personal observation, after having examined the findings of clever anatomists, that I affirm there is no similarity between the conformations of these several infants. Abandon them both to themselves, and you'll observe that the child of the first class manifests tastes and aims, most unlike those the child of knows. The second class demonstrates, and you will perceive the most striking dissimilarity between the sentiments and dispositions proper to each. Now, perform the same study upon the animal resembling man the closest. A pawn, for example. The chimpanzee let me, I say, compare this animal to some representative of the slave caste. What a host of similarities I find. The man of the people is simply the species that stands next above the chimpanzee on the ladder, and the distance separating them is, if anything, less than that between him and the individual belonging to the superior caste. And why should nature, who so assiduously observes these gradations in all her works, have neglected them here? Are all plants alike? No. Are all animals the same in aspect and strength? No. Dare you compare a shrub to the majestic poplar, a pug dog to the proud Great Dane, the Corsican mountain pony to the spirited Andalusian stallion? So many essential differences within the same overall categories, and why do you object to the same differences existing among men? You should certainly never lump Voltaire and Freyron in the same class, any more than you would the virile Prussian grenadier and the debilitated Hottentot. Therefore, Juliet, Cease to doubt these inequalities and, admitting their existence, 
let's not hesitate to take full advantage of them. And to persuade ourselves that if it so suited nature to have us born into the upper of these two human classes, we have but to extract profit and pleasure from our situation by worsening that of our inferiors, and despotically to press them into the service of all our passions and our every need. Kiss me, my beloved, I cried, throwing myself into the arms of a man whose principles I simply could not resist to me. You are as a god. Tis at your feet I want to pass my life. Apropos, remarked the minister, getting up from the table and leading me to the couch in the salon. I forgot to tell you that the king is fonder of me than ever. I've just had new proof of his attachment. From somewhere he got the idea I'm burdened by heavy debts, and has given me two million to straighten out my affairs. Tis only just that you share in my good fortune, Juliet. I am turning half the gift over to you. Continue to approve my tenets and to serve me well. It'll raise you so high in the world. You'll have no more trouble believing in your superiority over others. You cannot imagine the joy I derive in uh, advancing you to atop the very pinnacle and making you a preeminence conditional upon profound humility and unbounded obedience toward me alone. I wish you to be the idol of others and, at the same time, my slave, the mere thought heats my prick. Juliet, well perform horrors this day. Shan't we, my angel? Horrors? Atrocities? And he pressed his lips to mine, the while toying with my cunt. Oh, my love, how delicious are our crimes when impunity veils them, when duty itself prescribes them. How divine it is to swim in gold. And as one reckons up one's wealth, to be able to say, here are the means to every black deed, to every pleasure with this. All my wishes can be made to come true. All my fancies can be satisfied. No woman will resist me. None of my desires will fail of realization. My wealth will procure amendments in the law itself, and it'll be despot without let or hindrance. I kiss St. Fond a thousand times over, and, profiting from the enthusiasm, the drunkenness he was carried away by, and above all from his predisposition to me, I had him sign a letter de cachet written out for the arrest of Elvira's father, who wished to deprive me of her, and wheedled two or three other favors out of him, each of which was worth about five hundred thousand francs to me. And the fumes of the excellent dinner I had just provided him rising to his head, he announced he was sleepy and would retire. For a little, he departed to his chamber, and I looked to the completion of the arrangements for the evening's entertainments. St. Fond woke toward five that afternoon, by then everything stood ready in the salon, and this is the way the scene and the actors were disposed nude and simply decked in garlands of roses. There were, on the right, the three maids intended for the orgy's ID grouped them like Botticellus graces. All three were girls of condition spirited out of a convent at Melon, and their beauty was startling. Louise was the name of the first she was sixteen. Fair-haired? and never was a more interesting face beheld. The second was named Helen, fifteen years old, slender in the waist, slight of build and tall for her age, long brown tresses, love's own eyes and mouth beautiful though she was. Most would have admitted her to be surpassed by Fulvy, ravishing and also sixteen. In the center, to offer a contrast to this group, I had stationed the ill-starred family, Likewise naked and festooned with black crepe, the father and the mother were watching each other in expectation of the worst. At their feet lay the charming Julie heavy irons rubbed their bare skin raw. The nail on Julie's left breast peeped through a link, which had bruised it, and it bled softly. Another length of chain was visible between the thighs of Madame de Chloris, and was pinching the lips of her womb, Delcor whom I had outfitted in the terrifying garb of a demon. Out of hell and armed with the sword he was to use upon his victims, held the end of the chain which ever and again he would tug, with dreadful effect wherever it touched flesh. Next, in the pose of Calipigian Venus, their backs to Saint Fond, draped in a simple brown and white gauze, which left their asses very distinctly in sight, were my four women. The first was twenty-two. Superb a veritable Minerva, magnificently formed. Her name was Delie. The name of the second was Montom Twenty, in full bloom, 
as nicely fleshed as woman can be. Palmyre was nineteen. She was blonde, and had the romantic countenance of those girls you always like to see in tears. Seventeen years old, Blazine had a mischievous look, faultless teeth, the sauciest eyes that ever fired desire. And at the far left of this semicircle were placed two strapping lads, five feet and ten inches in height. Awesomely membered, they were standing face to face, and while frigging each other were exchanging passionate kisses. They were naked. Charming, said St. Font upon opening his eyes. Heavenly. No possible mistake, all this attests the mind and art of Juliet. Have the guilty ones brought hither, he continued, directing me to take a seat beside him. Montelmay to come and suck his engine. Palmyra to place her ass within his reach. Delcour marched the family forward. You are all free under accusation of enormous crimes, the minister began, and from the queen I have express orders to put you promptly to death. Their unjust orders, Chloris replied. My family and I are innocentists. You know full well, you wretch. At this point, St. Fond was prey to a pleasurable emotion so puissant he was scarce able to fight off a discharge. Yes, you know perfectly well that we are innocent. But if we are under suspicion, then let us be put on fair trial, but not exposed this way to the tigerish lust of one who sports with us only to quicken his ignoble passions. If you please, Delcor, said the minister, a taste of the chain. And the executioner gave it a jerk, so sudden, so violent, that the cut of Madame de Chloris, the breast of her daughter, one of her husband's thighs were cut into. Blood spurted on the iron. Then St. Fon said, You allude to the law. You have broken the law. You have violated it too grievously to invoke its protection. Its full severity is all you have a right to expect now. Ready yourselves to die. You, was Chloris' proud answer. You are the hireling of a tyrant and the creature of a whore. Posterity will judge me. Here St. Fon rises in fury, his prick is prettily grown, he beckons to me. Come. Going close to the well-chained insolent, the minister slaps him with all his might several times. Insults him, spits in his face, and, frigging his weapon on Julie's teats, defies her father, you are ill-used. Call not on the opinion of later times, but take matters into your own hands now. Are you a man? Then exert yourself a little. Howard, were I to get free, you'd run off in a panic. You're quite right. But you are not going to get free. I have you in my power. I enjoy the situation. Would you deprive me of enjoyment? Try. Everything you have, you owe to me. You have only yourself to blame for that, the minister said, and took hold of his benefactor's prick. Massaged it then bade me endeavor to bring it to life. But my efforts were fruitless also seeing this, he said to Delcour. Separate this man from his family, attach him to that stake. The queen having left to my discretion the choice of tortures that are to prelude your deaths. St. Fon continued, now addressing the two women. I mean to subject you to a certain amount of lewd handling Chloris will be witness to it. Noticing that Delcour was not binding the husband to the stake quite as firmly as he wished. St. Fond lent the executioner his assistance and showered a further series of blows upon the man's face and behind. I shall kill him myself, he told Delcor. Yes, I want to have the pleasure of shedding his blood in person. As always methodically combining horror and lechery, he bent forward, sucked Chloris prick a moment, then kissed his ass. Delcor being hard by, he took that worthy's prick in his mouth too and tongued his vent, straightened up, and glued his lips to Delcor's, and after five minutes of this, confided to me, that's the only thing that really puts a little snap in my whip. There followed an interval during which St. Fond was plunged in crapulousness and atrocity emerging from these. He returned to objects of my sex. Ah, my lord, said those poor creatures as he drew near them. What have we done to deserve such barbarous treatment? Be courageous, wife, cried the luckless husband. Death shall soon deliver us from these outrages. Well, suffer no more, and remorse shall gnaw at this monster's soul. Remorse, said St. Fon, chuckling. 
is not a sentiment wherewith I shall ever have acquaintance, lest it be for sparing you. First to be unbound was Madame de Chorus. She was brought to the minister. Ah, whore, said he, do you remember all the obstacles you hurled in my path, all your stubbornness in the past? Dear cousin, cherished cousin, sweet cousin, ill have you cheap today. His was something extraordinary to behold he falls to pawing the woman's charms catching her around the waist. He brutally incuns her before the very eyes of her husband, whose prick, thanks to the position St. Fond has adopted, he is able to mouth the while. And I, finding his ass a fair target, strap a dildo about my loins and embugger him men and women together, all the others save Julie and Chloris surround him, into his hands, before his eyes. I place cunts, asses, pricks, bubs in profusion excited by the demon of cruelty. His fingers rake about, his nails claw, and tear. Whatever they touch but they rove with especial predilection over the breasts of the unhappy woman. His rage feeds upon these, he scrapes, nips, bloodies, incontinently. Take that stuff away, Juliet, says he, decunting from the mother in order to have it the daughter, I'm tired of discharging. Little whore, he declares to the innocent creature under his belly, your father and your mother are both aware of all I did. In thy attempts to gain possession of you, I have you today, and today they're going to regret having thwarted me previously. He then had Chloris placed in such wise that while f the daughter, he might have a clear view of Papa's handsome hindquarters. The witch Delcor was to thwack with one hand as with the other. He molested Mama's buttocks, both their asses being at the same height and adjacent. Tis I who help him to pusillate Julie, he takes good aim, he presses, he thrusts, he incunts, and eight poised asses ring him round. He is sodomized and the wicked white, considering the torments Delcor is inflicting not severe enough, snatches up a small stiletto and indiscriminately pricks the mother's dugs, the daughter's shoulders the father's rear. Blood flows. I, but ill not discharge into this vessel of abomination, snaps the setter. Decunting no, it's rather there, says he, fondling the father's bum, the shrine at which ill do my sacrifice. He gives orders that Chloris, his hands still tied, be stretched out upon the fatal sofa. Delcour, no succor around his neck if we have any resistance from him. Tighten till it ceases. Again superintending the operation, I artfully guide the fiery courser to the edge of the road. It is to charge down theirs, not a murmur out of poor Chloris. Squarely ahead of him are posted the mother's bosom on the right, and on the left, the daughter's pretty little ass. The minister is no sooner ensheathed in the bowels he has been coveting than his hands, one of them wielding the dread stiletto, begin to stray hither and yawn, about the attractions displayed to him, and so displayed that, whenever he jabs, tis upon the father's head flows the blood drawn from the wife or from the daughter. As all this goes forward, I diddle about his asshole and my women prick his buttocks with hatpins. Ah, well, says he after a time, it seems him yet again mistaken. My sperm won't loosen and I fancy that's because I want first to explore this truly very winning family's asses. Delcor chained the old bardash back to the stake. He's been of no use, save to cover my prick with shit. You, the tall one, says he to Montomy, come lick it clean. Detecting in Montom a certain unreadiness to comply, Saint Fond instantly commands Delcor to administer a hundred lashes to teach her obedience. Ah, the whore. The whore, he murmurs while her instructor toils over her. You are loath to suck my prick because it's beshitted? Whatever shall you do when in a little while I give you mards to eat? Muntum, well whipped, returns in a different humor she sucks the lecher. Tidies his member, cleans his asshole out next, and going tranquilly. Back to work, there he is sodomizing the mother the while molesting the ass of the father on the one side, his daughter's c on the other. These exercises occupy him only briefly. Now he fastens upon Julie, saying, 
I hope this will turn the trick. Ever in the pilot's role, I steer him into Julie's Hindward Channel, and once he is safe berthed, every conceivable thing is done to deliver him of his seed, but whether from villainy or from contrariness or from impotence, he quits this ass too, declaring his spent, and if his to recover his strength, must thrash the whole family. The father, already secured to the post, is flogged first. Straightway is all bloodied. His wife is tied with her belly to his back. A thousand strokes lay her ass open. Then little Julie, camped upon her mother's shoulders, is given the same treatment. Unassemble them, says the centaur. Twas an agreeable episode. Now well essay another ill whip the youngster afresh. But her parents will hold her this time. Juliet, and you, Delcor, take you each a pistol, clap it to their heads, and if while im at work on their child, they so much as flinch, blow their brains out. In charge of the mother, I wanted nothing so much as to have her show some recalcitrance, but taking comfort in the thought she was soon to die, under circumstances far less mild than mere shooting, I grew cheerful again after having been downcast and alarmed initially by her submissiveness. Poor Julie, abused with unexampled fury, first lashed with withes, was next flogged with a martinet the thongs whereof had her blood splashing all about the room when done with her. St. Fawn falls upon her father, and using no other weapon but this martinet, its lashes iron-tipped, has him swimming in blood inside three minutes. The mother is seized without delay. She is installed on the edge of the sofa, her legs at the greatest possible spread, and he bends the martinet to her, aiming his blows so they will strike into her open womb. I followed him wherever he went, now frigging him, now beating him, now sucking his tongue or his prick. Raging, he wheels on the daughter, bestows upon her a pair of blows so terribly violent, she and her manacle. Fly all a heap, the mother would come to her aid. He awaits her kicked in the belly. She lands five yards off. Chloris was rolling his eyes, foaming at the mouth, but he dared not utter a word-bound hand and foot. What could he do? The girl is hauled to her feet, St. Fawn directs the executioner to cut her. And he himself, he sodomizes the executioner. While I am employing sweet words and having unbound him, I promise the father his life will be spared and his family's also if he can succeed in buggering the minister. Hope ever rises up in the soul of the doomed cunningly frigged by my hand. His quivering lance penetrates the chink. Saint Fond, positively thrilled to feel so stout a prick in his fundament, dances and skips like the gleeful fish thrown back into water after having been a while in the air. Tis divine and his assured of release and safety, says the minister, if profiting speedily from the admirable state my ass tells me his prick is in, he consents to buy his daughter. Monsieur, I said to this gentleman, ought you hesitate? For is it not better a hundred times that you fear child than murder her? Murder her. Why, yes, monsieur, do you refuse? And chaise undone. Dead, I say, if you balk. And the while one of the women holds the little girl's buttocks at full divide and moistens the hole within, I quickly snatch the engine out of St. Fawn's bum and clap it to the threshold of Julie's. But Chloris in revolt drives not past the gate. So be it, so be it, since he won't fuck her, says St. Fawn. Shall have to die. At this cruel pronouncement resistance melts away. I fit the girl's loins up near the member. I push it into the anus for as much as the requisite preparations have all been made. My efforts culminate in triumph, and Chloris, who would not become the child murderer, becomes incestuous to the tune of a liberal outgushing of f Daly was fustigating St. Fond. In the meantime, he was vexing the mother's ass and kissing the buttocks of one of Orr. The lackeys that this lackey is soon f him. And now a Closian view of Daly's behind seems to inspire him. The inconstant Saint Fond ordered this group, dissolved to still stubbornly holding his seat in check. He appears before us in a greater fury than any wild beast he shrieks. He bellows, there's foam on his lips, curses in his mouth as soon as Delcor spews into Julie's cunt. He has him embugger her mother. 
At length the storm abates a little St. Fond resumes his chair, and orders me to bring up for his examination the three young girls of whom heretofore he has not taken anything but casual notice. He fingers and caresses their asses a quarter of an hour, he separates their buttocks, he compresses them, he compares them and I frig him all this while, and he admits that, in a word, I have never found him better stuck. He is especially taken by Falvey. I debugger hair, be sure of it, the lecher remark. If I didn't fear, I de discharge. After reviewing the three girls, he wishes to review the four women Palmyre enchants him. Never, says he, has he seen the like of her, and the lovely girl's matchless ass has him dumbfounded and doting for ten minutes. Then, he turns to me. Instruct all these to get down on their knees in a semicircle around me, then to creep forward and pay their respects to my prick, and to suck it, one by one. I give the order, it is carried out, and while each suckles his engine, she receives a couple of smart slaps. Well now, says he, when that ceremony is over, it's my ass turn, have them approach one after the other, and do it fitting worship and lick it. Off they go to their new chore, and while it is being done he sucks pricks. Including, as you may well imagine, those of Chloris and Dalker. The time has come, Juliet, says he, to end this first scene. Whereupon the villain and buggers little Julie. The valets hold the mother and father while he bores and scrapes the child's ass. Armed with a razor, Delcor steps up and prepares to sever her head. Be in no hurry about it, Delcor, he cries. I want my beloved niece to know what's happening to her. She's not to die before I've done f her. Delcor laid the cutting edge to skin, and at once the child set up a ghastly wailing and screeching. Proceed, proceed, said Saint Fond, well lodged in her ass, but go softly. You've in no idea the repercussions all this is having on my nervous system. Bend this way a little, Delcour, so that I can warn your member while you work. Juliet, pay your respects to Delcour's ass. Worship it has become a god in my consideration. And bring the mother's ass inside my reach. I want to kiss it while I have her daughter murdered. But what were those kisses? Great god, they were bites so cruel the blood leapt forth at each. A valet embuggered him. The scoundrel's ecstasy was unspeakable. Ah, I savor crime, I do indeed, he exclaimed, uttering many incoherent oaths. I adore crime. It bewitches me. Delcor cuts with exquisite slowness. Chloris is deathly pale, half in a swoon. He averts his horror-filled gaze. Julie's beautiful head falls at last like a rose that finally yields to the unflagging north wind. Then what I have just experienced, there's probably nothing more voluptuous, announces St. Fond, withdrawing from the cadaver. Tis unimaginable, the constriction resulting in the anus from a gradual incision performed upon the nape vertebrae. It is delicious. All right now, madame, prepare to give me the same pleasure. And the scene begins anew. Estimating that the operation is going ahead too rapidly, St. Fon suspends it. I dare say they are few who realize. He observes how heavenly it is to slice through the neck of a woman whom in your gigantic weakness you loved in days bygone. I am being very splendidly revenged upon my cousin. It's the sort of thing you are fain to have last forever. He continued frigging the headsman's prick. But he would now kiss my buttocks of valet tups and bumwise. Another inserts in Delcor who resumes carving the father has been adjusted so that I, armed with switches, can slash away at his privities. My ferocious lover is in raptures. He feasts upon the slow sufferings of his relative, whose head is at last sundered fifteen minutes later. And now tis Chloris turn. He's placed in the position the operation demands, and bound. St. Fon sodomizes. The killer sets to work. Valets yet embugger them both. This time it is Montalmy's magnificent behind Saint Fond Alex to kiss. The other women encircle him, displaying their asses the bomb does finally burst. Heavens! If mighty Lucifer were to take it upon himself to discharge, methinks had unloose his seed less thunderously. Would not foam so much at the mouth, 
nor so gnash his teeth, that the gods would not hurl blasphemies and imprecations so fearful. While St. Fond remains behind, resting, I escort the seven women and the two valets into the next room. The minister has soon rejoined us, but, like Wenceslas, his headsman is ever at his side a few revels of a milder kind are. However, to precede the anthropophagical orgies of our latter-day Nero, and now for a space fuck is perhaps to flow before the blood-shedding resumes. Nonetheless, considering the man I was dealing with, it was necessary that I hew to the line laid down by his favorite pleasures. The voluptuous groups awaiting him had been disposed about in three alcoves, decorated with all that is emblematic of death. The entire room was hung in black, bones, skulls, a great store of rods, switches, withes, martinets, and knives were the furnitures in each niche. A virgin was being cunt-lapped by a lesbian, both naked, reposing upon black cushions, and upon their brows wearing the skull and crossbones device. Within each niche, one of the lately severed heads was plainly visible, and in front of these niches there were on the right a coffin, and to the left a little round table upon which lay a pistol, a goblet of poison, and a dagger from somewhere doubtless from my desire to please my lover. I had got the idea of sawing up the bodies of the three victims, sacrificed a little before. Gone was everything below mid-thigh, and from the waist up, and cords depending from hooks, sunk in the intercolumniations between the niches, held these chunks of meat mouth high. These were the objects St. Fond first caught sight of when he entered. My goodness, sighed he. After head kissed them all, here they are again, and am most content to see them. These asses which recently gave me such delight. A dim, a lugubrious lamp hung in the middle of the room, whose vaults were likewise covered with dismal appurtenances. Various instruments of torture were scattered here and there. Among other objects, one saw a most unusual wheel. It revolved inside a drum, the inner surface of which was studded with steel spikes the victim, bent in an arc upon the circumference of the wheel, would, as it turned, be rent everywhere by the fixed spikes by means of a spring device the drum could be tightened, so that as the spikes grated flesh away they could be brought closer and contact with the diminished mass maintained. This torture was the more horrible, inasmuch as it was exceedingly gradual, and the victim might well endure ten hours of slow and appalling agony before giving up the ghost. To accelerate or slow the procedure one had but to decrease or widen the distance between the wheel and the compassing drum this machine, of Delcor's contriving, had not yet been essayed by St. Fond upon seeing it. He waxed very enthusiastic, and then and there gave its inventor a fifty thousand francs gratuity. From that moment on his single preoccupation was to choose her from among the three victims who would be immolated in this manner. His perfidious gaze flitted from one girl to the next. Gods. The conclusion was foregone the unlucky Falvi, being the most beautiful, stood condemned in the tyrant's heart. Of this I was sure. A kiss he applied to that lovely creature's asshole the moment he was done, contemplating the terrible machine. Erased all doubt, but of all that in due time. Between Delcor and me, Saint Fond first starts by settling himself in one, after the other of the three armchairs which were placed one in front of each alcove. Wow. Palmyre. Of my women alone, not employed in a niche. Is posted behind his chair, and is reaching around. And up. Polluting him he is dandling Delcor's prick and toying with my ass, and he scrutinizes the scene before him. Each tribade is mindful to ensure him, a good view of the body, of the little girl she is frigging, in every sector, and in or. Every possible manner and attitude often, indeed, the child is brought to him, so that he may kiss her in diverse parts. He rises, goes to the next niche, then to the third, then comes back to the first, in the meantime, Delcor flogs him, and now again he has somebody fuck him. And I suck him. I remark his device beginning to assume size and vibrancy. He embuggers me after a while. This occurred opposite the niche, where Blazine was toiling over Fulvy. It was then, 
as he was embracing that charming girl's ass. He glanced aside at me and whispered in my ear, That's the one who's to baptize the wheel. What a pretty tickling it'll give those delectable little buttocks. This preliminary examination completed, he lays himself down on a kind of narrow, upholstered bench, and then begins a veritable parade all those present, male and female, file up and one by one straddle the bench, squat over his face, and shit into his mouth. Palmyr steps first to the fore, and when she has eased herself, she kneels down beside his lordship, takes his prick in her mouth, and sucks on it throughout the right. Next, Montalm and I present ourselves simultaneously, in order that he be able, as he so desires, to handle one ass while the other is yielding. From nastiness the libertine moves straight to horrors. He gives Delcor instructions to flog the seven women. And I rub his prick upon the heads he has had me detach for this purpose. After that three tableau take form before his eyes. My two f- and bugger two of my tribades in the center. Delcor. Flogs the third at the foot of each group reclines. One of the little p girls sing fawn is to depucillate, and for this task he is now getting himself in readiness. Paul Meyer and I are arraying him for fight, she by Socratizing him, I by means of prick friggery. Rampant, the libertine shivers the three forward pucillages, turns Falvi over and sinks his lance in her bum and discharges. I suck his weapon to restore it to true and temper. He would have the headsman hold for him all the women. Not accepting me to each of us, he applies two hundred strokes. Then it is he who holds the women and bids Delcor and bugger them all. While Delcor is performing, the minister kisses them upon the mouth during all the scene, in which I figure too. Then Saint Fond led each maiden away into a remote chamber and passed a brief interval with her alone. We do not know what he told them, nor what he did, nor dared we even question them when they were brought back. In all likelihood, he apprised them of their impending deaths, for each returned weeping from the interview. While St. Fon's consultations were in progress, Delcor indicated to me that a certain subtle, lubricious byplay ordinarily followed this announcement, and that, since the f outset of his acquaintance with the minister, he, Delcor, had always observed that pronouncing sentence left his lordship overwhelmed by a sweet and mysterious anguish. Such was now the case, for he came back profoundly agitated, flushed, and marvelously erected. Tin, the Ruel, said he, rubbing his hands together, lusts froth on his lips. Let's take counsel. How shall we do them to death? Their agonies must be frightful, you understand. Indescribable. Delcor, my lad, cudgel your wits. I expect you to outdo yourself in inventiveness, these poor swine are. To endure one after the other all of hell's tortures, it will desolate me if they get away with less. And so saying, he gave Fulvia a warm kiss. It was very obviously she who most aroused him. Delcor, he went on, let me recommend this pretty little thing to you. Shall look stunning on your wheel. Those plump white buttocks were made for its spikes. Wherewith he sank his teeth into her, bit her in half a dozen places. Drawing blood from each one of those bites, cost her the nip off her left teat, and the roguish minister swallowed it. He popped his prick into her asshole for a moment, then plucked it out again, got hold of Delker's engine, and rammed it into the vent head vacated. The executioner must f his victim, said he. Protocol demands it. While Delcor was complying, St. Fon's fingernails raked and tore the child's buttocks, thighs, breasts, and he lapped up the blood as he made it flow he had Palmyre come forward. Palmyre, for whom, it appeared, he also had a prodigious weakness, and he said to her, Behold, tis thus I treat little girls who stiffen my tool. Those words were scarce out of his mouth when he drove the selfsame tool into her ass after some bucking and heaving, he had her clamber upon a chair so he could proceed with her buttocks and better. View and beside her he had delight take the same stance then. The three girls ranged themselves in a semicircle around him. They knelt, and he molested their bosoms while Blazine frigged his prick. He ran pins into those three unfortunate still but how-formed breasts. With a penknife he gashed them. 
then immediately brought a hot iron into play and cauterized the wounds. And I? I was busy keeping his excitement at a pitch, having pursuant to his orders, Delcour's prick in my bowels and the prick of a valet in either hand. With cords, the minister bound the kneeling three into a compact group, their backs together, and with a martinet, whose steel tips were arrowheads, edged as well as pointed, made a very hash of their mamaris throughout these pageantries. Paul Murr's ass was constantly there, wherever he looked taking respite from his labors. He many times flung himself upon it and sucked it to recover strength. No dallying, said he. Rising up again set the stage. Well, have some more of the whip. The seven women he was left out where tied to specially constructed columns in their upraised hands. They each held a crucifix also upon crucifixes the four tribades were standing, and seemingly treading them contemptuously underfoot, while the three victims found support upon cannonballs studded with nails all over, in such wise that their feet were lacerated owing to the weight of their bodies. The victims were cinctured around the breast by a leather strap, first wet, and as it dried, shrinking ever tighter, a device impended above the head of each and Saint Fawn, controlling a small crank, could bring its needle-sharp point down so that it penetrated to whatever depth desired into the cranium of the girl other instruments, these resembling twaddened, forks and likewise needle-pointed, and also controlled by Saint Fond, were aimed at their eyes, yet another point was there to receive their navels in the event that, jostled by the blows of the whip, they might perchance slip forward in each of the victims, arranged, as I have said, was flanked by tribades, who were free of all such intricate harnesses. Saint Fond at first uses the switches, Delcor. And I hand over to him he mates out a hundred strokes to each victim, and deals each tribade fifty. The second round sees the steel-tipped martinet in service. Each victim is favored with two hundred blows thereof, each tribade with a mere dozen. Then Saint Fond starts his machineries working the poor children, pricked in this place and that, set up a clamor such as would have melted the heart of any villain made of less stern stuff than we. Sensing a mounting irritation in his prick, whence fuck is already oozing. Saint Fund quickly has Louise brought to him, that Louise, sixteen years old, whom he has singled out to be executed first. Much does he kiss her, lick and fondle her bleeding ass, give her his prick to suck and his asshole then turns her over to Delcor, who once he has slipped his goad into both her orifices, fastens her down upon a long table, and subjects her to that Chinese torture which consists in being chopped up alive, by less than inches, into twenty-four thousand pieces. Saint Fond, seated on the lap of the lackey for him, assists at the spectacle, and between his thighs grips Helen, next on the list, and whose ass he mollusks while I frig him, and he tums Paul Meyer's mouth, the torture used upon the second consists in having her eyes gouged out, and after that of being spread on a St. Andrew's cross and broken alive. St. Fond attends to the matter while I thrash him. All the victim's limbs are broken. All her joints pulled loose in that state she is offered to him again. He embuggers her, and while he instruments her anus, Delcor finishes her off with a mace, dashing out her brains so that they fairly splatter into St. Fond's mouth and eyes. The charming Fulvie alone remains, surrounded by the gory vestiges of her two companions. Can she be in doubt of her fate? St. Fawn points to the wheel. Look there, says the minister. I've saved the best for you. And the traitor does not fail to caress her and to kiss her tenderly upon the lips. Yet again, he embuggers her before delivering her to the killer. Delcor has her now hideous, are her scream she is fitted into position, fastened there, and the wheel begins to turn. Fucked now by one valet, now by the other. St. Fond sounds Delcoros, ass while alternately kissing Paul Myers behind and mine, and in a detached and fugitive manner fingering the three unoccupied assholes. Very soon the ascending volume and tone of the victim's screams give us report of her pain. Violent you may be certain. It was judged thereof by this detail. The blood was coming from her like one of those fine rains, blown almost to mist by a strong wind. Saint Fond, 
eager to prolong the game to the utmost, varies his tableau and his festive doings too. He embuggers my four tribades in swift succession, while we all, Delcor included, compose new groups for him. The spike surfaced drum, ever contracting, begins to attack the nerves, and the cries of the victim are stilled as overwhelmed by suffering she faints away, and that's the very moment when Saint Fawn, weary of horrors and cruelty, finally unleashes his f into Paul Meyer's superb ass, while he gummahooches Delcors, palpates mine with one hand, and montums with the other, watches one of the valet in bugger blizzine on the floor beside the fatal wheel, and is whipped by Delis, who also sucks his tongue to hasten his discharge. Saint Fawn's shrieks, his disport, his foul, ungodly language, were all appalling. He was only half-conscious when we bore him to the bed where he nevertheless gave me to understand. He wished to have me pass the night at his side. This peerless libertine, quite as though he had just performed wonders of charity, enjoyed ten hours of blissful, undisturbed sleep. I watched his rest, and if I had doubted it before, I was convinced now that it is easy to build oneself a conscience to sort evenly with one's opinions, and that after the initial effort has been made, nothing afterward stands in one's way. Oh, my friends, believe me when I say that he who has succeeded in ridding his heart of every idea and trace of God or religion, he whose gold or influence removes him beyond the reach of the law, he who has toughened his conscience and brought it firmly into line with his attitudes and cleared it, Utterly and forever of guilty remorse he, I say, and be certain thereof, he may do whatever he pleases, and whenever, and never know an instant's fear. When he woke up, the minister asked me if it were not true that he was the wickedest man in the world. Knowing the pleasure I would give by answering in the affirmative, I did not by any means contradict him, and he smiled. You flatter me. Do I? It is sincere. I rather suppose so. Ah, my angel, said he, yawning. Could it be otherwise with me? Is it my fault if this is how I am? And if nature put the most irresistible taste for vice in me, and not so much as a hint of a bent for virtue? Don't you agree that I serve her quite as well as some other, in whom she ingrained a fondness for doing good deeds? That seems self-evident to me, and this likewise— that there would be no greater folly than willfully to cross her purpose as it regards us individually. I am the poisonous. Plant she makes grow by the balsam tree, and find my manner of being no more to be regretted than I would esteem enviable that of the virtuous man, and one sway, realize that upon earth there must be the bitter together with the better. Can it make one jot of difference to us whether we are numbered in this category or that? Imitate me, Juliet. Eleven, your native leanings are in this direction. Let no criminal act daunt you. The more atrocious it is, the more pleasing to nature guilt. The only guiltiness is in reluctance. In back hanging, lift up your head, beloved girl, and go ever forward. To the dreary, mediocre portion of mankind, leave all notions and prattle, such as that righteousness and modesty, must accompany fleshly pleasure, They'll fail utterly of it every time. For it cannot possibly delect, save when one outsteps every limit in one's quest the proof thereof, is that there must be a breaking of restraining rules before pleasure begins to be pleasure. Go farther yet. Break still another and the irritation becomes more violent. And necessarily so with each ascending step, and you do not really attain to the true goal whither. These pleasure-takings point until the ferment of the senses has reached the extremest pitch, until you have got to the final limit of what our human faculties can endure, in such wise that your nerves are so prodigiously wrought upon, that they are frayed as if to paralysis, smitten into a convulsion that resembles standstill and shocked insensibility. He who also would know the whole wild power and all the magic of lubricity's pleasures must thoroughly well grasp that only by undergoing the greatest possible upheaval in the nervous system may he procure himself the drunken transport he must have, if he is properly to enjoy himself. For what is pleasure? 
simply this that which occurs when voluptuous atoms, or atoms emanated from voluptuous objects, clash hard with and fire the electrical particles circulating in the hollows of our nerve fibers. Therefore, that the pleasure be complete, the clash must be as violent as possible, but so delicate is the nature of this sensation that a mere nothing can spoil or nullify it hence. The soul must be prepared, tranquil, its serenity ensured by certain mental attitudes or certain physical postures, so that it lies as though in a calm and smiling veil. And then the imagination's fire must set the furnace of the senses alight. From this point onward, give that imagination free reign. Act at its every behest, its every whim and labor, not only to grant it what it desires, but by making practical use of your philosophy, and above all of the chill hardness of your heart and your lack of conscience, enable it to forge, to weave, to create new fantasies which, injecting energies into the voluptuous atoms, cause them to collide at greater speed and more potently with the molecules they are to make. Vibrate these vibrations are your delight. From what I have just said, you will appreciate, Juliet, how obstacles, exerting their restrictive influence upon the form of your delirium, will always tend to confine it within the boundaries of decency and virtue, thus altering its essence upon your delirium obstacles of any sort have a dampening effect. Water poured on fire a hindering effect, so many chains, so many clogs encumbering the spirited young destrier that asks only to take the bit in its mouth and break into a gallop. In such cases, the impediment represented by religion is without doubt the first that ought to be liquidated, being as it is a perpetual source of discomfort and remorse. To anyone languishing in its grip but combating superstition is only half the job. It will remain unfinished so long as the altars of a fantastical god are left standing. No, there's not much to the former operation, neither a great deal of intelligence nor a great deal of brawn is needed to dispose of religion's disgusting chimeras, since not one of them can hold up under examination. But that's not the end to it, Juliet. Not by any means. There are countless other duties, other social conventions, other barriers which will soon become as much a nuisance to you as religion was, if, bold and independent of mind, you do not make it a rule to thrust aside anything that lies in your path. Just as hampered by these contemptible restraints, you'll soon discover them interfering with your pleasures equally as much as his belief interferes with the believers. If, yeah. on the contrary, you have ridden roughshod over everything in order to attain pleasure, and if you have protected your rear by taming your conscience and lulling it nicely off to sleep then, in this other case, there is no doubt but that your enjoyment will be as intense and complete as anything nature allows of, and such will be your frenzy that its excessive consequences will be all, if not more than your physical faculties can endure. Nevertheless, do not expect to be as happy in the beginning as, by dint of persistence, you shall be later on no matter what you do to counter them. Prejudices will continue a long while to harass you, and the more severely, the more formidable the obstacles you surmount baneful, fatal effects of education, for which the only remedy is deep thought, indefatigable perseverance, and entrenched habits especially. But little by little me intention is not to discourage you little by little your mind will become fortified habit. That second nature which sometimes becomes more powerful than first, which is at length able to annihilate those very natural principles that seem the most invulnerable, the most sacred. This habit that is essential to vice, that I cannot too strongly urge you to acquire, and upon which success in the career you have chosen depends this habit, I say, will dull your remorse, quell it, silence your conscience, put a stop to the silly bleeding that comes from the heart, and then you'll see things in a very different light indeed. Amazed at the fragility of the bonds that held you captive once, you'll look with a certain regret, yes, with a certain nostalgia back upon the days when, stupidly ensnared, innocently, you were able to resist pleasures, 
and though a few paltry obstacles may have got in the way of your felicity, the charm of having known it, and the divine memories you will have of it, will cause the thorns they wish to strow in your path to appear as very flowers. Well now, in the circumstances where I have placed you, with the security I guarantee you, what have you to fear? Reflect a moment upon your marvelous situation, and if the certainty of getting off scot-free furnishes, crime its divinest allurements, who in all the world is better placed than you to enjoy yourself to death. Consider now your other advantages eighteen years, perfect health, the prettiest face, the noblest figure, all the wit one could ask for, intelligence, the temperament of a Messalina, the riches virtually of a Croesus, a splendid reputation, no handicaps, no chains, no relations, friends who adore you and you're afraid of the law. Put by your fears forever, some day the sword of justice is bared against you, Juliet. Protect yourself with the shield of your wiles and winningness, instead of her. This languor where you lie, becalmed in a sea of voluptuous delights, adopt another mood, put on seductive raiments, show yourself about, and crowds will fall at him. Your feet bestear yourself and a kneeling world will provide you with ten thousand champions. They will shed their blood to the last drop, defending the name of error. Most cherished idol and to keep it pure ten thousand hearts will beat for you. And where others would have judges to dread you all, find none but devoted lovers. Let the isolated, the friendless, the penniless individual, he who counts for naught, who scarce has an identity, let him groan under vulgar yokes they were designed for him only. But you, Juliet, ah, hurl all nature into confusion, wreak havoc, destroy, rend the whole universe asunder. Men will consider your anger godlike, and do you divine worship, if perchance you deign to smile upon the world. Whensoever you cast a crumb of kindness to it, and will dread you when in wrath you trample upon it. But it is all one. Whatever you do, you'll always be God to the common sort and mass of humankind. Indulge yourself, O oh my Juliet, without fear, proudly surrender to the impetuosity of your tastes, to the irregularity of your caprices, to the blazing ardor of your desires. Your wantonness is my cheer. Your pleasures, my joy, be ever guided by them, ruled by them, and by nothing else may your voluptuous imagination ensure variety to our disorders. Only by multiplying them will we attain happiness. Happiness being an intrinsically fickle and fugitive thing, it confers its blessing only upon him who is clever to mark it, quick to seize it, strong to hold it and never lose sight of the fact that all human felicity lies in man's imagination and that he cannot think to attain it unless he heeds all his caprices. The most fortunate of persons is he who has the most means to satisfy his vagaries, get ye girls, men, children upon all those in your entourage, direct the lasciviousness of your impassioned soul. Whatever delights is good, whatever arouses is natural. Do you not see the star that lights us sometimes give life and sometimes take it away, now vivifying, now withering to dust? Match the sun in thy conduct as thou dost figure it in thy fair eyes. Take Messalina and Theodora for thy models, like those famous wh of antiquity. Supply thyself with harems, of either sex wherein thou canst plunge conveniently, and when thou wilt into a very ocean of filthiness. Wallow in order and infamy. Let all that is of the dirtiest and the most execrable, of the most shameful and the most criminal, of the most cynical and the most repulsive, of the most unnatural, illegal, irreligious, be for those very reasons that which dost please thee most. Soil without stint and at leisure the loveliest parts of thy body. Remember that there is not a one where lubricity may not find a shrine, and that the divinest pleasures are unfailingly those whereat thou perhaps suppose nature vexed. When the most odious of debaucheries excesses, when the most depraved turpitudes, when the most disgusting activities begin to pall upon thee, and leave thee listless, have resort to cruelties, they reanimate the most ghastly and fell deeds, the most revolting atrocities, the most unimaginable and nameless crimes.
the most gratuitous horrors, the most monstrous perversities. Let these be the means to convey thy soul from the lethargy where Libertanage may have left it. Nor forget that nature is thine ally and sanction that whatever she lets us do is permissible, and that when she created us, she was cunning enough to withhold from us the power and possibility of doing her injury. Thou shalt then notice love sometimes maketh his arrows into daggers, and that for bringing our f to flow the invectives of the doomed one, we torment often outvalue the polite gallantries of Cythera. Deeply moved by St. Vaughn's speech, I ventured to indicate that my sole fear was of the possibility his kindness to me might come to an end. Juliet, he gave me answer, you'd have fallen out of grace a good while before this had I merely been your lover for, however beautiful she may be. The favors of a woman cannot exert prize upon me for long. He unto whom it is a principle that the instant one is finished for a woman is the instant when it is essential to be finished with her, must of a certainty. If he is only a lover, inspire such an eventuality as causes you to worry but Juliet. And hereof I need hardly remind you. There is precious little of the vulgar amorist in me both. Of us bound by similarities of taste, intellect, outlook, and self-interest. I apprehend our attachment as one forged out of egoism alone. And that kind endures forever. Would I advise you to f broad if I were your lover? No, Juliet. No, that I am not. Such I shall never be. Hence dread no change of heart in me. If ever I quit you, it will be you the cause of our separation, only you. Maintain your good behavior, I tell you. Be active in the service of my pleasures. Let not a moment go by, when I do not develop some new vice in you, or further refine an old one, while we are at home. Show me submissiveness carried to the last degree of baseness. The lower you crawl cringingly at my feet, the higher I from pride, shall set you above others above all. Whatsoever may be the thing I require you to do, do it without ever displaying any weakness, any hint of contrition, and I shall render you the happiest of women, as you shall render me the luckiest of men. O oh, my master, said I, be ever sure that if I would reign over the world, it is to bring it on its bended knees in homage to you. Next we left off generalities to discuss certain particulars. St. Fond expressed regret at not having been able to subject his niece to the wheel, which, said he, he would definitely have done were he not under obligation to produce her head in Paris. Then he spoke in very great praise of Dalcour. He is full of imagination, said the minister. He is young and vigorous besides, and I must compliment you upon having desired his pr- For my own part, it is always a delight to f*** him. In passing, let me remark that, as I have often had occasion to observe, the same man you f*** in your youth can yet be f*** pleasurably when you are forty. We are alike, errant we, Juliet. He went on. As did I, you took a fancy to him on account of his trade. Were it not for that, neither of us would have paid him the slightest attention. Have you had many such fellows? I asked St. Fond. For five or six years they were my specialty, he replied. I combed the provinces to get hold of them, and I had an incredible leaning toward their valets. You simply cannot imagine what it's like to have the prick of a headsman's valet in your ass after a time, though. I found something equivalent in butcher's boys. Often I do pass two hours being embuggered by one of those lads come fresh from his slaughtering and bloody. All over. Adorable, said I. Beyond words so, said he. Ah, yes, my dear. Believe me, those stunts call for infamy and deprivation, and what the devil is lust, if crapulousness is not therein as its very soul. By the way, the minister continued, one of those tribades has an appalling effect upon my nervesi. Refer to the pretty blonde, the whom, I think, obtained the last of my thought. Palmyre? Yes, twas doubtless so I heard you call her. Her ass was the fairest, its hole the narrowest, the warmest of the lot. How did you gain possession of the wench? She was working at a dressmaker's, was just turned eighteen when I found her, and as mint as a babe emerging from its mother's, womb Palmyre is an orphan. She comes of a good line, 
and has no parents save an elderly aunt who gave me an excellent character of the girl. Do you love her, Julia? Saint Fond, I don't love anything. I am moved by caprice only. I feel this pretty creature lacks absolutely nothing of what is needed to make a delicious victim undeniably she is beautiful. It is quite certain she would be yet more so in distress. She has magnificent hair. A sublime ass whose qualities are indeed outstanding. Here, Juliet, does see how my prig soars at the thought of martyrizing her? Truly, never had I seen his prick in such high wrath. I clutched it and set to frigging it softly. But, if I take her, he added, he'll pay you well. He'll pay you a better price for her than for another, since I desire her. To my understanding, does not that word have the meaning and force of a command? Wouldst have her come in this instant? I would, for my prick has gone up for her. Saint Fawn, flinging a dressing robe about himself, sprang toward Palmyre as she came into the room, and, taking her firmly by the arm, disappeared with her into another chamber. Long, arduous was the seance I could hear Palmyre's screams. An hour elapsed before they returned. As he had made her undress before leading her off to that secret lair, the first thing that caught my eye when she reappeared was the extent to which she had been mistreated, and even if her body had not been naked, the tears still coursing down her cheeks would have been sufficient evidence. It was but too superfluously confirmed by the marks on her breasts and buttocks. Juliet, declared her tormentor, visibly overwrought by what he had just accomplished. It breaks my heart that I simply do not have enough time for this. Those blasted heads must be delivered to the Queen by five this afternoon, which means ill not be able to amuse myself with this girl in the manner I delight. Not today, at least. So this is my suggestion. Have her present the day after tomorrow at our next three-girl supper. Until then, prison her safely in the darkest and best part of your dungeon cells. I forbid you to allow her any nourishment or drink, and order you to fetter her so closely to the wall, she will be able neither to sit down nor even to stir. Do not question her about what has just now passed. I have my own reasons for preferring to keep you in ignorance thereabout. For this Palmire, you will receive double the customary fee. Farewell. So saying, he and Elcor, the latter carrying the box containing the three heads, Mount St. Fon's coach it drives away, and I, keenly agitated, remain rooted to the spot. I had a great fondness for Palmire. Very loath I was to surrender her to that cannibal. But could I disobey? Daring not even to speak to her, I had her taken off to the dungeon, and scarcely was she there when two sentiments assailed me. The first was a desire to save this girl, of whom I was still far from being weary. The second revolved around Anne. Extreme curiosity, to discover just how St. Fawn proceeded with women, upon whom he pronounced capital sentence. Ceding to this latter desire, I was about to start down to interrogate the captive, when a servant ushered in Madame de Clairville. Several days earlier she had seen the minister, and learned from him the time of his return from the country, and now she had come to ask whether I would not care to drive back with her to Paris, and to see a charming ballet at the opera. I embraced my friend most warmly. I related to her all we had lately achieved. Saint Fond and I the follies. I decommitted before the minister's arrival. I spoke also of them, and of all the others that had ensued. The dear creature found my stories delicious and congratulated me upon the progress I was beginning to make in prime. When I alluded to what was afoot regarding Palmyre, Claire Will raised a cautioning hand. Juliet, said she, beware. Vanish all thoughts of cheating the minister of his victim, and above all of prying into his obscure ways, be rather mindful that your fate depends upon this man, and that the pleasure you might derive from discovering his secret, or from preserving your slut's life, will never console you for the woes that will unfailingly beset you, do you act the fool. You'll find ten score girls worth more than this one, and as for St. Fon's secret, knowledge of one piece of infamy, more or less, is not going to make you happier. 
Let's dine, my beloved, and then hasten back to the city. It will distract you. By six o'clock, we were en route. Claire Will, Elvire, Montum, and I, the team of six English horses, had us flying swift as the wind, and we would surely have arrived. In time for the opening of the ballet, when but a little out of the village of Arcue, we met with four men, who were mounted and had pistols in their hands. Night had fallen. Our lackeys, effeminate, craven fellows, fops almost, ran off as fast as their legs could carry them. And save only for the two coachmen, we were left to confront the four masked riders alone. Claire Will, who knew not the meaning of fear, singled out him who looked to be the ringleader, and addressing him in an imperious tone, demanded what he fancied he was. About not a word did he reply. Our drivers were ordered to turn the coach about. We proceeded back away in the direction of our QA, then climbed to Kachan and swung off into a narrow road, which at length brought us to a lonely fortified castle. The coach entered. The gates closed. We even heard them being barricaded from within. Thereupon, one of our escorts opened the door of the coach and silently offered his hand, inviting us to step out. My knees buckled as I got down from the coach. I was close to fainting away, for indeed I was dreadfully afraid my women were in no better case only Claire Will was undaunted. Head high, lips compressed. She bade us take courage. Three of our ravishers disappeared. Their captain led us into a well-lit drawing room. There our eyes were greeted by the sight of an old man he was weeping, and two very pretty young ladies were endeavoring to console him. Nesdams, these persons gathered here, pronounced our guide, who had now been rejoined by his three fellows, are all that remain of the Chloris family. The old gentleman is the father of the husband, these two ladies are the sisters of his wife, and we are his brothers. The head of this house, his wife and daughter, too, are missing false charges were brought against them. Through no fault of their own, they incurred. Her Majesty's displeasure, and worse yet, the wrath of that minister, who owes his place and fortune to none other than my brother's generosity and aid. Inquiries we rapidly made led us to the conviction that these three persons, of whom there has been nothing heard, since the day before yesterday, are being held prisoner, or are dead, in the country house you left this same evening. You belong to the minister, one of you is his mistress. This we know. You shall either guide us to the recovery of the three we seek, or persuade us that they are no longer alive until then, you shall remain our hostages. Restore our relatives to us, and you go free, but if they have been murdered, then you shall be with them in the grave very shortly, and your shades shall implore theirs for forgiveness. Beyond this, we have nothing to say to you now. Tis your turn to speak. Be quit, monsieur answered the brazen Clarewell. It would appear to me that your doings are in every sense profoundly illegal. I would also qualify them as exceedingly clumsy. For consider to begin with, is it likely that two women, Madame and myself these others are, our servants is it at all likely? I say that two women be so well acquainted with the minister's private affairs as to have any knowledge of such happenings as you refer to? Do you really suppose that if the persons in question have fallen into disgrace at court, and that justice or the minister has been called upon to take action, do you honestly believe that we would have been made privy to any such execution? You know when we departed from the minister's house, you doubtless know when we arrived, does not our presence. Under his roof during the last few days, most conclusively prove that the event could not have transpired there? For the rest, gentlemen. We have naught but our word of honor to give you, but we offer it as guarantee of our total ignorance of what may have befallen those after whose fate you ask. No, gentlemen, no, we do declare to you that we have never even heard tell of these people until now. And if you are just men, and have no more to say to us, put us at our liberty this instant, for it is against our will you detain us here, and you have not the right to do so. We shall not amuse ourselves refuting you, madame, our guide replied. One of you has been four days upon the minister's estate. The other arrived there late this afternoon. 
It was also four days ago the Cloris family entered that same house of you two. One is most assuredly in a position to answer the questions I have posed, and you have neither of you any chance of being released until we are fully enlightened. Whereupon the three other horsemen declared that since we were not eager to speak of our own free will, there were ways of extracting information from us by force. Ah, my sons, that I would not have, said the old man. No violence shall be done here. We must eschew our enemies' means, lest we be likewise guilty of an evil. We shall merely request these ladies to compose a letter to the minister, asking him to come to this house forthwith, and the message may be so styled as to give him the impression that they, and they alone, are soliciting his presence for business of the greatest urgency. He will come, we shall question him. He will finally have no choice but to tell us where my son and daughter are, for, if he refuses, this hand, trembling though it is, shall find the strength to thrust a knife-point into his heart. Wicked abuses of tyranny, dire results of despotism. O oh, people of France, when shall you rise up against these horrors? When, tired of slavery and conscious of your tremendous might, when shall you look boldly up and snap the chains? With which crowned criminals keep you in bondage? When shall you reclaim the freedom where unto nature destined you? Put pen and ink and paper before these ladies and let them write. Keep them amused, I whispered to Clarewell. Occupy their attentions and leave the letter to me. This was the text in affair of the very extremest importance. Necessitates your presence here. The bearer of this note will guide you. Come with the utmost dispatch. I submit the letter to our captors. They approve it. While addressing the envelope, I find a moment to scribble this postscript rush hither in force. Else were lost it is perforce the foregoing is indited. The missive is sealed. One of the brothers leaves with it. And we are introduced into a room in an upper story the door is bolted. And another brother stands guard without. No sooner were we alone than I told Clarewell what I had appended to the letter. She shook her head. That does not suffice to set my mind at rest, said she. For if he comes here in force, these people have but to see that force and our throats are cut. What if we try to seduce our jailer? Well, fail, I replied. These errand hired thugs. They are bound by honor. Not to mention ties of blood. Nothing will dissuade them from seeking their revenge. Ah, Claire will. It does indeed seem to me that I have not yet got firm grasp of our principles. For in truth I do greatly fear lest some fatality or other, call it what you will, shall see virtue triumph in the end. Never. Never. Victory goes always to the stronger, and for strength crime has not its match. Such ideas betray an unpardonable weakness in you. This is my first reverse. Your second, Juliet. Let me refresh your memory. Only after you emerged from a prison where you ought rather to have gone to the gallows did fortune begin to heap her favors upon you. True. A D forgot that adventure. And its moral. Take courage, Juliet, be patient. Nothing under the sun could have extinguished the fires of libertinage that burned at all times in this remarkable woman. There was but one bed in the room. And would you believe it? She suggested we all four of us get into it and while away the time frigging one another until St. Fon's arrival. But as it turned out, neither I nor either of my women was in a sufficiently composed state to cooperate in her extravagances, and so we chatted instead as we awaited further developments. Like Clarewell, Monsieur de St. Fon considered that, we being prisoners there, it were wiser not to storm the chateau under such circumstances. The employ of ruse, he felt, ought to precede that of violence, and this was the stratagem he used. The writer who had gone out with our letter returned with two youths unknown to us. They brought Clora's father a message. It ran as follows. To hold women in an affair concerning men only is not befitting to gallantry. Free these ladies in their stead, except as hostages these young men. One my first cousin. The other... My nephew, you may believe that their safety is more precious to me than that of the women now in your power. As well, put aside all fear regarding your own loved ones. They are indeed under detention. But here at my house in Ulm, 
Paris consider me responsible for them, and I vow to you they shall be in your midst within the space of three days. Again I say to you, keep my kinsmen and let the women go their way. I myself shall be at your house four hours after this reaches you. Here we had to use our wits very cleverly. The note was not read out to us. It was not until later we learned its exact contents for the moment we could only guess its drift. Are you acquainted with these young gentlemen? Old Chloris asked me. Most certainly, said I. They are related to the minister if they have come to substitute themselves for us. You couldn't have better hostages. They were discussing whether to set us at large or no when one of our captors spoke up this may be a trap whatever. I am against letting the women out of our hands. Why not keep them all? That means two hostages the more. To this the others agreed, and the fools for pursuant to the design of things. Virtue can lead nowhere but to folly. The stupid clods, the animals, shut us all inside the same room. The assured mesdames, said one of the minister's alleged relatives. We are here to help you. Those are our instructions two hours from now. The entire body of the Paris Policetto, which we belong, shall have the chateau surrounded. We shall protect you during the siege. We are well armed. Never fear. And were these people, finding they have been tricked, to decide to attempt anything against you, you shall be defended. My one fear, Claire will remark, is that these idiots wake up to the fact they have made a mistake in putting us all together. We shall be helpless if they separate us. Very well, said I much more at ease than I had been hitherto. We have simply to unite ourselves inseparably. What? Claire will declared. You who but a moment ago shuddered at the mention of a roughly similar distraction. Do you now dare broach the idea? Why, I've grown much calmer, I replied. And Claire will? These two lads are both very pretty to look upon. One of them, Polly by name, was in truth but twenty-three and he had the gentlest face, the most delicate features in the world, Seth. Other was probably two years older. His appearance was effeminate, but he was quite as handsome, and his prick was a veritable splendor. I am confident that these gentlemen are at our disposition, said Clarewell, whereupon we fell to kissing our champions and caressing them with such ardor that we were soon able to read consent in their expressions. Yes, Claire will resumed. Since they are so emphatically of our mind, this is how the thing should be gone about. Polly is going to f you. Juliet ill be served by La Roche when we're both incunted. Elvire will frig Mike with one hand. My asshole with the other montum will do the same to you. Both of them being within our f reach, our f will toy with them according to their fancy. You must not suppose that well lose by thus dividing our attentions. Not at all. Those attentions will be intensified. There's nothing like this arrangement to keep a prick in size. All voluptuous women would be well advised to employ. But let me proceed. Taking careful note of the sensations being experienced by our young studs, as soon as they observe them nearing discharge, Elvire and Montum will deftly snatch these pricks out of our cuts and transfer them into our asses in order that no f be spent other than their once both are discharged empty. Well, exchange man and woman. But you and I, proximately placed, will be concerned with ourselves, only we shall kiss each other. We shall tongue each other, my love. And the while. She added in a whisper, Well, watch these vile beings, these base drudges toiling to give us pleasure like so many slaves nature has created to be our tools, and whom we suffer to exist solely in the interest of our passions. Precisely, I rejoined. I do not understand how one can even hope to be aroused unless one holds that attitude. In the very next instant there the two of us are, sprawled on the bed, our skirts pulled up above the navel, legs flung wide. First of all, the tribades seize each an engine, these we ready, steer into position, then engulf with our panting cunts. If Clairewell was briskly f by La Roche, certainly I had no cause to complain of Polly, his member was not quite so thick as his colleagues, but it was of goodly length, and I felt it stab to the final depths of my womb. Frigged, meanwhile, in heavenly style by Montom, 
voluptuously kissed by my friend. We had each passed through nerve-rending crises when the piece of Lego domain so skillfully executed by Montom advised me of my young lover's impending age, and then my thirsty ass was flooded by streams of nectar-sweet spur. While it was pouring into me, the adroit Montalme probed three fingers into my lately vacated cunt and continued to rub my clothes throughout. A loud, shrill oath from my friend told me where matters stood with her. We were simultaneously whelmed by a third discharge, as once again abundantly into our entrails. Now, while well exchange, said Claire Will, try some La Roche while I take Polly. Both of them young, both vigorous. Our athletes recommenced their efforts without even asking to catch their breath, and I found myself being fucked by one of the most beautiful pricks imaginable. At that point, Claire Will, who had gone on kissing me, tonguing me uninterruptedly, ignoring everybody else, paused to murmur in my ear, I have something perfectly abominable in mind. Ah, by f said I, let's to work. What would you do? No, I want to surprise you, she said. Content yourself with knowing that this idea alone is flushing the way out of my loins. And there with joy smote the rascal her convulsions. Her thrashings would rather have chilled than gladdened her fu- had he been acquainted with their cause. Restored somewhat to her senses, still being f by Polly, she spoke to me again, again in an undertone I think I'd better explain it to you, else you won't be able to play your part in the thing. There is going to be fighting, we shall be attacked well resist. I propose that we ask these young men for weapons, and as thanks for all the services they've done for us, that we shoot them dead during the battle. Blame for these murders will be laid upon our enemies, and Saint Fond, further impressed by the dangers you've run, will probably reward you that much more liberally. Oh, thrice damned slut, was my reply, discharging like a wh as Claire will divulge this exciting scheme. It's good, good. What you advise? As I spoke, I oiled LaRoche's prick, and he, finding himself on the verge of another explosion, hastily decunted, burrowing into my bum at the same instant I discharged, which coincidence hurled me into transport such as I doubt my powers to describe. There being nothing, I affirm, absolutely nothing so delicious for a woman as to feel a prick penetrate her ass at the same instant she is overtaken by an or. A brief moment later, we heard gunfire outside. We all sprang up from the bed. They've come, says Clarewell. Give us pistols so that we can defend ourselves, my lads. Here you are, says Laroche. Each is loaded with three balls. Good, Clarewell replies and be sure they'll be soon lodged in somebody's heart. The noise mounts, shouts ring out in the chateau to arms. See to the priming, cries Laroche. You ladies had best group yourselves behind us. We can act as a shield for you. Things now began to happen very fast. Already driven back in the lower part of the chateau by the detachment sent from Paris, our captors raced up toward where we were, meaning to kill us before surrendering, but their assailants were hot on their heels. Our door was forced to pistol shots were deafening. Stationed behind our defenders, we chose this moment for ridding ourselves of the weight of gratitude. Two bodies lay in a welter of blood at our feet, and our were yet slimed with the f of the young men our iniquity slew. Their deaths were of course ascribed to our captors, the officers in charge of our detachment, lost little time revenging their murdered comrade. Old Chloris and the young ladies alone remained alive. They were packed into a coach, and, escorted by six of the policemen, were taken off to the Bastille. The rest of the police, having hitched the horses to our carriage, conducted us to my house, where I besought Claire Will to stay for supper. She agreed to do so. We scarce had seated ourselves in the drawing-room when my butler announced St. Font. I turned quickly to my friend. Shall we tell him about our little horror? No. She pursed her lips. You must always do whatever you want. You must never tell all you've done. The minister entered. We declared ourselves thankful for the measures he had taken in our behalf. He in his turn declared that he was very sorry indeed. A personal affair of his had caused us such inconvenience. 
Eight men were killed in the course of the thing. Perhaps ten. He informed us. Among them the two lads I sent to you. It's rather a pity about them. A pity? Claire will repeat it. How so? Oh, it'd been fun them both for quite a while, you know. Tush, she chided. Is this Saint Fond we hear expressing pity for objects his father? Merely regret at their loss. They were nimble boys, and wonderfully serviceable in my covert operations. Never mind. There are many pebbles on the beach, said I, showing Saint Fond to his chair at table. Let's forget about the slight harm that's been done, and talk instead about your successes. During the meal, the conversation, as usual, revolved around philosophical questions afterward. The minister having business to attend to, and we being exceedingly tired after a trying day. The company separated. At the supper held on the morrow, my unlucky Palmyre, fetched for the purpose to Paris from her dungeon in the country, was mercilessly sacrificed after enduring a thousand tortures, one more barbarous than the other. Saint Fond obliged me to strangle her while he gave her an ass. For Palmyre I got twenty-five thousand francs a lively description of my perilous captivity in the chateau, earned me twenty-five thousand more. The following two months were unattended by any event worth signaling. I just celebrated my eighteenth birthday when Saint Fond, visiting me at home one morning, told me he had been to see Madame de Clore's sisters at the Bastille they were both. He considered, far prettier than she whom we had butchered, and indeed the younger of the two, who was my age, struck him as positively lovely. So, my lord, I asked, shall it be a trip into the country? Yes, exactly, was his reply. And the old man? Oh, some spice in his soup, perhaps. As you like, but that will mean a loss of three prisoners at one stroke. And you realize that the warden depends entirely upon them for his livelihood. He won't go hungry. Replacements are easy to come by. I should like you to put one of Claire Will's relations first on the list. The creature in question has been playing the prude with our friend— to whose libertinage she has some strange objection. That leaves two vacancies to fill. I have candidates for them now. It'll give you their names in a week. It'll have the documents in order, said the minister. But one thing at a time. He drew out a memorandum book and penciled a note, gentlemen, lunch. Ladies outing. Whereupon he looked up at me and smiled. Off you go tomorrow, Juliet. Take Claire Will along. She's charming and for imaginativeness has no peer. Well, contrive something delicious. Shall you require men and try baits? No, I think not. Private scenes are sometimes preferable to orgies the narrower stage, is more favorable to meditation, more conducive to horrors. And in cosier surroundings one is less apt to be shocked. Two women to assist, at least. Two women well on in years find me a pair in their sixties. It's a caprice. I've been many times assured that nothing is quite so stimulating as natural decrepitude. This might be the occasion to try some of that. An hour later, I was in conference with Claire Will. I have only one suggestion to make, said she, after I had sketched the minister's project. Those young ladies doubtless have lovers. Favorites, at any rate, we must locate them. Make off with them and include them in the festivities these situations ordinarily afford any number of possibilities. I hasten to the minister's residence, report Claire Will's idea to him. It meets with his approval the date of the parties postponed a week, and a hunt for the lovers has got underway. The wicked treachery necessary for their discovery was sheer joy for St. Fun. He takes himself to the Bastille, has each of those girls cast into a cell, interrogates first one, then the other, causing them to tremble now with hope, now with fear, and sometimes with both at once, almost cunningly, he finally learns that the younger Mademoiselle Faustine is in love with a young man by the name of Dorman, of the same age as she and her sister, Mademoiselle Felicity, who is twenty-eight, has given her heart to one Delnos, a year or two, her senior and renowned throughout Paris for his good looks. Four days suffice to have these young men behind bars, the charges leveled against them were somewhat vague and altogether false, but because never seriously examined, more than sufficient in an age when the abuses of privilege and influence were such 
that even the valets of high-placed personages were in the habit of jailing just about whomever they liked. These latest victims lay but a night in the Bastille. They were conveyed the next to my country domain, whence the young ladies had been brought the previous day. Claire Will and I received our guests as they arrived and locked them away, but in separate chambers so that, though they were all lodged under the same roof, they could not suspect that they had their beloved for neighbor. After an enormous dinner, we removed to a drawing room where all stood in readiness for the projected execrations. Garbed as Roman matrons and making up switches, the two sexagenarians were awaiting orders. Saint Fond, impressed by Claire Will's magnificent ass, wished to render it homage before doing anything else. Resting upon a sofa, the hussy presented it to him in the most artistic manner. And while I sucked her clitoris, Saint Fond darted six inches or more of tongue into her entrails. By now, he is erected, he embuggers Clarewell, kissing my ass meanwhile the next instant he sodomizes me, as he does so caressing Clarewell's voluptuous behind. And now to work, says the minister. Any further delay will cost me a discharge. There's no resisting such asses as yours. St. Fond, Clarewell says, I have two boons to ask you. You have a notable capacity for cruelty. Pray exercise it to the full, my dear. That is my first request. The second is that you enable me to exercise mine in trust to me, the murder of these young men. Torturing males is still my favorite pastime. You enjoy tormenting persons of my sex? I am equally fond of making representatives of yours suffer. And from martyrizing these two pretty fellows, I expect to derive no less satisfaction, and possibly even more, than you will reap from massacring their two mistresses. Claire will... You are a monster. I know I am, my dear. And the one thing that mortifies me is to have to own myself outdone by you every day. St. Fond declaring his desire to see each of the four lovers in turn, one of the old attendants brought in Dorman, he whose mistress was Faustine. Young man, Clairo began, you are standing before your master. Therefore see to it that the most complete submissiveness characterizes your behavior and a most scrupulous truthfulness your replies it is in his lordship's hands that lies your life alas the unhappy one replied there is truly nothing that i have to say madame as to what i could have done to merit arrest i have not the faintest notion nor can i understand why i am become the victim of fate clairwill was devouring him with her eyes were you not to wed faustine my whole heart and soul were set on making mine the happiness of having her to be my wife. You know nothing of the dreadful affair her family was implicated in. In truth, madame, of her family, I know nothing but what was seemly and decent and virtuous could vice exist whence Faustine came. Bah, said I. He prates like a hero out of a novel. I shall always be a loyal friend to virtue. Youthful enthusiasm, therefore, Claire Will advanced, has proved the undoing of a good many persons like yourself. But we are here concerned with other matters. The object of this interview is to inform you that Faustine is in this house. The minister is disposed to enjoy her. He trusts you are disposed to cede her favors in exchange for which concession she will be pardoned, and so will you. I seek no pardon since I have done no wrong, was the young man's proud reply. But be it so a thousand lives hang in the balance, I do declare to you that ill not purchase one of them at the price of an atrocity whose mere mention is an insult. So be it. Ass, madame, give me ass, cried St. Fawn in a veritable lather. It's plain indeed well reach no understanding with this stubborn little scapegrace unless we use violence. At which Claire will and the two hags leaped upon the young man, and had him pinioned and naked in the twinkling of an eye. He was marched up to St. Fond, who spent a few minutes poring over a manass, than which there were few fairer in the world, and, gentlemen, as connoisseurs you know that in this article of the anatomy, you may often reveal yourselves our superiors. Ah, said Dorman, gazing about him in distress as he realized what infamies lay in store for him. Ah, I've been tricked. I am amongst monsters. 
Your surmise, sir, said Clarewell, is quite correct, and experience will soon confirm it. And after some preliminary abominations, I was requested to bring in Faustine. Beauty, shapeliness, sweet candor, all that invites, these she had in rare degree. And when she beheld the scene in the room, oh, how the modesty in her made her other qualities shine. Espying her lover, whom Clarewell and St. Fond were caressing industriously, the girl came near to fainting away. The easy, sweet angel, I said, taking her hand, be of good cheer, we're, f we're swimming in dirt and nastiness and joy. My dove like us, shamelessly, you're going to bear your wondrous ass, and you see it is not unpleasant. But what is all this? Oh, merciful heavens, where am I? Who are you? Your host is his lordship, the minister, your uncle and friend. Your case is in his hands. It is a difficult case, yea, a very grave case, however. Be patient, be considerate, and everything will come out well. And you, she said in a faltering voice, addressing Dorman, you have been capable. Oh, he murmured, casting down his eyes. Like you, I have had to submit to force. But, he went on, lifting his head, while this is the day of our dishonor, there may soon come another that shall see us revenged. Enough of this frightful comic opera rubbish, young man, reprimanded St. Fond, applying a vigorous thwack to the glib boy's bare hindquarters. Better employ your fiery eloquence to persuade Mademoiselle here to lend herself to my caprices, and they shan't be mild. She's going to be sore tried. Whereat tears began to flow from Faustine's glorious eyes. She uttered groans, cruel sing fond, prick in hand, approached and stared at her from close on. I suck, he exclaimed. Does she weep? It pleases me mightily to see women weep. With me, they always do. All of them. Cry away, my pretty little one. Cry your eyes out there. Let your tears splash on my member. But save some for later on. You'll shortly have the most legitimate grounds for shedding them. Nay, I shrink from telling how far his outrages went. One would have thought nothing so contented him as wounding innocence and insulting beauty in distress. The faint glow of pleasure we managed to kindle in the girl turned swiftly into chagrin toise, with his prick St. Fond dried a new spate of tears. Claire Will's main passion, as I have said, did not consist in vexing women, it was men, upon whom she preferred to expend her greatest cruelty, whereof nature had given her no small fun. However, though she might now and then refrain from inflicting pain, even upon a person of the opposite sex, she always relished watching others in action and, standing near Dorman, whom as a matter of fact she was frigging, with wicked curiosity, she observed all the outrages poor Faustine was being made to endure more. She suggested further ones. Well now, said St. Fond, we must unite those who were so soon to have been bound together in marital bliss. Far be it from me, he added, to deny this young gentleman, one of his pretty mistress, two maidenheads. Claire will dispose the male, ill prepare the female. I confess that I did not believe the enterprise could possibly succeed. Terror, grief, alarm. Tearson Fine. The two lovers were in a shocking state. Did it not exclude them from performing the act of love? One would have thought so. But now we were witness to a very prodigy. One of those miracles only nature can work her energy triumphed over all obstacles, and we beheld a rampant dormant for his mistress. Of the two, only she needed to be held only in her was pain predominant, forbidding her access to pleasure. And this despite all our efforts, we tried this. We tried that. We excited her, scolded her, caressed her. It availed not. Her soul lay beyond rescue, drowned in sorrow from her why. We got moans of despair and sobs only. Still, you know, I like her that way, said St. Fondive. 
never cared much about seeing pleasure's lineaments writ over a woman's countenance. They're too equivocal. Too unsure I prefer the signs of pain which are more dependable by far. By now blood has begun to flow. The deflowering is completed. Thus posed by Clarewell. Dorman was lying on his back. Faustine was astride him, her knees drawn out, her head bent low, her forehead resting on his shoulder, so that the pretty little girl's pretty ass was perfectly exposed. She is in an admirable position. See to it she doesn't move out of it. St. Fon told one of the crones she might as well lose both pucilages at the same time. I might as well sodomize her while she is being imcunted. Not only was the operation a stunning success, but, instead of sighs of ecstasy, it drew piercing screams from the girl whom never before had such a dart penetrated, and who seemed as though firmly set against enjoying the experience. Generally longed for. That makes a woman of the maid. While f the libertine fondled the hags I busied myself, sucking Claire Will's cunt. The prudent St. Fond, as ever sparing of his f kept the sluices tight closed, and we moved on to other voluptuous activities. Hear me, young man, said St. Fond. I am about to require something most extraordinary of you, and which I venture to suppose you will consider most barbarous. Be that as it may, your mistress is doomed unless you obey instructions. I am going to have your beloved secured to this column here. You will take this bundle of switches and with them you will flay her ass. Monster! Can you propose? Then you prefer to see her kill. Why must it be that I have no choice between this infamy and the loss of her whom I cherish above all others in the world? A hard alternative, surely, and such as the weak have every day to face, said I. You are helpless. Hence you must yield, do as you are bid, do it at once, or a dagger goes into your mistress' heart. The great art of St. Fond consisted in always placing his victims in such a situation, that of two evils they had inevitably to elect the one which more nicely suited his perfidious libertinage. Trembling, Dorma neither agrees nor refuses his silent speaks. Tis I who bind Faustine to the column. Great is my pleasure in pulling the rough cords painfully over her fair skin I love thus. To bear the throat of innocence to the edge of crimes, blade the malicious Claire Will kisses her, as I get her into readiness. What charms were here to expose, what perfections to spoil. Ah, when heaven comes not to the defense of the righteous and the good, it is in order to make us mortals comprehend that unto virtue only contempt is due. This is the proper way to take with you said the minister, striking sweeping blows upon the plump white buttocks that fairly beckoned to him. Yes, it is thus we must proceed. He continued, rattling off another ten, and the purple marks they left were already standing out in marvelous contrast to that silky smooth skin. Try your hand. Oh, sir, for the love of God, I could never. Nonsense, my boy. Of course you can. Threats follow sardonic cajolery. Clarewell loses her temper, swears that if he doesn't do as he's been told, which, says she, amounts to very little, he will get a thrashing himself and see the girl murdered into the bargain, whereupon Dorman sets to work. But how reluctantly, and how timidly, St. Fawn is obliged to guide his arm. At length my lover's patience runs out. He picks up a knife and raises it to Faustine's heaving breast Dorman lays on somewhat more energetically, then collapses in a swoon. Ah, fuck my soul, grumbles St. Fond. His prick as stiff as a monk's. We'll get nowhere so long as we rely upon a lover of his undertaking calls for villainy, and having furiously at the beauteous behind presented to him, in less than ten minutes he has it in a bloody shambles. In the meantime, another horror is being enacted nearby. Instead of succoring him, Claire Will is venting her savagery upon the unconscious doorman. The lout, the cad, says she, as he comes back to his senses to find himself bound hand and foot and receiving a drubbing quite as merciless as the one Faustine is getting from the minister. It was not long before the ill-starred lovers were both in the most deplorable state imaginable.
Not yet in a position to judge Clarewell, her cruelty. I must confess, startled me. But when I saw her turn to execrations of a very different kind, when I saw her daubing her cheeks with the victim's blood, tasting it, drinking it, when I saw her bite into his flesh and tear it away with her teeth, when I saw her rub her on the bleeding wounds she opened in the wretch, when I heard her cry, Juliet, come do as I am doing then, urged to it by this wild beast, carried away by her hideous example, my friends, must I own that I imitated her? Nay, the truth may well be that I surpassed her. I may even have led the way, stimulated her imagination by means of atrocities, which would not have occurred to her otherwise, perhaps. Who knows? For I waxed furious, too. My every nerve was afire. My very perverse soul revealed itself in its entirety, and I discovered that devouring the flesh of a man could have as powerful an effect upon my senses as lashing a woman to ribbons. St. Fawn deemed best to defer major operations until after the other couple had been dealt with. The first two were tied up and stowed in a corner. In came the second. Delnos and Felicity were subjected to the same treatment, except that the procedure was reversed. That is, instead of appealing to the lover to share his mistress, we appealed to the mistress for the use of her lover arguments, were again backed by threats of the worst sort, and as before we met with considerable resistance. Felicity was an exceedingly pretty thing of twenty, not quite so fair as her sister, but just as agreeably made, and her eyes were remarkably expressive. She gave evidence of more character, more energy than her sister, but Del knows of far less than Dorman. Howbeit, Directly after embuggering the second girl, our cannibal, despite himself, lost his seed in Delno's handsome ass while he was clawing Felicity's charming breasts. Now, quietly seated between Claire Will, busily Socratizing him, and me who was frigging him, and gazing ahead at the two couples, bound hand and foot, he consulted us over what the final fate of the victims ought to be. I was appointed to be the scourge of this family he said to us, fingering himself while he spoke three of its members lost their heads in this house. Two others I had slain in theirs. I am responsible for another's poisoning in the Bastille, and the chances that these four people will escape me look very slim indeed. You have no idea how I enjoy these little exercises in arithmetic. Tiberius, it is said, used to do his sums every evening. What would crime be without its sweet memories? Oh, Claire will. Whither are our passions leading us? Say, my angel, is thy mind clear enough? Hast thou perchance discharged enough to give me thy sagely framed opinion in this matter? No, by fuck, replied she. No, it's not talking I'm eager to do. What I want is to act. Vitriol blazing acid. Some hellish thing is flowing in my veins. My brain is sicko. Give me horrors. I must have horrors. Then let us commit them in abundance, for that sorts nicely with my mood also, said St. Fawn, these two couples arouse me. It passeth all belief, the evil I would do unto them. But as to the form it should take, there I am in some uncertainty. The doomed four were able to hear our conversation, were able to see we were plotting against them, and yet they clung to life. The awful wheel of Delcor's contriving stood within view. St. Fawn's brooding gaze lit upon it, and the thought of putting it to a little use soon lofted his prick skyward. Thereupon, after loudly and unequivocally explaining the properties of the infernal machine, the scoundrel declared that Blair, the two women should draw lots. Would that not be the fairest way to determine which of the two was to die in this manner? Claire will oppose the suggestion she took the line that, since St. Fawn had already employed the wheel upon a girl, he ought now to procure himself the pleasure of seeing a boy, subjected to it nor. Did she notice any advantage in allowing chance to decide between Delnos and Dorman? For as much as the latter struck her as by far the more eligible, he stimulated her imagination prodigiously. But St. Fond would brook no partiality, he pointed out, that the honor of being the first to die, and by such a torture, was preference enough. Lots are prepared the young men draw Dorman is the winner. 
It's quite as though I had heaven by the throat, for it's been a long time now since a single one of my wishes went unfulfilled, said Claire Will. The sole function of that execrable chimera you call the supreme being seems to be to facilitate my every crime. Embrace your intended, said my lover, as he untied some of Dorman's bonds, leaving intact those which secured his hands kiss her. My lad, and then show your metal shell have her eyes upon you throughout your ordeal. And if you care to glance at me during it, you'll see me fuck her ass, that I promise you. Then, as was his custom, he led the powerless young man off. They were encloseted for an hour together. We could only suppose that the libertine took this opportunity to impart some deep secret to his victim, to whom, as it were, he entrusted the mission of carrying it with him into the next world. What can be going on in there? Clarewell demanded, annoyed at having to wait and glancing impatiently at the door to the chamber. I have no idea, said I. But such is my eagerness to find out. I would be almost willing to sacrifice our relationship. Dorman emerged his flesh, showed signs of some cruel mauling, especially about his buttocks and thighs, which were cut and bruised upon his uplifted it. Brow rage and fear and pain were at war blood dripped from his and his scrotum, and his cheek scarlet revealed traces of several slaps. After him came Saint Fond, conspicuously erected the most atrocious savagery glinted in his every feature, in his twisted lips, his dilating nostrils, his wickedly narrowed eyes clutching one of his victim's buttocks. He steered him toward us. Come along, come along, said Claire Will visibly pleased at seeing Dorman in such beggarly condition. Come along, my little clown, let's waste no more time. Turning to St. Fond, we are short on men, the diabolical creature observed. I'm going to need no end of fun while I watch this rogue perish. His mistress could pollute you, the minister suggested, and I shall of course be embuggering you the whole time. And Miss Blythe? Oh, we're sure to be splashed a bit. Claire will sigh Dorman by both ears. Kiss me, little fool, while there's still something left of your pretty face. And Dorman showing no great alacrity to comply, the hussy wiped her asshole upon his nose. Then he was granted permission to kiss his mistress goodbye. She burst into tears. Claire will frig the white. The last was tickled by St. Fawn the matrons, finally catch hold of him and fasten him on the dread wheel. Faustine, sprawled atop Claire will, is obliged to frig her and at the same time Claire Will excites me. St. Fon sheathes his weapon in Faustine's bowels, and we are all four shortly bathing in blood. The spectacle is hideous, and it has not yet reached its term when the girl proves unable to endure any more smitten senseless by anguish she wilts. What's this? What's this? cries St. Fond. Would the big spire? I have no objection to her death, provided I am its cause. So saying... The villain looses his sperm into a mass whence life has fled already. Claire will, whose wicked hands are kneading down those balls, while I am stabbing that young man's buttocks with a long hatpin, is at last overwhelmed by the sight of Dorman on the wheel, and, uttering maniac, hardly human screams, discharges thrice. Now only Felicity and her young Bio are left. Ah, by f mutters St. Fond. That other bit was a great disappointment. But this one is going to be tortured. Properly and since it was the mistress watching the lover die a moment ago. Well have the lover watch the mistress now. He leads her away for private conference. Half an hour later he brings her back. And she is in a shocking state. She is condemned to impale him and St. Fond himself inserts the sharpened end of the stake into her ass. And after much thrusting and twisting the point. Emerges from the mouth. The other end of the stake is planted in a socket set in the floor, and Felicity remains on exhibit for the rest of the day. My friends, says Claire Will, you will be good enough to allow me to choose the torture for our last victim. I haven't changed my mind since first clapping eyes on him the bugger resembles Jesus Christ, and I would treat him in the same way. At this we all laughed. Merrily arrangements were completed during the interview. No detail was neglected. One of the hags gets down on all fours, we prop the text on her rump, 
The Story of the Passion of Marys. Bastard is located. I read out the chapter and verse aloud. The young man is already in bedraggled condition when he returns Claire Will, St. Fond, and the unoccupied hag. Take charge of him. He is affixed to the cross. And upon it, he suffers precisely. What that impudent little boar of Galilee endured at the hands of those wise Romans of old his side is gashed. He is crowned with thorns. He is given a vinegar-soaked sponge to suck. At length, remarking that Delnos is in no hurry to die, we institute improvements upon the classical ordeal. The patient is lifted off the cross, turned over, nailed on again, and every kind of horror is perpetrated upon his behind. We prick his buttocks, we sear them, and tear them into shreds by the time he finally expires. Delnos has gone mad. Claire Will and St. Fond, whom I have been frigging one on either hand, discharged copiously, and therewith ended infamies at which we had been twelve hours occupied. They were succeeded by the pleasures of the table. Claire Will was deeply curious to learn St. Fond's secret. She plied him with wine. She caressed and praised him till. He was quite giddy then. She put the question, What is it you do with your victims just prior to killing them? I announce their death to them. That's not all you do. There's more. We're convinced of it. No. That's all. There's more. We know there is. Perhaps. But it's merely one of my failings. Why force me to reveal it? Ought you to keep secrets from us? I asked my lover. In truth, it's no secret, said he. You hide it from us, however. Pray tell us what it is. What purpose would that serve? It would satisfy our curiosity, and we are the two best friends you have in the world. You are cruel women, said he, and he sighed. Don't you realize that I cannot make this confession without acknowledging a dreadful weakness in me, a veritably unavowable paltriness? You can afford to divulge it to us. We redoubled our pleas and flatteries, our caresses and seductions conquered, the minister waved us to our chairs and addressed us in this wise. Fierce and long has been my struggle against the shameful yoke of religion. My friends and I must confess to you today that I am yet its captive insofar as I still have hopes of a life after this. If it is true, I say to myself, that there are punishments and rewards in the next world, the victims of my wickedness will triumph. They will know bliss. This idea hurls me into deepest despond. Owing to my extreme barbarity, this idea is a very torture to me. Whenever I immolate an object, whether to my ambition or to my lubricity, my desire is to make its sufferings last beyond the unending immensity of ages such has been my desire, and had been for a long time when I broached it to a famous libertine, whom I was greatly attached to in days bygone and whose tastes were the same as mine. He was a man of vast knowledge. His attainments in alchemy and astrology were especially noteworthy. He assured me that I was very correct indeed in my suspicion that there are punishments and rewards to come and that, in order to bar the victim from celestial joys, it is necessary to have him sign a pact, writ in his heart's blood, whereby he contracts his soul. To the devil next to insert this paper in his asshole, and to tamp at home with one's prick and while doing so to cause him to suffer the greatest pain in one's power to inflict. Observe these measures, my friend assured me, and no individual you destroy will enter into heaven. His agonies, in kind identical to those you make him endure while burying the pact, shall be everlasting, and ow. Yours will be the unspeakable delight of prolonging them beyond the limits of eternity, if eternity there be. And so that is what you do to your victims. Softly, Claire Will, berata me not. You wanted nothing so much as to learn the truth. It is a weakness you wheedled me into disclosing. I am not proud of it. No, nor should you be. Why, Saint Fond, I am amazed. I thought you were a philosopher. You have a mind, do you not? Then how can you, for a single instant, accept the absurd claptrap about the immortality of the soul? For is it not so, 
This disgusting religious fantasy must first be accepted before you begin to believe in the rewards and punishments of an afterlife. As for your intention, I applaud it. It is delicious, Clairwell continued. It accords with my own attitudes, too. One to prolong forever the sufferings of the person you send to his doom, that is a desire which does you credit. But to base it all upon nonsense, upon extravagance, no, Saint Fond, that will not do. That is quite unpardonable. Clarewell, do you not understand that my divine hope must fade away unless founded upon such an opinion as I entertain? I do very well understand, my good man, that if you have to edify your divine hopes upon fables, it would be better to give them up. For the day may come when the harm belief in fables has done. You will prove to outweigh the pleasures you have received therefrom. Come, come. Saint Fondy, content with the evil you can work in this world, and abandon your foolish schemes for perpetuating it forever. Saint Fond, there is no afterlife, said I at this point, recollecting the philosophical tenets which had been very early inculcated in me. The sole authority vouching for that illusion is so. The imagination of those men who, dreaming it up and clinging to it, merely express their desire to find later on a more durable and purer happiness than what is our portion on earth. Ah, is it not a pitiful absurdity? First of all, to invent for oneself a god, then to believe that this god holds torments without end in store for the majority of humankind. Thus it is, after rendering mortals miserable in this world, religion shows them a weird deity, the fruit of their credulousness or their navish cunning, a deity, I say, who's very apt to render them more miserable still in the world to come. I know how they quibble this god's justice is horrible. But this god is merciful also, but a mercifulness which leaves room for appalling cruelty is far from infinite neither is it reliable after having been infinitely good. He becomes infinitely wicked. And is this what you call an immutable god? A god overflowing vindictiveness and fury? Is this the sort of entity to whom you ascribe one jot of clemency or kindliness? To judge from the notions expounded by theologians, one must conclude that God created most men simply with a view to crowding hell. Would it not have been more conforming to honesty, to goodness, to common sense and decency, to have created stones and why? Plants and gone no farther. Instead of creating men whose behavior would bring unending calamity down on their heads. A God so perfidious, so evil as to create a single man, and then to leave him exposed to the peril of damning himself. Such a god can be regarded as no specimen of excellence. If perfection be his, then it is a monster of unreason, injustice, malice, and foul atrocity. Nay, very far from composing a perfect god, theology's adepts form the most loathsome Tamira, and when to this abominable god, they ascribed the invention of eternal penalties. They but added the final touch to an artifact that was hateful from the start. The cruelty that makes for our pleasure has at least its purposes and hence its justification this latter is accessible to the reason. We understand it, but what motive has God for torturing the victims of his wrath? Has he rivals? Is he threatened? No, those he packs off to hellfire were able neither to contest his power nor trouble his felicity. Let me add that the tortures of the life after this would be of no use to the living who cannot witness them. They would be of no use to the damned, since there are no new leaves turned over in it. Hell whence it follows that in the exercise of his eternal vengeance, God's sole aim is to enjoy himself, and having exploited his creatures' frailties, to make the most of their helplessness and your infamous God, acting more cruelly than any mortal, and without any motive a man might have, in so doing shows himself infinitely a traitor, infinitely a cheat, and infinitely a villain. I think we may go farther, said Clarewell. If that is agreeable to you, I shall attempt a more detailed analysis of this pernicious and gloomy hell dogma. I am confident that by the time I am done, 
our friend shall have abandoned every bit of his faith in this pathetic, onerous superstition. Will you lend me your ears? Certainly, said we. And then it was as follows that the subtle and erudite Clarewell addressed herself to this solemn question. There are certain dogmas which one is sometimes obliged not to accept, but to posit hypothetically for the purpose of combating others. My aim, you know, and you will allow that it is worthy to obliterate the idiotic dogma of hell out of your apprehension. I trust you will not take it amiss if, with this end in view, and for the time being, I reinstate the deistic chimera. Bound to employ it as point of departure in this important dissertation, I am forced temporarily to ascribe substance to the myth. This is regrettable, but I am sure you will excuse it, and excuse it all the more readily knowing, as you do, that as regards belief in this abominable phantom, I am above suspicion. In itself, the dogma of hell is, I own, so devoid of probability. All the arguments customarily advanced in its support are so weak, so transparent in such manifest contradiction with reason, that one almost blushes at having to counter them. Never mind. Let us ruthlessly deprive the Christians even of the hope of fettering us anew at the feet of their atrocious confession, and let us very plainly show them that the dogma they count upon most heavily to affright us vanishes, like all their other ghosts and goblins, at the mere approach of philosophy's rational light. The primary arguments in the case they make out for their baneful fairy tale are these. One that sin being infinite by virtue of the fact sin is offensive to God. The sinner merits infinite punishment. That the Almighty having decreed the laws, it behooves His mightiness to punish those who transgress them. Two, the universality of this doctrine and the manner in which we find it enunciated in scriptures. Three, the high need for such a dogma, lacking which there would be no restraining sinners and the incredulous. The whole edifice sits on those foundations, now let us demolish them. Taking them in the above order, we begin with the first it, I have no doubt but that you will concur, is exploded by the glaring disproportion between the human provocation and the divine reprisal. We observe that according to this doctrine the pettiest fault is to be punished as severely as the gravest now, presuming our God just, for so he is accounted. How can we admit such iniquity? Who created man, anyhow? Who gave him the passions and the penchants which the torments of hell are to punish him for having? Who else but your God? And thus, half-witted Christians, you are disposed to imagine this preposterous God endowing man with impulses one minute, and being compelled the next to chasten man, for having acted upon them. But was it that God did not know what he was doing? Is it a blind, incompetent fool you worship? Did he not know that man, endowed by him with the power to misbehave, would outrage him inevitably? If God knew, then why did he not otherwise endow man? And if he did not know, then why does he punish defective man when he, the Maker, is alone to blame? I think it is only too obvious that under the conditions alleged to be necessary to salvation, we are far more likely to be damned than saved. So tell me then, is this your God so loudly vaunted justice to have placed his puny, miserable masterpiece in such an abominable position? And this being the system, how dare your doctors assert that eternal happiness and eternal unhappiness are presented to man to choose between, and that his destiny depends on his option alone? If it comes out that the fate of the greater share of mankind is to be eternally unhappy, an all-knowing God must have known this from the outset, why then did the monster create us? Was he forced to? Then he is not free. Did he knowingly? Deliberately? cause things so to be, then he is a fiend. No, God was under no obligation to create man. Certainly not. And if he did so simply to expose man to such a fate, the propagation of our species therewith becomes the foulest of all crimes, and nothing would be more desirable than the total extinction of humankind. If, however, you esteem this dogma necessary to the greatness of God, I must ask you why this God, so great, 
and so good. Failed to give man the capacities he would need in order to avoid the torture awaiting perhaps nine out of ten human beings. Is it not, to say the least, cruel on God's part, to allow man opportunities and an appetite for dooming himself eternally? And however are you to exonerate your God from a charge either of ignorance or of wickedness? The one is criminal as the other. If all men are equal in the eyes of the divinity who made them, why are they not all in agreement as to the particular crimes which are to cost man this everlasting suffering? Why does the Hottentot damn you for something which, if you are a Chinaman, sees you into paradise? And how is it, pray tell, that the latter will promise you a place in heaven for what lands the Christian in hell? Endless would be the task of listing the various opinions of pagans, Jews, Mohammedans, Christians, concerning the means to employ to escape eternal woe, and to attain felicity endless the task, and yet more cheerless, of describing the puerile and ridiculous formulas and devices invented to these ends. But we shall proceed to examine the second of the foundations they have endeavored to construct for this grotesque doctrine, its peculiar enunciation as shown in the writ, and its universal character. We ought to preface our remarks with a reminder to ourselves. Let us beware of taking the universality of any belief for a title in its favor. There is not one idiocy, not one form of madness, that has not enjoyed a general currency and mode not one that has wanted for adherence any more than for exponents so long as there are men on earth there will be fools and so long as there are fools there will be gods cults a heaven a hell etc but scripture contains it all in black and white you tell me we shall for a moment suppose that the texts so called have some authenticity and that they truly merit some respect I think I have already pointed out that to attain a position from which one can blast certain absurdities one may have to play lip service to certain others. Very well. My reply, to begin with, is that there are strong grounds for doubting whether Scripture mentions this doctrine at all. Supposing nevertheless that it does, what Scripture says can be addressed to none but those who are familiar with these writings, and acknowledge them as infallible those who have no acquaintance of them or who refuse to believe them, cannot be convinced by their authority, however. Is it not maintained that they who have no acquaintance of this scripture, or they who do not believe it, are subject to eternal punishment, just as are those others who are acquainted with scripture, or who believe it? What say you? Is not this dreadful injustice? Perhaps you'll say that some races or nations to whom your nonsensical sacred literature was completely unknown had no lack of belief in a future life made up of eternal suffering. This may be true of some people's many others, however, had no knowledge of these dogmas. But precisely how were such opinions able to make their way into the heads of a people unacquainted with the Bible? I trust nobody will tell me that we are here dealing with innate ideas for. In that case, we would find these opinions in all men everywhere. Nor do I fancy anybody will maintain that they naturally stem from the human reason, for surely his reason is not apt to advise man that he will suffer infinite punishment for finite wrongs. Nor is revelation the answer, since the people in our example know nothing of that. To what, then, must we ascribe the existence of this dogma? among this particular people, either to the people's fancy or to the plotting of its priests, these being the sources of the superstition. How can you allow it any substance? Were you to conjecture that, there where we find no scripture, belief in eternal punishment has been handed down by tradition? I should have to ask where they got it from who spread the word originally, and if you are unable to prove that they received it through divine revelation. You shall have to agree with me that this tremendous opinion must have arisen out of some disease of the imagination, or some piece of roguery. Supposing now that scripture, allegedly holy, informs men of punishments in a future life, and supposing that this announcement is in no sense a false alarm, might one not wonder how the authors of scripture could know that such punishments did in actual fact exist? The unfailing reply is, of course, that they were inspired splendid, but those who have not been favored by this special illumination have therefore had to take the word of others for it, 
Pray tell me, if you please, what confidence should one have in persons who concerning a fact of such importance declare to you? I believe it is true because so-and-so told me he dreamt it. And lo, there it stands before you, that's what haunts and preoccupies, and what frightens and debilitates half the human race, that's what prevents one man out of two from hearkening to nature's sweetest promptings. Is it possible to be more mistaken, to tumble more needlessly into error? But your inspired ones did not get in touch with everybody. The vast majority of mankind knows nothing about their reveries. It is, is it not, to the vital interest, not only of the men who wrote the Bible and their adherents, but of all men to be apprised of this dogma. Then why is it that some, nay many, whole multitudes, have been left in the dark? This matter of eternal punishments being the concern of all. Thorough and definitive information thereupon would have been of advantage to all. Why, then, did God not impart this sublime knowledge directly and immediately to everyone, without the help and participation of individuals who may be suspected of fraud or insanity? To have positively done the very contrary. Is this, I ask you, the behavior of a being whom you would have me believe infinitely wise and good. Does not such conduct rather show all the attributes of stupidity and wickedness? Whenever laws are made in a state, does not every government bring them to the attention of the public and employ every possible means to make generally known what penalties will be incurred by violation of them? Provided you are rational, how can you punish a man for breaking a law he has never even heard of? And what now? In the face of all these truths, must our conclusion be this that the institution of a hell has never been anything but the result of the malicious lucubrations of some men, and the unqualifiable folly of a great many others? 12. The third of these arguments proposed in favor of this frightful dogma is its indispensability without it. There would be no holding sinners and unbelievers in check. If you would have me grant you that because of his justice and glory God were required to punish sinners and unbelievers with eternal tortures, I ask you to grant me, in return, that reason and justice would also require that it be within the power of others not to be unbelievers now. What person can possibly be absurd enough to suppose that man is free? Who can be blind to the point of not seeing that our will, having nothing to do with any of our actions, all our actions being determined for us, we are responsible for none. Of them and that God who manipulates us puppets would be if we suppose that he exists, which, as you doubtless notice, I do with loathing this God. I say, would be beyond words unjust and barbaric if he punished us for helplessly and despite ourselves becoming caught in the snares he first lays and then takes pleasure driving us into. And so is it not clear that it is the temperament nature gives to humans, the various circumstances in the life of each individual, his education, the society he lives amidst, which determine his behavior and steer him in the direction of good or evil. But you may perhaps object if this be the case, the punishments which men are made to undergo in this world for their misdeeds are likewise unjust. They most certainly are. But here the general welfare prevails. Individual welfare must cede thereto. It is the duty of every society to eliminate from its midst such elements whose conduct may be prejudicial to the community, and this justifies a quantity of laws which, when viewed alone from the standpoint of the individual's self-interest, might appear monstrously unjust. But does your God have any comparable reasons for punishing the evildoer? Obviously not God Almighty suffers not one whit from the evildoer's rampages. And if the wicked man is wicked at all, it is because omnipotent God was pleased to create him thus. Hence it is atrocious to inflict tortures upon him for having become on earth. The evildoer this execrable God knew full well he would become, and indeed intended him to become. Let us now demonstrate that the circumstances which decide which religious belief a man will have are utterly outside his control. I ask, to begin with, whether we are allowed to exercise any choice as to the clime we are born in, and whether, once born into this or that church, 
It is our fault if we happen to lack the capacity for faith. Is there a single religion which can withstand a fire of the passions? And are not passions which come to us from God preferable to religions which come to us from man? What then is one to think of this barbaric God who would punish us eternally for our metaphysical doubtings way, who cannot believe, owing to the belief-destroying passions God put in us? It is a sordid joke. From start to finish, it is all unutterable nonsense. And how one resents wasting one's time refuting such transparent absurdities. However, since we have taken it upon ourselves, let us make a thorough job of it, and if possible, leave the lunatic partisans of this most ridiculous dogma, not one leg to stand on. Therefore, we continue. Even were it left to every man to decide for himself whether he will or will not, be virtuous, and believe in all the articles of his specific religion, even were this so. We would still have to inquire, if it were equitable, that men be punished eternally, whether because of his weakness or their incredulity, when it is only too apparent that no good can result from their gratuitous sufferings. To settle this question we must put our prejudices aside, and reflect above all, upon the justness we acknowledge in God. Is it not the height of illogicality to contend that this God's justice demands the eternal punishing of sinners and unbelievers? Does not the act of imposing a punishment out of all proportion to the fault speak far more in behalf of vindictiveness and cruelty than of justice? To maintain that God punishes in such a manner is obviously nothing short of blasphemy. What? This God you depict as so good, will you have him express his goodness in bullying and brutalizing his defenseless children? Most assuredly, they who declare that God's glory requires that he behave like a savage are not fully aware of the enormity of this doctrine. They talk about the glory of God very idly. They know not whereof they speak. Were they able to judge a little of its nature? Were they able to arrive at some rational conception of it? They would sense that if this being does indeed exist, he would have to found his glory not upon his capacities for violence, but upon his generosity and kindness, upon his wisdom and his boundless power to communicate happiness to mankind. Why? It is added in passing with a view to confirming the odious doctrine of punishments everlasting, that it has been espoused by a great many intelligent men and learned theologians. I deny the fact most intelligent men and learned theologians have doubted this dogma. And if the rest have appeared to credit it, we can readily guess why the priests, who already held the people in bondage, were delighted to clap this iron collar of a hell dogma around. Their necks we are familiar with the sway terror can exert over simple souls, and everyone knows that the politician who wishes to subjugate others cannot do so without employing it. But those purportedly holy books you cite to me, do they come from a source so pure that it is beyond our power to reject what they offer us? The speediest perusal of these texts suffices to convince us that far indeed, from being, as we are brazenly told, the work of an illusory god who never wrote, a word nor uttered one either. They are, to the contrary, merely the scribblings of weak-minded and ignorant men, and they deserve our mistrust, nay, our scorn. But even were we to suppose, in defiance of all the evidence, that these writers were not completely devoid of common sense, bah, what sort of a fool would he be, pray tell me, who was able to wax ecstatic over this or that opinion, simply because head come upon it in some book or other? One may adopt an opinion, that is permissible, but to sacrifice one's life's happiness and peace of mind to it this, I repeat, only a madman is capable of doing. Thirteen furthermore, do you tell me that the Bible's contents bear out the hell opinion? And I in my turn will quote you passages from the same book disproving it. I open Ecclesiastes here is what I see. I said in mine heart concerning the estate of the sons of men that God might manifest them, and that they might see that they themselves are beasts. For that which befalleth the sons of men befalleth beasts, even one thing befalleth them as the one dieth.
so deeth the other yea. They have all one breath, so that a man hath no preeminence above a beast for all is vanity. All go unto one place, all are of the dust, and all turn to dust again. 14. What could be less favorable to the theory of an afterlife than these lines? What could be of greater encouragement to the view that denies the immortality of the soul and contests the whole ridiculous dogma of a hell? And so, what are the thoughts of the sane individual as he peers critically at this absurd fable of man's eternal damnation for having eaten of forbidden fruit in paradise? However inconsequential this little tale, however repulsive one finds it, permit me to dwell upon it for a moment, since it is the point of departure for an argument that conducts one to a hell of eternal sufferings. Is not an impartial examination of this absurdity quite enough to convince one of its inexistence? Oh, my friends, answer would someone full of loving kindness plant in his garden a tree which produces delicious but poisonous fruit, and would he be content to warn his children not to touch it, telling them they will die if they eat thereof? Were he aware of such a tree growing in his garden, would not this thoughtful and wise father proceed without delay to chop it down, and all the more surely take this precaution in the knowledge that from eating its dread fruit his children must perish and precipitate all ensuing generations into irreparable misery. But the tale reads otherwise God knows that man shall doom himself and his posterity. If he bites into the apple, not only does God endow man with the capacity to yield to temptation, his wickedness does not stop short of arranging man's seduction. Man succumbs. He is lost, he does what God has enabled him to do. What God has invited and pushed him into doing, and behold him now, fallen, cursed forever. I call this cruelty and viciousness without parallel. No, I repeat, I would have spared you the recital of this dismal anecdote. I would have disdained to include it in my disquisition were, it not for the fact that the hell dogma, whereof I wish to leave not one vestige intact, is one of its more sinister consequences. We may consider all this as so much allegory, fit to provide us a moment or two of diversion, but not fit for our belief, and of which mention ought to be. Forbidden, save as one speaks of Aesop's fables and Milton's gross fantasies for the latter, are of slight importance, whereas biblical incantation, seeking to engross our faith, to spoil our pleasures, becomes something of the most evident danger and ought to be suppressed ruthlessly until we need bother with it no more. So let us be well persuaded that such facts as those which are entered in the tedious romance, known under the title of the Holy Writ, are mere abominable falsehoods, worthy of utter contempt only, and without the faintest consequence, as regards our weal or woe. Let us be further persuaded that the dogma of the immortality of the soul that had first to be propounded before this soul could be rewarded with eternal bliss or damned to eternal torments is the most blatant, the most arrant, the crudest, and the clumsiest of all possible lies. Let us realize that when we die, all of us dies, as it is with other animals and that whatever the conduct we have observed in the world, we shan't be any the more or less happy for it after we have sojourned there, for the longer or shorter period nature is pleased to allot us. It has been asserted that belief in eternal punishments is absolutely necessary if human beings are to be kept in check, and that we must therefore take utmost care to preserve and promote it. But if it becomes evident that this doctrine is false, if it fails completely to withstand scrutiny, Will you not agree that there is infinitely more danger than usefulness in employing it as the buttress for your ethics? And may we not wager that it will prove of more harm than good once it has been set before the individual and he, correctly appraising it, dismisses it for the fiction it is, and flings himself carefree into a vildoing? Is it not a thousand times better not to impose any restraints upon him at all than that there be a one which he can ignore and flout so easily? In the former case, the idea for doing evil may perhaps not occur to him, but it certainly will when it occurs to him to break the restraint, for in the breaking thereof a further 
Pleasure exists, and such is the perversity in man that he never so cherishes an evil, never so eagerly, so gladly performs it, as when he fancies himself somehow hindered from doing it. They who have pondered upon the nature of man will be forced to agree that all perils, all ills, however great they may be, dwindle with distance and appear less dreadful than minor dangers when these are close at hand. It is obvious that the threat of immediate punishment is much more effective, much more apt to deter the would-be criminal than that of punishments to come. As for misdeeds that lie outside the scope of the law, are not men far more effectively deterred from them by considerations of health, decency, reputation, and other such mundane considerations as are apparent at the moment than by the dread of future and unending woes which seldom enter the mind, or which, when they do, are always vaguely shaved, dimly perceived, and reckoned easy to avoid? In order to judge whether the fear of eternal and rigorous punishments in the next world is more likely to deter men from evil than is that of temporal and imminent punishments in this world, let us for a moment suppose that the first of these fears subsisting universally, the second were entirely removed. Would we not perceive the world suddenly flooded with crimes? Now let us imagine the opposite. Let us suppose the fear of eternal punishments abruptly done away with and the fear of immediate, palpable punishments remaining in full force. While we saw these punishments being meted out unfailingly everywhere, would we not also notice that they were making a much deeper impression upon the minds of men and were having a much greater influence upon their behavior than the remote punishments of the future, which one forgets all about as soon as the passions start asserting themselves? Daily experience furnishes us, does it not, plentiful and convincing proof of the slight effect, the slight fear of punishments in the next world has upon those very persons who believe most staunchly in them. The dogma of eternal sufferings has had particular success with the Spanish, the Portuguese, and the Italians are there any more dissolute peoples. Where does one find more secret crimes committed than among priests and monks, that is, among those who you would think were thoroughly penetrated with religious truths? Indubitable evidence, this, that the good effects produced by the eternal punishment's dogma are very rare and very uncertain. We are about to see that its ill effects are innumerable and definite. Such a doctrine, inevitably filling the soul with bitterness, cannot help but fill the mind with images showing the divinity in the worst light it is hardens the heart and hurls it into a despair most disadvantageous to the divinity, belief in whom you mean to bolster by means of this doctrine. Quite the contrary, this frightful dogma fosters atheism, impiety, every right-thinking and decent person, finding it a great deal simpler and more convenient not to believe in God at all, rather than acknowledge one so cruel, so inconsistent, so barbaric as to have created men solely in order to sink them in perpetual misfortune, grief, and anguish. If you insist upon having God as the basis for your religion, at least endeavor to compose a flawless God, for if he is riddled with defects, as yours is, the religion based upon him will soon come into disrepute, and you will discover Juve spoiled each ingredient by unskillful blending of the two. Do you really suppose it is possible that a religion can be believed for long, respected for long, when it is founded upon belief in a God who, according to the rules of the game, must punish a huge and infinite number of his creatures for behavior to which that God put them up? Any man who accredits such an arrangement must necessarily live in constant fear of the being who has the power to make him eternally wretched with that understood. How can he ever love or respect such a being? Were a son to imagine his father capable of condemning him to such cruel tortures or of not wishing to spare him these sufferings if the matter lay in his hands, would that son feel much respect or love for that father? Are not the creatures God has made entitled to expect still more by way of kindness from him than made children from even the most indulgent father? Is it not men's belief that all the good things of this world are theirs through the goodness of their God, that this God is their guide and protector. T. 
tis he who will later procure them the happiness whereof. They are in hope are not all these the assumptions which serve as foundation to a religion. And if you blast them, goodbye religion, whence you see that your idiotic held dogma wrecks instead of consolidates, that it loosens the underpinnings of a the cult instead of tightening them, and that, as a consequence, only dolts have ever been able to believe something only knaves could have invented. No question about it, this being, concerning whom there is so much unending chatter, is sullied, dishonored by the ridiculous colors his portraitists. Habitually employed, did they not entertain senseless and incoherent ideas of the divinity? They did not represent him as cruel, and did they not think him cruel? They did not fancy him capable of punishing them by infinite torments, or even able to consent that man be deprived eternally of happiness. To elude the force of this argument, partisans of the dogma of eternal damnation affirm that the sore affliction of the reprobate is not arbitrary punishment on God's part, but a consequence of sin and the immutable order of things. M.D.? Who told you so? If you claim this to be a teaching out of scripture, you'll have an awkward time proving it, and if you manage to happen across a single passage where there is some allusion to the matter, oh, the lengths to which you shall have to go in order to convince me of the authenticity, the accuracy, the holiness of these few lines, which look to you as though they read in your favor, were they your rational faculties which suggested this atrocious dogma to you? In that case, tell me how you manage to conciliate reason with the injustice of a god who confections a creature, all the time knowing full well that the ironclad, immutable shape and design of things is such as will for a certainty forever sink him in an ocean of unremitting woes. If it is true that the universe is created and ruled over by a being infinitely powerful, infinitely wise, then everything must necessarily pass in conformance to his will coincide with his aims, and conspire to the well-being of all that dwells therein. Now, in what way does it further the advantage of the universe that a frail and miserable and helpless creature undergo eternal torture as a punishment for errors he never committed of his own free will? If the vast host of sinners and infidels and unbelievers were really destined to suffer cruel and perpetual torments, what a horrible prospect for mankind. Billions of human beings mercilessly condemned to agonies without end were it so. Indeed, then the lot of man, this thinking and sensitive being, would be truly hideous. For is there not grief and sorrow enough he must face in this life, that he must expect more pain and worse anguish when his career on earth is done? Why horror! Oh, tis execrable! However can such ideas make their way into the human mind? How is one to avoid the conviction that where they are in currency, there lurk imposture, lies, and barbarous politics? Ah! Let us be ever more firmly aware that this doctrine, neither useful nor necessary, and utterly ineffectual as a means for dissuading men from evil, can be made into the basis. For one and only one kind of religion, that whose sole purpose is to keep slaves at heel. Let us clearly understand that the unvarying consequences of this abominable dogma are sinister and unwholesome in the extreme, since it is capable only of transforming life into a nightmare of bitterness, horrors, tears, and alarms, and breeds, such notions of the divinity that... Save he be paralyzed totally and undone, the individual has no choice but to curse God, and a faith wherein belief is tantamount to final degradation. 15. Assuredly, if we believe the universe created and governed by a being whose might, wisdom, and goodness are infinite, we are obliged to conclude that all evil must necessarily be excluded from this universe well, you will not gainsay that the eternal unhappiness of most of the individuals embraced in the human species would constitute a positive and absolute evil. Why? What an infamous role you give your infamous God to play by supposing him guilty of such barbarity. To be brief, eternal torturings combine very ill 
with the infinite goodness of the God you have in mind, so either cease trying to make me believe therein, or get rid of your savage dogma of sufferings everlasting. Do one or the other if you seriously wish to see me adopt your God for a single instant. Rejecting the dogma of hell, we may likewise dismiss the other of paradise. Both are the wicked inventions of theological despots who, by terrorizing men's minds, strove to ensure their obedience to sovereigns. Let us be assured of it that we are made of matter only, that what is immaterial is inexistent, that all we attribute to the soul is all simply the effect of matter, and this in spite of our human pride, which causes us to stress the distinction between ourselves and brute beasts, however it be that, like beasts, we yield up to the dust, the dust whereof we are made, and when dead shall be no more punished than they for the bad deeds which the kind of organization we have received from nature has induced us to commit, nor more rewarded for the good deeds we perform, simply because we have been otherwise structured. And so, as regards the fate awaiting you after this life, whether you conduct yourself well or ill, it amounts to the same. And if we shall have succeeded in passing every single instant of the term allotted us amidst pleasures, even though this manner of existence may have been unruly, may have caused disturbance to everybody about us, have gone counter to every social convention, if, I say, we shall have shielded ourselves from the lawn. This is incumbent upon us. It is the one essential thing most assuredly. Most certainly we shall have done far better, been far happier than the fool who, from awful dread of punishments in an afterlife, has in this one rigorously eschewed everything which might have gladdened and afforded him delectation for it, is of infinitely greater importance to achieve happiness in this life whereof we are sure, than to forego the indisputable joys offered us here and now in the hope of acceding to imaginary ones of which we have not, and cannot possibly have, the faintest idea. Eh, he must have been a prodigiously droll fellow. He who attempted to persuade men that they may become unhappier when dead than they were before they were born. Has anyone ever asked to enter into this world? Do men endow themselves with the passions which, according to your gruesome creed, hurl them into eternal woes in the next world? Why no? Not at all. None of this is the individual's doing. It is all done to him. If fault there be, it is not his. And it is unthinkable. It is fantastic. It is false that he can be punished, therefore. But have we not to cast a glance at our miserable species to ascertain that there is no hint here of immortality? What? This divine quality, or let us rather say, this quality which cannot possibly exist in matter. Am I to understand that any such thing could belong to this animal we call man? He who feeds, drinks, and reproduces like beasts, whose superiority over them resides in a somewhat more refined instinct, this creature is able to expect a fate so unlike any of those same beasts, who will accept such nonsense for a minute. But hold, they protest, man has achieved the sublime awareness of his god. This in itself betokens worthiness of the immortality he dreams of. Ah, and what is so sublime about this awareness of a spook, unless you wish to imply that because man has carried his ravings over a particular subject to their final conclusion, he must now rave in connection with everything else? Oh, poor wretch! If thou hast some advantage over animals, how many are their advantages over thee? Art thou not susceptible to a hundred times as many infirmities or diseases? Art thou not the victim of a hundred times as many passions? Weigh it up and tell me whether, in the overall, man is really better off than the beast. Do you find that the scales still tip in his favor? And this slight advantage you accord him, is it so great as to warrant his proud notion that he is due eternally to outlive his four-footed brethren? Oh, pitiful humanity! Look to what lengths of folly thou hast been urged by thine inflated self-esteem, and when thou shalt make riddance of all these chimeras which obstruct thy view, shalt not thou see thyself as no more than a beast, 
thy god as merely the nay plus ultra of human extravagance, and this life but a road passing from naught to naught, and which thou mayest travel as thou wilt, in vice as confidently as in virtue. But with your leave I shall deepen the discussion and enter more thoroughly into the knotty questions confronting us now. Certain church fathers maintain that Jesus descended into hell. How often this contention has been attacked and refuted. We shall not catalogue and inspect severally the various theses which have treated of this subject. The um philosophical spirit and we address ourselves to no other would very probably make short work of them. The facts are these neither scripture nor any of its commentaries is positively decided, either upon the specific whereabouts of hell or upon the precise tortures you undergo there. This being granted, we next find that the word of God clarifies nothing, whereas the teaching of Scripture, we all agree, ought to be plainly and distinctly set forth, above all as regards a matter of such high consequence. However, research fails to discover either in the Hebrew text or in the Greek and Latin versions. A single word designating hell in its traditionally, or still currently accepted meaning that is, a place reserved for the torture of sinners. Is this not very telling evidence against the soundness of the opinion held by those who maintain that these tortures really exist? If scripture omits any mention of hell, by what right, pray tell, do they presume to entertain such a notion? Are we bound? in religious questions, to believe anything over and beyond what is written. Well, if this opinion appears nowhere in writing, in pursuance of what are we to adopt it? It does not beseem us to trouble our minds about what has not been revealed, and whatever has not been we cannot legitimately regard as other than fable, vague supposition, human tradition, impostures, invention. Scholarship discloses nevertheless that near Jerusalem there was a locality known as the Valley of Gehenna, where criminals were put to death and into which the corpses of animals were thrown also. It is to this place Jesus refers in his allegories when he says, Illic eret fletus et stridor dentium. This was a veil of tears, of suffering and horror. And there appears to be no doubt it is to Gehenna he is alluding in his parables, in his unintelligible speeches. Our belief receives further confirmation from the fact that torture by fire was practiced in this valley. There the guilty were burnt alive, at other times they were buried to the knees in dumb. Or round their neck was looped a length of cloth, whose ends were pulled by two men, so strangling the victim and forcing him to open his mouth into which molten lead was poured there we have the fire, the torture, whereof the Galilean spoke. We often hear him say that such and such a sin merits punishment by fire. That is, the miscreant deserves to be burnt in the serves. Valley of Gehenna, or flung upon the dung heap, and burned with the animal carrion that was dumped in this noisome awful place. But, you may point out, the adjective eternal Jesus frequently uses to qualify this fire. Does it not bear up the contention of those who believe the flames of hell shall burn forever? By no means. Often employed in scripture, this term eternal always connotes the finite. For example, God concluded an eternal alliance with his chosen people, nevertheless. This alliance came to an end. The cities of Sodom and Gomorrah were to burn eternally, but that blaze died out a good long while ago. 16 Furthermore, it is common knowledge that the fire in the valley of Gehenna near Jerusalem was kept lit by night and by day. We also know that great use is made of hyperbole in scripture, and that not a line of it should be taken literally. These exaggerations are enough must one go a step farther, as is regularly done, and twist the underlying meaning of things? Indeed, must not such magnifiers be regarded as the most definite enemies of good sense and reason? But what then is the nature of the fire they menace us with? One, it cannot be tangible, because we are told our fire is but a faint image of it. Two, a tangible fire illuminates the area surrounding it. And we are assured that hell is a tenebrous place. Three, tangible fire promptly consumes all combustible materials, and finally consumes itself, 
instead of which hellfire must last indefinitely and consume eternally, for hellfire is invisible. Hence, it is not at all tangible. Five, tangible fire goes out for lack of fuel. And according to our absurd religion, hellfire will burn forever. Six, hellfire is eternal. Tangible fire is temporary. Seven, it is said that the worst of the torments the damned have to endure is the privation of God, however. In this life experience shows that tangible fire can be far more painful than the absence of God. Eight, lastly, tangible fire can have no effect upon spirits. Therefore, hellfire can have no effect upon them. To say that God can contrive in such a way that a material fire acts upon spiritual beings that he will make these spirits to live and subsist without sustenance, and that he will make the fire to burn without combustible cis, is to resort to wonderful suppositions for which there is no warrant apart from the idle reveries of theologians, and which consequently prove only their stupidity or their wickedness. To come to the conclusion that, because nothing is impossible for God, God will do everything possible, is surely no very logical way of reasoning. Men would be well advised to refrain from basing their fond hopes upon God's omnipotence, when they do not even know what God is. In order to elude these difficulties, other theologians assure us that hellfire is not tangible at all. No. According to them, it is spiritual. Perhaps you will be good enough to tell me, what is a spiritual fire? What is an immaterial, incorporeal, non-substantial fire? Some there are who speak to us of such a thing. What do you fancy they are talking about? Do you suppose they themselves have the slightest idea? Where, in what connection, upon what occasion does their God explain to them the nature of their fire? Again, however, we find a few doctors who hunting for a happy medium, assert that this fire is partly spiritual, partly material, which gives us, oh behold, two different sorts of fire in hell, how preposterous. What device is a superstition not driven to resort to as it constructs its sandcastles of falsehood? And likewise, when pressed to produce something plausible concerning the location of this fabulous hell, what an outrageous higgledy-piggledy of far-fetched speculations has been invented. The prevailing feeling had been that hell lay in a region somewhere below the earth. But where is that region in relation to a revolving globe? Others, recognizing the world as round, placed hell at its center. That is, some fifteen hundred leagues from where we are. Standing now, but if scripture says true, the world is going to be destroyed, and where will hell be when that comes to pass? Well, you observe the wild nonsense that results when one puts one's faith in the ravings of others. Less extravagant reasoners claim, as I mentioned a moment ago, that hell consists in being barred from the vision of God, in which case hell starts right here in this world. For hereabouts there's neither hide nor hair of that God to be seen. And yet this state of affairs can hardly, you'll agree, be called unendurable. One is tempted to imagine the reverse if this queer god did truly exist, such as he is depicted to us. The mere sight of him would probably constitute a very adequate image of hell. All these incertitudes and the scanty concordance amongst the theologians indicate that the latter are wandering about in a fog and a delusion. Like drunkards are unable to get their bearings, let alone keep their footing, and nevertheless, is it not curious that they cannot come to some manner of terms over so essential a dogma, and one which, they say, is so clearly expounded in the word of God? So, Shavapat Rabble, own that this gigantic grisly dogma of yours is utterly baseless, all made up, that it is the product of your greed, your ambition, and sired by your unhinged Mentalities that it cannot stand unless crutched up by the ignorant terrors of the vulgar simpleton you train to swallow. Uncritically, everything you are pleased to serve up to him. Admit that this hell exists nowhere but in your brain, and that the infernal tortures you brandish are so met. Anxieties, it suits your political convenience to inflict upon the mortals who let themselves be guided by you. Aware of these facts, let us forever abjure a doctrine which only affrights men, 
constitutes an insult to the Godhead, and in a word, must be repudiated by any reasoning person. Various arguments are yet put forward. I think it incumbent upon me to combat them. One, the fear which, they say, everyone senses inwardly of some punishment to come, is an indubitable proof of that punishment's reality. But this fear is by no means innate. It is inculcated, fostered by education. It is not in every land the same, nor the same in all men, it is not. Found amongst those in whom passions have annihilated prejudice, the conscience is never modified, save by instruction, by ruling passions, by habit. Two, the pagans acknowledged the dogma of hell. Surely not as do we, and supposing that they might have acknowledged it, we who reject their religion, must we not reject their dogmas as well? But it is very certain the pagans never believed in an afterlife of everlasting sufferings, nor in the pathetic claptrap of the resurrection of bodies, which they burned on pyres, and whose ashes they preserved in urns they did believe, in metempsychosis, in the transmigration also of bodies, ideas for which there is a great deal to be said arid which natural studies repeatedly confirm, but the absurd conceit of bodily resurrection, very worthy of Christianity, belongs entirely to it. It would strongly appear that our doctors got their notions of a nether world, of paradise, and of purgatory out of Plato and Virgil, and that they then shaped them to suit their own purposes nebulous vagaries of poetical fancy, were in time changed into articles of faith. Three, if there is such a thing as sanity and healthy reason, then the dogma of a hell and of eternal punishment is necessarily proven true. God is just. Therefore he must punish men for their crimes. No, and no again never could sanity, never could healthy reason subscribe to a dogma which so blatantly outrages it. For but God is a judge, his justice must be done. Another atrocity evil is necessary on earth. I say unto you, that if your God exists, his justice cannot consist in punishing deeds he has himself prescribed if he is omnipotent. Your God, has he need of punishing the evildoer in order to prevent the doing of evil? Could he not, can he not today, deprive men altogether of the capacity for evil? If he did not do this originally, if he will not do it tomorrow, it is because he considers evil necessary to the maintenance of general harmony, and in the light of this how, vile blasphemers! How dare you say God can punish a mode of behavior which must exist if the universe is to run aright? 5. All theologians concur in believing and preaching the existence of the punishments of hell. Does this prove anything except that the priests, usually so disunited, are nonetheless very able to reach an understanding whenever it is a question of deceiving their flocks? Furthermore, must the ambitious and calculating inventions of Romish clerics dictate what the opinions of other sects are to be? Is it reasonable to expect the whole of mankind to believe what a grubby little minority found it advantageous to devise and proclaim? Must one then rather place one's faith in these cheats than in reason, common sense, and truth? It is by truth we should be ruled, not by the mob far better, to rely upon one man who speaks true than to heed the knaves who have been spouting lies for centuries. The other arguments they advance are all so patently weak that one has difficulty taking them seriously and little inclination to waste. One's time refuting them, none of them are posing either upon scripture or upon tradition, they all necessarily collapse of themselves. For example, unanimous consent is alleged, but can it be, when it is impossible to find any two individuals who follow the same line of reasoning about what is apparently one of the most important things in life? Realizing they have not a single sound argument on their side, these fierce priests are always fully prepared to threaten you, despite the fact that, as everybody knows by now, threats are the weapons of the simple-minded, the feeble, and the defeated. Come, come, silly little children of Jesus. Give us reasons. Yes, it is reasons we want out of you. Not bluster rant and fist shakings. We do not wish to be told since you do not choose to believe in these tortures. You are going to feel them, we merely ask. 
And with this request, you cannot successfully comply demonstrate to us that by virtue of which you would have us believe in your fictions. The fear of hell, in short, is no sure guarantee against sin. Nothing, anywhere, authorizes any such fear. It is only too obviously the fruit of the diseased imagination of priests, of, that is, those personages who comprise the vilest and the most mischievous class in society. So what purpose does the hell myth, sir? I put anyone at defiance to tell me. They assure us that sin is an infinite wrong and ought hence to be punished infinitely. Rubbish. God himself chose to prescribe a finite punishment for this crime, and that punishment is death. And so we conclude that the puerile dogma of hell is a fairy tale of sacerdotal contrivance, a cruel supposition hazarded by gowned rascals who began by fabricating a dreary, a disgusting god in their own image, in order then to have this loathsome dummy repeat what sorted best with their own passions, and above all, to repeat whatever was most likely to procure them or money, the sole object's ambition by that covetous, that shiftless lot, that crew of social outcasts whereof society would be wonderfully well advised to purge itself definitively. 17. I say unto you, banish forever from your heart this doctrine which is an insult to your God and your reason alike. Such beyond any doubt is the dogma that has produced more atheists than all the others combined. There being not a single man on earth who would not prefer to believe nothing whatsoever, rather than subscribe to this confusion of peculiarly dangerous lies. This is the explanation for why so many upright and decent souls consider themselves obliged to repair to thoroughgoing irreligion in their search for relief from and defense against the terrors wherewith an infamous Christian creed would lay waste their energies and all their peace of mind. So let's be rid of these false alarms. Let's forever have done with the dogmas, the ceremonies, the rites of this abominable religion. Better the most inveterate, the most incorrigible atheism than a cult so fraught with peril so immense. Indeed, I am aware of no drawback in not having any belief at all, but I see nothing but disadvantages of the very gravest order arising from the adoption of these dangerous systems. There, my dear Saint Fond, I have presented my views touching this infamous hell dogma. Let it terrify you and chill your pleasures no more. For mortal man there is but one hell, and that is the folly and wickedness in spite of his fellows, but once his life is over, there's an end to it, his annihilation is final and entire. Of him nothing survives. Ah, what a prodigious dupe he must therefore be, who denies himself a single pleasure or curbs his passions for a moment. Let him realize that he exists purely for their satisfaction through whatever excesses this may entail, and that all the effects of these passions, in whatever kind or shape, they may have been implanted in him, are the means whereby you serve the nature whose agents we at all times are whether we are conscious of it or no, whether we will or no. And now I hand you back the idea of a god which I made brief use of as an instrument for combating the eternal punishment scare. But there is no god. He does not any more exist than does the devil, than heaven, than hell. And the only duties we have in this world are those toward our pleasures, which we are to satisfy without regard to the interests of others, for we are bound, I, duty-bound to sacrifice any of them, and if need be, all of them, if the least of our desires, would have it so. I trust I have said enough to prove the absurdity of the principle upon which you base your pointless cruelty. Must I speak of the means you employ? No, to be honest with you, it isn't worth the trouble how, in the first place, how have you ever come to... Think that a signature scribbled in blood can be more binding, less worthless than one in ink or none? That. Next. This scrap of paper stuffed into a bum can serve as a passport to heaven or to hell, neither of which exists. Tis here a patchwork of prejudices so ridiculous as truly does not deserve the honor of critical dissection or disproving.
for the voluptuous idea that's made you giddy, this idea of prolonging the sufferings of a given individual, for it substitute a greater abundance of murders. I beseech you cease killing the same individual a thousand times over, which is impossible instead, assassinate individuals by the thousand, which is altogether feasible. Is there anything so mean-spirited as confiding oneself to half a dozen victims a week? Trust Juliet, she is clever, she is capable. Only say the word, and she will double the number, triple it. Give her the required money, you will want for nothing. Your passions will be satisfied. Splendid, St. Fond replied. I heartily welcome this last conclusion from now on, Juliet. We shall have not three victims per supper, but six and the supper shall be held twice as frequently as heretofore, which will mean twenty-four victims a week, a third of them men, two-thirds women. Your fees shall be augmented proportionally, however, mesdames. I cannot confess having been vanquished by this learned dissertation upon the nullity of infernal punishments. I admire the erudition it displays. Its aim, certain of its implications and consequences, but bow before it. This I cannot do, and to what you have advanced, I should like to answer as follows. First of all, throughout your entire argument, I observe an effort to exculpate God from the barbarity of the dogma of hell. If God exists, you seem to be saying in virtually every sentence, the qualities which he must possess are every one of them incompatible with this execrable dogma. But, my dear Claire Will, it is precisely here that I feel you fall into heaviest error, and this for want of a philosophy comprehensive enough, luminous enough, to enable you to behold the subject properly. The hell dogma creates a hindrance to your pleasures, and from there you go on to assert that hell. There is none facts must be established upon something more solid than personal wishes. To combat the dogma of eternal penalties you begin, by gratuitously destroying everything it rests upon there is no God. We do not have souls. Hence there are no sufferings to dread in a life after this. It strikes me that you start at the very outset by committing the greatest blunder one can commit in logic to posit as granted that which is in question. Far from sharing your way of thinking, I acknowledge a supreme being, and yet more firmly believe in the immortality of the soul. But let not your pious hearts, enchanted by these initial declarations, run on to suppose they have a proselyte in me. I am not so sure my doctrine will prove to their liking. You yourselves may find it odd. Never mind, I should like to expound it to you all the same. And I am sure I can count upon a fair hearing. I raise up my eyes to the universe. I see evil, disorder, crime, reigning as despots everywhere. My gaze descends and it bends upon that most interesting of this universe's creatures. I behold him likewise devoured by vices, by contradictions, by infamies. What ideas result from this examination? That what we improperly call evil is really not evil at all, and that this mode is of such high necessity to the designs of the being who has created us that he would cease to be the master of his own creation were evil not to exist, universally upon the earth. Well, persuaded that this is so, I tell myself there exists a God. Some hand or other has necessarily created all that I see, but has not created it save for evil, is not pleased, but by evil evil is his essence. And all that he causes us to commit is indispensable to his plans. What matters it to him that I suffer from this evil, provided it be advantageous to him? Does it not seem I am his favorite child? If the misfortunes that afflict me from the day I am born until the day I die prove his indifference to me, I may very well be mistaken upon what I call evil. What I thus characterize relative to myself seems indeed to be a very great good relative to the being who has brought me into the world. And if I receive evil from others, I enjoy the right to pay them back in kind, to be the first to cast the stone, so... Henceforth, evil is good. Just as it is for the author of my existence, relatively to my existence, the evil I do others makes me happy, as God is rendered happy by the evil he does me. 
All confusion and error are gone, save in the idea attributed to the word, but in the deed. There is both evil as necessity and evil as pleasure henceforth. Why ought I not call it good? Be sure of it, evil, or at least what goes by that name, is absolutely useful to the vicious organization of this melancholy universe. The God who has articulated it is a very vindictive being, very barbarous, very wicked, very unjust, very cruel that, because vengeance, barbarity, wickedness, iniquity, criminality are the necessary modes vital to the principle that governs this vast creation, of which we only complain when it brings us hurt to its victims. Crime is bad to its agents. Good. Now if evil, or at least what we call such, is the essence both of God who has created everything and of the creatures wrought in his image, how can one be anything but certain that the consequences of evil are eternal? It is in evil he made the world. By evil he does sustain it. It is for evil he perpetuates it. It is impregnated with evil. The creation must exist. It is into the womb of evil it returns after its turn. Man's soul is merely the action of evil upon a subtle matter, susceptible of being organized only by evil now, this mode being the soul of the creator, as it is of the being created just as it existed before this created being that is saturated with it, so it will exist after that created being is no more. All, everyone has got to be wicked, barbarous, inhuman, like your God. These are the vices the person who wishes to please him must adopt. Without, nevertheless, any hope of succeeding for the evil which harms always, the evil which is the essence of God, will never be can never be susceptible of love, nor of gratitude. If this God, center of evil and of ferocity, torments man, and has him tormented by nature, and by other men throughout the whole period of his existence, how may one doubt that he acts likewise, and perhaps involuntarily upon this breath of air which outlives him, and which, as I have just said, is nothing other than evil itself? But how... You are going to object. How may evil be tormented by evil? Because when it encounters itself, it is increased, and because the force that yields must always be obliterated by there. Force that compels it to yield which is in accordance with the logic wherein weakness is always subjugated by strength. That which survives the naturally evil being, that which must survive him, since it is the essence of the bee's constitution, an essence whose existence is prior to the being, and which will exist after the being, by falling back into the womb of evil. And because of its relative weakness, no longer having the strength to defend itself, will hence be tormented by the entire essence of evil, to which it will be reunited they are these maleficent molecules that, in the operation of compassing and assimilating those which what we call death, reunites to them, Compose what poets and others of ardent imagination have named demons. No man, whatever be his conduct in this world, can escape this terrible fate, because it is necessary that everything that emanates from the womb of nature, that is to say, from the womb of evil, return thereunto such is the universal law. Thus are the detestable elements of the wicked man absorbed into the source of wickedness, which is God. To return again, and to animate other beings, which will be born, that much more corrupted, in as they will be the fruit of corruption. What? You may wonder, what has become of the good being? But there is no such thing as a good being. He whom you call virtuous is not by any means good. Or, if he's from your viewpoint, he surely is not from the viewpoint of God, who is only evil, who wants nothing but what is evil who requires evil alone. The man you speak of is merely feeble, and feebleness is an evil, weaker than the absolutely and entirely vicious being, and more completely engulfed by the maleficent molecules with which his elementary dissolution will conjoin him. This man will have to suffer a great deal more, and there precisely is what ought to oblige every man to render himself in this world, 
as vicious and wicked as possible, in order that, more like unto the molecules wherewith he must some day contend, he have in this act of reunion infinitely less to suffer from their onslaught. The ant that were to fall into the midst of wild animals, where there prevails such violence as must overwhelm any insect, would, because of its radical defenselessness, have an infinitely more painful time of it than might some large beast which, stronger, more resourceful, better able to resist, would only gradually become swallowed up into the whirlpool. The more vices and crimes a man would have manifested in this world, the more he will be in harmony with his ineluctable fate, which is wickedness, which I consider the primary matter of the world's composition. Let man then take care to preserve himself well from virtue, if he should like to avoid exposure to the most hideous sufferings for virtue, being the mode hostile to the world system. All those who will have yielded to it are certain to endure, after this life, the most unspeakable torments by reason of the difficulty they will experience in re-entering the womb of evil, author, and regenerator of all we behold. Having seen that all was vicious and criminal on earth, the being supreme in wickedness will say unto them, Why did you stray into the paths of virtue? Did I ever announce to you, by any token, that this mode was agreeable to me? Did not the perpetual miseries with which I inundated the universe convince you that I love only disorder, and that to please me one must emulate me? Did I not set grandly before you every day the example of destruction? Why did you heed it not? Did not the plagues wherewith I withered the earth, by proving to you that evil was my joy, enjoin you to perform evil acts in the service of my scheme? Now were you not aware that humankind must satisfy me? And in what aspect of my conduct have you noticed benevolence? Is it in sending you plagues, blights, civil wars, earthquakes, tempests? Is it by brandishing above your heads all the serpents of discord that I persuade you that my essence is good? Fool! Why did you not imitate my ways? Why did you resist those passions I put in you for no reason, other than to prove to you how great is the necessity for evil? Their voice was to have been heard and obeyed, it was necessary to despoil pitilessly, as I do, the widow and the orphan, to pillage the poor in one word, to make man comply with all your needs, bend before all your caprices I do. After having played the idiot and taken the contrary way, what have you come back here for? And how are the soft, flabby elements emanating from your dissolution? How, I ask, without being shattered and without occasioning you the most excruciating agonies. Are they to return now into the womb of maleficence and crime? More of a philosopher than you, Clarewell. I do not have to apply, as you seem obliged to do, either to that rogue Jesus or to that insipid novel, Holy Scripture, in order to demonstrate my system. My study of the universe alone provides me with weapons to oppose you. And simply from the manner in which it is governed, I see eternal and universal evil as absolutely indispensable in the world. The author of the universe is the most wicked, the most ferocious, the most horrifying of all beings. His works cannot be anything but the result or the incarnation of his criminality. Without his wickedness raised to its extremest pitch, nothing would be sustained in the universe. Evil is, however, a moral entity and not a created one. An eternal and not a perishable entity, it existed before the world. It constituted the monstrous, the execrable beam who was able to fashion such a hideous world. It will hence exist after the creatures which people this world it is unto evil. They will all enter again, in order to recreate others perhaps more wicked yet. And that is why they say all is degraded, all is corrupted in old age, that stems only from the perpetual re-entry and emergence of wicked elements into and out of the matrix of maleficent molecules. You are now perhaps going to ask me how, within this hypothesis, I rationalize the possibility of causing a person to suffer for a longer period of time by means of a bit of paper introduced into the anus. It is the simplest thing in the world and I dare say the surest and least refutable as well. 
if I have been pleased to call it a weakness. It is because... I had no idea you would ever get me into the position of disclosing my doctrines to you. Ill defend my method, however, and prove its worth. When my victims arrive in evil's womb, they come bearing evidence that in my hands they have endured all the suffering it is possible to endure, they are then classified as virtuous beings. Through my operation they are made better, improve their adjunction to the maleficent molecules is rendered exceedingly difficult their agonies. Hence, are enormous, and by the laws of attraction essential to nature, they must be, those agonies, of the same species as those I cause them to suffer in this world. As the magnet draws iron, as beauty weds carnal appetites, so agonies A, agonies B, agonies C, call to their like, enchain their like. The person my hand exterminates by means of agony B will, I suppose, only return to the matrix of maleficent molecules via that agony B. And if agony B is the most appalling possible, I am sure my victim will undergo a similar one in entering the womb of evil, which necessarily awaits all men, and which, by the laws of attraction I just mentioned, only accepts them in the same way by which they went out of the world. But the instrument merely a formality, I admit, useless, futile, perhaps but a formality which suits me, and which can have nothing about it contrary to the true meaning, to the assured success of my operation. That, replied Claire Will, is the most astonishing, the most unusual, I dare say the most bizarre of all the systems yet to have occurred to the mind of man. Less extravagant than the one Juve just brought to light, answered Saint Font, to maintain yours, you are forced either to wipe God clean of his faults, or to deny him as for me. I acknowledge him with all his vices, and indeed in the eyes of those who are familiar with all the crimes, all the horrors of this curious being whom men only invoke and call good from fear in the eyes of these people, I say, my ideas will appear less irregular than the ones you have exposed. Your system, said Claire Will, arises solely out of your profound horror of God. True, I abhor him, but my system is by no means the issue of the hatred I have for him, no. It is but the fruit of my intelligence and my meditation. I, said Claire Will, would rather not believe in God than forge one in order to hate it. Juliet, what do you think of the matter? Profoundly an atheist, I replied, arch enemy of the dogma of the soul's immortality. I will always prefer your system to St. Fons, and I prefer the certitude of nothingness to the fear of an eternity of suffering. There you are, St. Fond rejoined, always that perfidious egoism which is the source of all the mistakes human beings make. One arranges one's schemes according to one's tastes and whims, and always by drifting farther from truth. You've got to leave your passions behind when you examine a philosophical doctrine. Ah, St. Fond, said Claire Will, how easy it would be to point out that yours is nothing but the product of those passions which you would have one put by when studying. With less cruelty in your heart, your dogmas would be less sanguinary, and you yourself would rather risk the soul, eternal damnation of which you speak, than renounce the delicious pleasure of horrifying others with it. Exactly. I interrupted, that is his single motive for exposing his doctrine, nothing but wickedness on his part. But he won't believe it. I believe you are wrong, and you see perfectly well that my actions correspond in every point to my manner of thinking. Convinced that the torture of being reunited with where the maleficent molecules will be quite mild for the person as maleficent as they, I cover myself with crimes in this world so as to have less to suffer in the next. As for me, retorted Claire Will, I soil myself with them because they please me, because I believe them one of the ways of serving nature, and because, since nothing of me is going to survive, it matters bloody little how I behave in this world. Thus far had we come in our conversation when we heard a carriage enter the courtyard, and stop more seal was announced, then introduced. With him he brought a youth of sixteen. Never had I clapped eyes on one so fair. Bless me murmured the minister. 
I've only this minute finished, giving these ladies an analysis of hell. Could it be that my dear Norshul arrives to tempt me into meriting it a little? Only too true, Noisha returned. You might damn yourself wondrously at this pretty little chap's expense. I fetched him here for that very purpose. He is the son of the Marquise de Rose, the same whom last week you sent to the Bastille upon charges, what were they? Flotting against the crown? That was the pretext, as I recall. And your aim, presumably, was to procure yourself this child? And perhaps some money besides? Precisely. Then I was not mistaken. At any rate, the Marquise, knowing of our connections, sought audience with me. I had one of your clerks draw up a writ. And this morning she and I had a chat together. Here is the result of our negotiations, Norsell said, thrusting young Rose into the minister's arms, and sign. I've also a hundred thousand crowns to turn over to you. He's pretty, said St. Fond, kissing the lad exceedingly pretty. But he comes at a bad moment we've been up to horrors and exhausted. Tush, Norsell replied. The boy has all the qualities needed to restore you to life. Of that I'm certain. Rose and Morsil, who had not yet taken supper, joined us at table. St. Fon said, when the meal was over, that he wished to have me on hand while he amused himself with the youth. And he proposed that Morsil lie with Claire Will, both of whom seemed pleased by the arrangement and the company retired. I fear I shall have to put you to contribution, St. Fon declared, for attractive, though this child undeniably is, I foresee ill, have trouble stiffening. Unbutton him for me, my pet, roll his shirt above his waist, and that's it. Leave his breeches hanging just above his knees, quite, that's the style I adore. And as the ass I bared for his delectation was nothing short of luscious St. Fond, polluted by me, kissed it fervidly and long, while frigging a juvenile prick we soon saw reach a most creditable stand. Suck it, my lover bade me ill-tongue his asshole in the meantime. I believe that, between the two of us, we should be able to wheedle a discharge out of him. Next, his greed aroused by the thought of the f I was about to pump forth. St. Fond said he would change places with me as we did so. Dexterously, that scarcely had he got the boy's prick in his mouth. Then he felt it filled by a most abundant ij he swallowed every drop down. Oh, Juliet, he confided to me, smacking his lips, food for the gods that. I thrive upon no other. Then, instructing the boy to get into bed and to await us without falling asleep, Saint Fond conducted me to his boudoir. Juliet, said he, I must give you the particulars concerning an affair upon which Morisil himself is by no means thoroughly informed. The Marquise de Rose, one of the most beautiful women of the court, was once my mistress, and the child Norsuya brought here this evening is mine. I became interested in him two years ago. For two years the Marquise prevented me from satisfying a passion, and I was obliged to bide my time until my position was strong enough to permit me to act without risk. It was not until recently my prestige and credit, towering upon the shattered remnants of hers, that I judged the occasion ripe my grievances are, too, I resent having f her. I resent having been kept from f her son. Now, she trembles, she sends the boy to me. But he arrives rather late in the day for eighteen months, I discharged at the very thought of him. But such enthusiasms are never maintained indefinitely. And I find that this one, if it has not completely disappeared, has ebbed very significantly, however, this adventure retains certain other criminal possibilities which I owe it to myself, not to leave unexplored. Oh yes, I am perfectly willing to pocket the Marquise's hundred thousand. I am nothing loath to f her son, but matters don't end there. My vengeance has to be considered. Shall not emerge from the Bastille, save in a crate. And, pray, what do you mean by that? Just what I say. The Marquise does not know that in the event her son dies, I, though a distant relative would be sole heir to her fortune, the whole shan't outlast the month and after. I've properly f her scion tonight. Tomorrow morning well have him breakfast on a cup of chocolate, which will remove the single obstacle between me and a windfall. What an accumulation of crimes. Not one too many, my dear. 
if I am to go favorably prepared to that crucial rendezvous with the Maleficent Molecule. Astonishing, man. And there's something substantial to be gained from the enterprise, I take it. Over 500,000 livres a year, Juliet, and earning them entails an investment of 20 sous worth of arsenic. Well, said the minister, getting to his feet, we have some fun ahead of us. Let's not tarry. See for yourself, he continued, giving me his swollen rock-hard prick to handle. Behold the influence a criminal thought can have upon my senses. There's not a woman on earth who'd ever have had cause to complain of my services, if I'd he'd been sure of being able to kill her afterward. Young Rose was expecting us we lay down in bed on either side of him. Saint Fawn covered him with lewd kisses, we fragged him, we sucked him, we tongued his vent, and as his imagination was powerfully astir, Saint Fond was soon lodged to the hilt in the boy. I titillated my lover's asshole with my tongue, great, though his previous exertions had been that day. Seldom had I seen him loose his sperm, in such quantity, or seen the spasm last so long. He enjoined me to collect his seed from the vessel he had spat it into, and to convey it to his mouth. This challenge to my libertine abilities pleased me hugely. I acquitted myself of the chore, with gladness in my heart. Next, Rose had to unbugger me while the minister bought him afresh. And then Saint Fawn buggered me while licking and sucking the ass of our humble little playfellow, whom we wore positively to shreds by dint of the discharging we made him do now into our mouths, now into our asses. Dawn was approaching when Saint Fawn, dead sick of it all but not yet satisfied, ordered me to hold the child fast. And the villain slashed his backside with a hundred or so strokes of a martinet, then beat him with his fists and molested him very cruelly indeed. At eleven o'clock, the chocolate was brought in upon the minister's instructions I poisoned the cup in such wise as to ensure his inheritance. And he, while I was preparing the poison, that would do away with the son, busied himself penning a note to the commandant of the Bastille, wherein the latter was ordered to administer a similar dose to the mother. And so, said St. Fond, stifling a yawn. And so, said he, once death had been insinuated by our fell maneuvers into the veins of the unlucky child. That's what I call a day fairly begun, may the being supreme in wickedness, but deign to send me four such victims a week, and I shall never cease to sing heartfelt praises unto his name. Nor Zoya and Claire will, waiting for us, took breakfast together. We joined them in due time. Everything of what had passed remained a secret between the minister and me. The two men set out for Paris, the doomed child accompanying them while Claire will and I returned thither in her carriage. Concerning this adventure, my friends, I have nothing further to tell you that you have not already taken for granted the crime. Like all St. Fon's crimes, was crowned with greatest success, he very shortly came into possession of a legacy which proved every bit as valuable as he had originally estimated, and a million livres, representing two years of his new income, was the gift he had the kindness to present me for my help in obtaining it. On the road to the capital, Claire will pose me several questions I managed to elude them. To be sure, I spoke of our lewd activities there would have been no point attempting to conceal them. She would not have believed me had I denied them, but as for the rest, I hid it all, which was according to St. Fon's wishes. During that journey, I took the opportunity to remind my friend of her promise to secure my admission to her libertine club. She gave me her word that I would be received the next time it met. We entered the city, kissed, and said goodbye. Part 3. My friends, it is time I tell you a little about myself, and above all describe my opulence, fruit of the most determinedly dissolute living, in order that you will be able to contrast it with the state of indigence and adversity wherein my sister, who had chosen good behavior, was languishing already. Your outlook and philosophy will suggest to you what conclusions are to be drawn from these comparisons. I lived on a grand scale, on a perfectly enormous scale, you must surely have suspected as much. What with the expenses I had to make in behalf of my lover? But leaving aside the innumerable things required for his pleasure, I had to myself a superb townhouse in Paris, 
an exquisite property by So at Barrière Blanche. As delightful a little dwelling as ever you saw, twelve let were perpetually in my train. Four equally engaging chambermaid, a reader, a night nurse, three carriages, ten horses, four valets chosen for their virility and excellence of member, all the other appurtenances of a very great household. And after salaries and upkeep had been deducted, I was left with a balance of two million to throw away on trifles of one kind or another. You will concede, I believe, that something is to be said for the way I had managed my affairs. Would you like my daily life described? I rose every day at ten. Until eleven I saw nobody except intimate friends from then until one. My toilet, at which all my retinue assisted promptly at one. All clock. I gave private audience to those individuals who came to solicit my favors, or to the minister when he happened to be in part. At two, I hide myself to Barriera Blanche, where, every day, I would find awaiting me what had been delivered by tasteful and conscientious procuresses, to wit four new men, and four new women, with whom I would very wantonly, very amply, indulge my caprices. To obtain some idea of the objects I used to receive there, you have only to know that not one of them cost me less than twenty-five louis, and I frequently paid double that nor is there any imagining what of the delicious and rare was purveyed to me in either sex, at these trysts, I more. Then once met women and girls of rank and the highest station sweet were the joys. Yes, elaborate were the pleasures I tasted in that house. I would return to town at four in the afternoon, and always dine with friends. I shall not speak of my board nowhere in Paris was there anything to match it for splendor, for delicacy, for profusion, and yet I was a hard mistress to my cooks and wine steward, demanding that they ever outdo themselves, but I need not press the point. You are familiar enough with my extreme intemperance. It is perhaps a mild vice. Gourmandise, it is one of my favorites nonetheless, for I have always been of the opinion that unless you carry this one to excess, you can never properly enjoy the others. After those royal repasts, I used to go out to the theater or... Entertain the minister, if it was one of his evenings. Regarding my wardrobe, my gems, my furniture, and my savings, though at this period I had been scarcely two years with Monsieur de saint Fond, I believe four million would be a low figure for the value of the lot I had half that sum in gold, and used sometimes, after Claire Will's example, to fling up the lids of my treasure chests and that frenziedly, I love crime, and see, I would gloat, discharging over the thought, see, here at my disposal are all the means I need for committing it. Oh, my good friends, tis a very sweet idea, and what seas of f have I not spilled entertaining it? Did I desire a new piece of jewelry, another dress, anything, and my lover who disliked having me wear the same thing more than twice would satisfy me immediately? and in return for all that nothing was required of me, save lawless conduct, lechery, libertinage, and prodigious care in arranging the minister's frolics. It was thus that by flattering my tastes, I found them gratified. Every one through my surrender to every sensual irregularity, my senses were kept in a constant drunken exhilaration. But such comforts, such joys what was my moral situation, as a result of them, Ah, of this I am reluctant to speak, and yet, however, I must. The terrific libertinage I practiced day in and day out had so rusted and decayed the workings of my soul. To such a degree had I been envenomed by the pernicious advice. The vicious examples I was fairly deluged with from all sides and all the time, that I declare to you, I do not think I.D. have given a penny out of my hoard to rescue someone on the brink of starvation. Indeed. About this time a dreadful famine broke out. In the vicinity of my country home, all the folk in those parts were reduced to the very worst distress I recall hideous scenes. Girls sold their bodies by the roadside. Waifs were abandoned. There were several suicides droves of people came begging to my door. Held firm and deliberately and impudently, reasserted my uncharitable disposition by laying out fabulous sums for the improvement of my lawns and shrubberies. 
But how can one possibly bestow alms, was my insolent rejoinder, when one is in the midst of having mirrored, boudoir built in one's park, and one's paths beautified by sculptured cupids, Aphrodites, and Sapphos. Everything that could move a heart of stone was exhibited to my tranquil gaze. It got them nowhere. Steadfast I remained, weeping mothers, naked infants, ghost-like figures wasted by hunger. I simply smiled, shook my head, and throughout those trying months slept as soundly as ever before, and ate with an increased appetite. Taking stock of my sensations, I discovered that what I was feeling bore out my teacher's predictions perfectly, instead of a disagreeable sentiment of pity. There was kindled in me a certain restlessness, a commotion produced by the evil I fancied I was doing in turning those wretches away empty-handed. And within my nerves, there was a certain rush of heat much like the blaze ignited in us, whenever we violate a law or subdue a prejudice. I suddenly recognized how delightful putting these principles into practice could be, and I understood that if the spectacle of misery caused by unkind, fate can be sublimely voluptuous for those with minds trained and enriched by such doctrines as had been inculcated in mine, then the spectacle of misery, for which one has oneself been responsible, must surely intensify this pleasure, as you know. Mine is a fertile imagination. It now began to run riot. The logic of the thing was eminently simple. I wreaked pleasure merely from denying to the destitute the wherewithal would have brought them respite. Ah! What might I not experience from being the direct and sole cause of that destitution? If, said I, it is sweet to refuse to do good, it must be heavenly to do evil. I summoned up this idea, played with it during those critical moments when the flesh catches fire from the sparks, emitted by an excited brain moments when one is particularly apt to heed the voice of desires become that much more strident, that much more imperious with the receding into unimportance and finally into nullity of all else. The dream once dreamt and over, one may subside again into prudence and sobriety requires little or no effort. Purely intellectual wrongs are always easily effaced. They harm no one but Unfortunately, the thing is likely to go farther. Ah, one says to oneself, what shall the deed itself do to me if the mere grating of the thought upon my nerves has been able to affect them so keenly? The temptation is enormous, one makes the accursed dream come true, and its existence is a crime. Less than a mile from my chateau stood a humble cottage belonging to a peasant, one Martin de Grange in this world he had little else beyond. His eight children and a wife who for kindliness and cheerfulness and thrift was a veritable treasure to the man, would you believe it? This asylum of poverty and virtue excited my fury and wickedness. Very true it is, to this I bear witness, that crime is a delectable thing, very certain it is, that the flame it darts through our whole being is what sets alight the torch of lust that it requires but the thought of crime to hurl us into a lubricious ferment. I had taken Elvira with me the day I visited that place, and with me also I had some phosphorus in a jar upon arriving. I instructed that witty little jade to go in to entertain the family, saying I would join her in a minute, whereupon I slipped off and buried the combustible amidst the hay in the loft above the room where the wretches slept. I climb back down, enter, the youngsters kiss me, we play games together. The mother and I chat about the details of her household. The father asks if he may offer me some refreshment. He endeavors to be as hospitable as his dreadfully scanty means permit. I am not for all that swerved an inch from my purpose. Not in the least melted. What are my emotions? I inspect them and find it is not a tedious pity that pervades me, but a delicious irritation which racks me to the core of my being a mere touch. I could discharge ten times over. I distribute renewed caresses to every member of this wonderful family, into whose midst I have just sown the seeds of bo Murder my fell deceit is at its height, the blacker grows my gratuitous treachery, the more violent the itch in my cunt. To the mother I give some ribbons. Candy to the brats, we take our leave. Start for home. 
but I am in such a state of excitement, a very delirium, that I feel my knees ready to buckle and must beg Elvire to come to my relief. We turn off the road into a thicket. I raise my skirts. I spread my legs. She puts her hand to my sex, has scarce inserted her fingers when I discharge never before had I known anything like those terrible moments. What ails you, madame? asked Elvire, unaware of what I had just done. Don't speak to me. Freak me, freak me, said I, thrusting my tongue into her mouth. I am fearfully overwrought this morning. That's all. Here, let me have your cunt. Let me toy with it and let's both of us drown in rivers of fu- But what can have happened? Horrors. My dove atrocities and sperm flows marvelously. Believe me, when its spurts are started, but of the womb of abomination. So frig me, Elvire, frig me. Dear heart, I have got to discharge. And the creature kneels, glides her head between my thighs. Her tongue glides into my cunt, thrills there. Ah, oh, fuck. I gasp. Tis even so, tis so. You seize me well. And my seed washes her lips, her nose, drips down her chin. We pursue our way. I reached home in an indescribable exaltation. It was as though every violent impulse, every instinct, every vice were allied in an effort to debauch my very soul. I swam in a kind of intoxication and a kind of rage. There was nothing I might not have done, no lewd act I could not have soiled myself with. Bitterly I regretted that my blow had fallen upon only a tiny fraction of humanity. Great was the evil in me, great enough to have laid. All nature waste I dashed into one of my boudoirs, and naked, flung myself upon a couch. I commanded Elvire to send me in every man she could get hold of. I bade them do everything they wished with me, provided they insulted me, reviled me, treated me like the vilest whore. I was fingered, pawed, prodded, spat upon, beaten, slapped my cunt, my ass, my breasts, my mouth were all used, befouled wood that I had had twenty other altars to present for their offerings. Some of those men left and fetched back their friends, individuals I had never seen before. I opened my holes to them. Refuse no one, was the harlot, to everyone, anyone, and f gushed in torrents out of me. One of the more uncouth of those studs I had been baiting, him declared it was not upon a bed he wanted to f me. But in the mire I let him drag me bodily into a pigsty, and there, in slime and excrement, I flung my legs apart and challenged him to do his worst. The knave performed brutally and let me go, only after having shat all over my face and I was happy. The more, the deeper I wallowed in ordur and infamy, the greater grew my excitement, the fiercer my joy. In less than two hours I was tubbed twenty times over, and Elvira never stopped frigging me throughout it all, and nothing, no, nothing alleviated my pangs, my sufferings hideous and delicious and provoked by the thought constantly in my mind, that of the crime I had just perpetrated. Going upstairs to my dressing room, we noticed a ruddy glow in the distance. Madame, come look, Elvire called, opening a window. Look, madame, a fire over there, do you see? In that direction, where we were this morning. And I tottered back, to fall nearly unconscious upon the sofa. We were alone, that pretty girl and I. For perhaps five minutes or ten, she frigged me, and then I sat up, thrusting Elvire away. Do you not hear shouts? I demanded. Come, let's not tarry here. A rare spectacle awaits us outside. Elvire, I am responsible for this. Madame, come, I say. Let's go gloat together over my triumph. I simply must see it all. I must savor it all. I don't want to miss a detail. We set out as we were. The two of you, sir, hair disheveled. Our dresses rumpled. Weariness and delight. Traced in our features, we resembled a pair of bacanti. Stopping twenty paces away from that scene of horror. Behind a little hillock which hid us from the sight of others. I sink again into the embrace of an Elvire, almost as aroused as I we. Can suck each other by the light of homicidal flames. 
my ferocity has ignited. We discharge to the sound of shrill screams coming from a woe, and anguish that are my confection, and never has woman been happier than was I. At last we regain our feet and stand a while surveying that panorama of destruction, then move closer to pore over the details. Great is my distress at concluding, as I count the corpses, that two members of the family must have escaped me. I examine the charred bodies one by one. Recognize each these people were alive this morning, I muse. And now, but a few hours later, here they are, dead killed by me. And why did I do it? Out of fun. To spill my f- So this is what murder is. A little organized matter disorganized a few compositional changes. The combination of some molecules disturbed and broken. Those molecules tossed back into the crucible of nature who, re-employing the self-same materials, will cast them into something else, so that in but a day or so, they shall reappear in the world again. Only guised a little differently this they call murder truly now. In all seriousness, I asked myself, where is the wrong in murder? This woman here, that infant there in the eyes of nature does either count for more than, say, a housefly or a maggot. I deprive the one of life, so doing, I give life to the other how. Can this be made out an offense to nature? This little revolt of the intellect against the heart set the electrical globules in my nerves briskly into motion, and once again my companion found her fingers wetted by my running cunt. I honestly do not know to what lengths I might not have gone had I been alone. Who can tell, possessed of a perfectly Caribbean cruelty? I.D. perhaps have fallen to devouring my victims there they lay, strewn invitingly upon the ground. None but the father and one of the children had got away. The mother and the seven others had perished, and as I stared down at them, felt, palpated them, I repeated to myself, I have done this, I, these murders were planned by me, consummated by me, they are my handiwork, my creation, and I discharged afresh. Of the cottage not a stick remained. It was hard to imagine a dwelling had ever stood there, that human beings had ever inhabited this wilderness. And now, my friends, what do you fancy was Claire Will's reaction when she heard of my feet? She listened to the recital in cold silence, one eyebrow raised, and when I was done. She assured me that I had precious little to boast of indeed, said she. I had acquitted myself more like a coward than a criminal. In the execution of your undertaking, I notice several grave defects, she declared, and her comments are worth citing, for they reveal the character of that unusual woman firstly. She specified you proceeded in slipshod style had someone chanced to come along. Your gestures, your exuberance, very telltale, would have constituted evidence against you. Beware of such loose conduct. Our door, passion be all means. But keep it inward outwardly, nonchalance, flemch on shallon. Circumscribe, contain the lubricious effects. Under pressure, their temperature mounts. Secondly, scope and grandeur are sadly lacking in your conception of the thing, which I am obliged to qualify as mean for you must admit that with a large town and seven or eight sizable villages plainly visible from your windows, there is a timorousness. Undue modesty in exerting yourself upon a single house, an isolated house, in a secluded place furthermore from fear. One is led to suppose, lest the flames by spreading, extend the dimensions of your petty felony, your nervousness, your anxiety, in committing it are only too apparent. You spoiled your pleasure, for crime's pleasures brook no restriction I speak from experience there, where free reign is not given the imagination. Where the hand is stayed by some scruple or consideration, the ecstasy cannot possibly be complete. For there always subsists a regret I could have done more, and I did not. And regrets arising from virtue sting worse than those consecutive to crime should he who follows in virtues train happen to perform a piece of wickedness. He is always able to comfort himself by the thought that a host of good deeds will wipe the blot away. And as it is easy to convince oneself of anything one desires to believe, his conscience is soon at peace. But for those who travel the path of vice matters are not so simple. A missed opportunity 
is something we cannot forgive ourselves, because it cannot be compensated by anything. No virtue comes to our rescue, and the promise we make to do something worse only wets our palate for evil, without consoling us for having let a chance of doing it go by. Another observation has to be made, Clarewell went on. Do even the most superficial glance your scheme betrays a very glaring error had I been in your place. I would surely have brought an action against that Degrange. Nothing simpler than to have had him charged with arson and burned at the stake. Oh, yes, indeed. I would have included that item on the program. For are you unaware that when fire breaks out in the house of a tenant hand de Grange, is one of your tenants you have the right to summon the authorities and launch an inquiry to determine whether the tenant is the culprit? Who knows? Perhaps the fellow wished to get rid of his wife and children, and then go off and play the shiftless beggar somewhere else. The moment he bolted from the house you should have had him arrested while attempting flight. Don't you see you spend a few louis collecting witnesses to begin with? Elvire. She was there, she affirms, that the very same morning she saw the guilty one, skulking distractedly about in the barnyard, climbing up to the hayloft. She spoke to him, questioned him, got only gibberish for answer, and the courts would have done the rest inside a week. You'd have been treated to the voluptuous spectacle of your man being burned alive at your gate. Let this be a lesson to you, Juliet. Profit from it. As soon as the idea for a crime occurs to you, concert its amplification, its aggravation, and while putting it into execution, further elaborate upon your idea. There, my friends, those, textually, are the cruel additions Claire Will would have had me join to my miscreancy, and why deny it? Deeply stirred by her arguments, forced to recognize that I had performed shabbily, I promised myself that in the future my enterprises would defy criticism. I was aggrieved above all by the peasant's escape. What would I not have given to see him roasted on my doorstep? The mere recollection of that loss pains me to this day. At last came the time appointed for my reception into Clarewell's club. Its name was the Sodality of the Friends of Crime. On the morning of that day my sponsor brought for my study a copy of the Sodality's Belaws here. Let me read them to you. I believe you will find them intriguing. Statutes of the Sodality of the Friends of Crime. Deferring to the common usage, the Sodality admits the serviceability of the word crime, but makes plain declaration that in its plain employment thereof, with reference to any kind of act of whatever sort or color, no condemnatory or pejorative sense is ever intended. Thoroughly convinced that man is not free, and that, bound absolutely by the laws of nature, all men are slaves of these fundamental laws. The sodality therefore approves and legitimates everything, and considers as its most zealous and most estimable members those who, unhesitatingly and unrepentantly, acquit themselves of the greatest number of those vigorous actions fools in their weakness call crimes, because it is the sodality's belief that through accomplishing these actions, the individual serves nature, that their performance is dictated by her, and that if such a thing as crime there be, it is characterized by the reluctance or refusal to do any of the very various things nature may inspire, and hence enjoin. The sodality, therefore, stands protectively behind all its members, guaranteeing all of them aid, shelter, refuge, allies, funds, counsel, everything needed to counter the maneuvers of the law, all members who violate it are safeguarded and championed automatically by the sodality which considers itself above the law because the law is of mortal and artificial contrivance, whereas the sodality, natural in its origin and obediences, heeds and respects nature only. Annoying. One. No distinction is drawn among the individuals who comprise the sodality not, that it holds all men equal in the eyes of naturally a vulgar notion, deriving from infirmity, want of logic, and false philosophy, but because it is persuaded and maintains that distinctions of any kind may have a detrimental influence upon the sodality's pleasures and are certain sooner or later to spoil them. One. Two. 
The individual presenting himself for membership in the sodality must forswear whatever religious faith he may happen to be encumbered with his contempt for. These crack-brained beliefs and for the fictitious object of worship they revolve around will be judged by means of tests to which he ought to expect to be. But the penalty of immediate expulsion is prescribed for those who, however mildly, and even in the spirit of jest, backslide into these abject practices. 3. I, God, in the view of the sodality, does not exist sound evidence of atheism, is a prerequisite for entry into it. The sole divinity it recognizes is pleasure to pleasure it, sacrifices everything it considers voluptuous activities, all imaginable voluptuous activities, and nothing but voluptuous activities, sacred whatever delectates. It considers good within the sodality all forms of pleasure-seeking and of pleasure-taking are authorized. It frowns on none. There is not one it does not applaud, encourage, and promote. 4. Guiding. The sodality dissolves all marital ties and ignores those of blood under its roof. One should disport indiscriminately with the wife of one's neighbor as with one's own, should for enjoyment consult one's own brother, sister, children, nephews, quite as one would do with the brothers, sisters, children, nephews of somebody else, and any unwillingness to comply with these rules constitutes strong grounds for expulsion. 5. A husband is bound to present his wife for admission, a father, his son or daughter, a brother, his sister and uncle, his nephew or niece, etc. 6. Entry into the sodality is barred to those unable to indicate a minimum yearly income of 25,000 livres, dues of membership being 10,000 francs per annum. This sum is the equivalent of average estimated costs per member, and out of it are paid expenses entailed by the upkeep of the sodality's seat, rentals, maintenance of the seraglios, carriages and equipages, offices and functionaries' salaries, outlay for the assemblies, suppers and lighting. And when the treasurer reports a favorable balance at year's end, he divides it among his fellow members, and in that other case where disbursements have exceeded revenue, a tax is levied and the deficit made up to the treasurer, whose word in these matters is always accepted without question. 7. Tingao. Twenty artists and literary figures are to be admitted upon remittance of the modest fee of a thousand livres per annum. This special consideration is part of the sodality's policy of patronizing. The arts it regrets that its means do not permit it to welcome, at this insignificant price, a larger number of these gifted persons to whom it would give every kind of encouragement. 8. T. The members of the sodality, united through it into one great family, share all their hardships as they do their joys. They aid one another mutually in all. Life's various situations, but alms, charities, help extended to widows, orphans, or persons in distress, are rigorously forbidden, both within the sodality and a above all without should proof be brought forward, or the simple suspicion arise, that a member has indulged in such so-called good works, he will be expelled. 9. An emergency fund of 30,000 livres is kept in constant reserve and is at the disposition of any member who by accident or ill fate finds himself in difficulties of whatever sort. 10. Can. The president is elected by ballot, and his period of office is one month he may be of either six and presides at twelve assemblies, whereof there are three per week. His duties are to see that the sodality's laws are respected, to supervise the correspondence executed by a permanent committee whose chairman is the president. The treasurer and the sodality's two executive secretaries sit on this committee. But as with the president, each executive secretary's term of office expires after one month. 11. Each assembly is opened by a speech delivered by one of the members. The tenor of his address is always contrary to polite custom. And religion, if it is deemed worthy thereof, it is printed forthwith, at the sodality's expense, 
and deposited in its archives. Wells Trio. During those hours devoted to corporate frolicking, all members, male and female, are naked, they intermingle. In the melee, partners are chosen indiscriminately, and there is no such thing as a valid refusal whereby one individual would deny his pleasure to another. Once called upon, each individual must cooperate instantly, unreservedly. Gladly has he not the right to demand the same a few minutes later. Should an individual attempt to shirk his obligations toward his brethren, he will be forcefully constrained to fulfill them, and then be driven ignominiously out of the sodality. Third Team During assembly, no cruel passion, save whipping inflicted upon the buttocks only, may be given vent to the sodality possesses Siraglios, and their dangerous passions may be exercised with entire freedom, but when amongst his fellows each member must confine himself to crapulous, incestuous, sodomistic, and benign merrymaking. 14. The completest confidence reigns among members of the sodality they may, and ought to avow to one another their tastes. Their foibles chat intimately, and employ the exchange of confessions as a further spur to pleasure. Were anyone to disclose sodality secrets, or in one of his fellows to criticize ungenerously the failings or predilections which make for the success of his pleasure-seeking, he would be expelled straightway. 15. Hard by the public pleasure hall are located private cells, whereunto one may repair solitarily to indulge in all the debaucheries of libertinage. These cells are available to groups of any size. They are appropriately and fully equipped, and each contains a youth and a young lass with whom, at all times, sodality members may execute any passion whatsoever, including those allowed only inside the seraglios. For these children being of the same species as the seraglios are stocked with, and indeed belonging to the seraglios, they may be treated similarly. 16. Eating and drinking carried to any point of gluttony and drunkenness, are authorized every member is assured of assistance while indulging in these, as in other excesses, all possible measures are taken to facilitate them. 17. No condemnation by a court of law. No public disgrace. No defamation of character. Will disqualify a candidate for admission into the sodality. Its principles being based upon crime, the criminal element poses no threat to it to the contrary. Rejected by the world, these outcasts will find consolations and friends in a society which recognizes their value and will always give preference to their candidacy. The worse a given individual's reputation abroad, the more highly he will be thought of by the sodality very notorious criminals and eminent Public enemies may be elected to the presidency upon the day of their admission, and given the run of the seraglios without prior novitiate. Eighteen time. Public confession is made at each of the four major general assemblies, the dates of which coincide with what Catholics call the four great festival days of the year. At them each member is in turn obliged to declare in a loud and clear voice by and large, Everything he has done if his conduct has been blameless. He is reproved much praises his if it has been irregular, be it horrible. If he has accumulated execrable deeds, then he is rewarded. But in this last case, he must produce witnesses. The prizes are fixed at 10,000 francs, drawn from the treasury. 19 type. Frequented by members only. Their location known to members alone. The sodality's premises are of particular splendor and surrounded by superb grounds. Fires are maintained in all rooms throughout the winter season. Assemblies begin at five in the afternoon and last until noon the following day. Toward midnight, a sumptuous meal is served. Refreshments are available at all other times. 20. All games and gambling are forbidden during assembly devoted to more natural forms of recreation. The sodality frowns upon anything. In any way conducive to the neglect of libertinage's divine passions, the only ones capable of electrifying the human being. 21. One month is the period of initiation for each newly elected member during this novitiate. He is completely at tea. 
The disposition of the sodality is its toy may not enter the seraglios or enjoy any privilege or consideration. He must consent to all such propositions as are made him failure so to do, may incur capital punishment. 22. Election to all posts is by secret ballot factions, cabals, cliques, are strictly forbidden. These posts are those of president, the two executive secretaries, censors, the two wardens entrusted with government of the Siraglios, treasurer, steward, bailiff, the two physicians, two surgeons, obstetrician, master of the chancery, under whom are the scribes, the printers, the reviser, and the censor of texts and publications, and the inspector general of admission cards. 23. Men over 40 years of age, women over 35, are not received by the sodality once admitted, however. No member may be expelled on grounds of old age. 24. Any member who does not attend a sodality assembly during the space of a year will be stricken from the roster obligations, public or private, however, constitute valid excuse for absence. 25. Any written work attacking polite customs or religion presented by a sodality member, whether of his production or no, will be deposited at once in the library, and the donor will be rewarded therefore, in accordance with the merits of the work, and his share in its composition. 26. Children resulting from sodality unions will be, at birth, immediately placed in the creche, and subsequently in Thebes. Nursery annexed to the Seraglios, latter at the age of ten for boys, of seven for girls though, become inmates thereof. But a woman addicted to childbearing will not be tolerated by the sodality, propagation being utterly alien to its spirit and aims true libertinage abhors progeniture and the sodality. Therefore disfavors it female members will denounce men given to this mania. And if the latter prove incorrigible, they also will be invited to prepare their withdrawal from the sodality. 27. The President's duties are to ensure the smooth running of the Assembly. Under his orders is the censor theirs is the responsibility for maintaining decorum and a propitious atmosphere, the calm, the freedom from interference, the enthusiasm of agents, the submissiveness of patients they are, as well to see, to the preservation of quiet, Moderating laughter and conversations and everything else that is incondite and not in the spirit of libertinage or that is damaging to it. The president has the highest authority over the seraglios. He may not, during his term of office, leave sodality headquarters unless he appoints his predecessor to take temporary charge in his absence. 28. Oaths, hard language, and blasphemies in particular are authorized. They may be employed upon all occasions. Between members, the familiar thou is compulsory. 29. The jealousies, the quarrels, the scenes entailed in love, as well as the language of love, endearing expressions, tender ones, etc., are absolutely prohibited. All this is detrimental to libertinage, and libertinage is the business to which the sodality is to attend. 30. Dueling has no place in the sodality nor roistering, neither do bullies and bravos. They will be expelled mercilessly. Poltronery is revered here as it was in Rome. The coward lives at peace with his fellows. He is quite commonly a libertine, too. Such are the people the sodality wants. 31. The total number of members may at no time exceed 400, and in so far as that is possible, the proportionate strength of the two sets will be kept equal. 32. Theft is permitted within the bounds of the sodality, but murder is not, except in the seraglios. 33. Members need not bring with them the furnitures, implements, and weaponry. Requisite to libertinage for the house provides these objects in abundance and variety, and they are clean. 34. Repulsive deformities or diseases will not be put up with. Someone so afflicted were he to present himself, would most surely be rejected, and were an already admitted member to fall prey to such misfortunes, he would be asked to resign. 35. A member who contracts the venereal malady, 
will be obliged to retire until completely restored, his recovery being vouched for by the house physician and surgeons. 36. No foreigner will be admitted. Provincials are likewise debarred. The sodality exists only for persons resident in Paris and its environs. 37. High birth will in no wise facilitate admission. The essential is to prove one has the necessary means alluded to above Article 6. However pretty a woman may be, she shall not be accepted unless she possess the required wealth. The same will apply to any young man, however handsome. 38. Neither beauty nor youth confers any exclusive privilege in the sodality privileges would speedily destroy the equality which must prevail there. 39. Death will be the certain fate of any member who divulges secrets of the sodality, which will have him hunted down no matter where he goes and at no matter what cost. 40. Ease, liberty, impiety, crapulousness, all libertine excesses, all those of debauchery, of eating and drinking, in short, of what is known as foul lust, will reign supreme during assembly. 41. One hundred male servants are retained at all times and paid by the sodality they, youthful and attractive all, may be used to fill passive roles in lewd scenes, but will never participate actively therein. The sodality owns sixteen vehicles. A corresponding number of teams has two equerries in its hire and fifty outside valet. It has a print shop, typesetters, a dozen copyists, and four readers and, in addition, all the personnel necessitated by the seraglios. 42. No firearms, no sword, no stick may be introduced into the hall, reserved for pleasure. Before entering, members leave all they have with them in a spacious cloakroom, where trustworthy women relieve them of their clothing and are held accountable for it. Adjoining the hall are several public conveniences stationed in each our attendants, girls and boys, ready to be of any service they have syringes. Bidets, vessels in the English style, ordinary pots, high-quality linens, cloths and swabs, perfumes and in general everything needed before and after the operation, or while it is in course. They will lend their tongues upon simple request. 43. Under no circumstances does the sodality intrude or interfere in government affairs, nor may any member. Political speeches are expressly forbidden. The sodality respects the regime in power, and if its attitude toward the law is disdainful, that is because it holds as a principle that man is incapable of making laws, which obstruct or contradict those of nature, but the disorders of its members, transpiring privately, ought never to scandalize either the governed or the governors. 44. Among the facilities offered sodality members are two seraglios. They are located in the two wings of the main building. One is composed of 300 boys ranging from 7 to 25 years of age, the other of a like number of girls, from 5 to 21. These creatures are constantly replaced. Not a week goes by, but at least 30 are winnowed out of each seraglio, so as to make room for fresh accessions close by is an establishment where new lots are trained up to fill gaps in the ranks. Sixty procuresses look after recruitment and, as has been said, there is a warden for each seraglio. These seraglios are agreeable places, comfortably appointed there. One does exactly what one likes. The most ferocious passions are exercised in a these sanctuaries where all sodality members are admitted free of charge, however, a tax of 100 crowns is levied per creature murdered. Those members who choose to sup in a seraglio are at liberty to do so. Entrance tickets are distributed by the president, who cannot refuse them to members in good standing and who have accomplished their month as novices. The extremist subordination on the part of the inmates prevails in the seraglios complaints relative to lack of submissiveness or of cooperation will be taken at once to the warden of the seraglio or to the president and no time is lost chastising the miscreant according to the plaintiff's specifications and you have the right to inflict the penalty yourself if such things amuse you there are twelve torture chambers per seraglio where everything is at hand for dealing with victims in the most awful the most unspeakable manner.
Although each seraglio contains creatures of only one sex, they may be mixed at will and to taste, males being fetched into the midst of females or females into the midst of males. There are in addition 12 dungeons per seraglio for the use of those who enjoy subjecting victims to the slow death of incarceration. Inmates of the two seraglios may not be removed either to the pleasure halls or to a member's personal residence. The lateral pavilions housing the seraglios contain menageries as well, where animals of every species await the member. Given to bestiality, this is a simple passion and altogether natural, and must hence be respected like all the rest. Three complaints brought against any one subject suffice to have him removed. Three requests that he be put to death suffice to have him dispatched without further ado. In each seraglio are four executioners, four jailers, eight whippers, four flayers, four midwives, and four surgeons all at the orders of members who, in the heat of passion, might have need of the ministry of such personages, it being understood, of course, that the midwives and surgeons are present not by any means to render humanitarian aid, but to assist in tortures. As soon as a seraglio inmate manifests the slightest symptom of illness, he is sent to the hospital, never again to return to the house. Each seraglio is surrounded on three sides by high walls. All the windows are barred, and the inmates remain indoors, always. Between the building and the high wall shielding it is a space ten feet wide, forming an alley bordered by cypress trees sodality members sometimes. Take seraglio inmates for walks along this secluded pathway to indulge with them in pleasures more somber and often still more frightful. At the foot of a number of these trees are holes, pits into which a victim may be made to disappear. Suppers are held under these trees from time to time, and occasionally in these very pits whereof some are extremely deep, descent into them being possible by means only of hidden stairways, and in the lower reaches of which one may accomplish every imaginable infamy. The same stillness, the same silence reigning there as in the uttermost bowels of the earth. 45. No candidate will be admitted without first signing both the oath he will be made to repeat and the list of obligations corresponding to his sex. The time came to leave. I was adorned like the goddess of daylight, Clarewell. My sponsor was in a gay mood and out of coquetry, had dressed herself to look like a girl of fourteen. En route she reminded me of the extreme docility I was to show, in the face of all the sodality members' desires. And she also said that as regards the young, Seraglios I would simply have to be patient for. As a novice, it would be a month before I could make use of them. No exception was ever allowed to the rules. The house to which we were driving was in one of the bleakest and least populous quarters of Paris. It took nearly an hour to get there. My heart beat excitedly when our carriage entered a dark courtyard virtually enclosed by tall black trees. The gates shut immediately after we were inside. A servant was awaiting us as we stepped from the carriage, and he escorted us into the hall. Clairewell was obliged to surrender her clothing. I, however, was to undress later in the course of the ceremony. This was a veritable palace. Superbly lit in the entrance and so placed on the floor that one could not avoid treading upon it was a big crucifix sprinkled with hosts and at whose farther end was the Bible, which one had to step upon as well. I was not daunted, you may be sure, by any of these obstacles. I went in. An exceedingly handsome woman of thirty-five was presiding. She was nude. Her coiffure was magnificent, those. To her left and right, where she sat on the platform of honor, were naked also. They were two men and a woman. Over three hundred members had already arrived. And there they were. All naked, some were in cunting. Some na some flagellating. Some cunt-sucking. Some sodomizing. Some discharging and all that most serenely and amidst perfect calm, not a sound was to be heard, save the noises necessitated by the various circumstances. Some were strolling about in pairs, some alone many were watching the crowd and while gazing at spectacles, fingering themselves voluptuously. There were several groups, some of them composed of up to eight and even ten persons, many of men only know. 
fewer of women exclusively of several women between two men and of several men occupying two or three women. Extremely pleasant incense burned in great castellets, emitting heady vapors whose irresistible effect was a sort of sensual languor. I saw a trio emerge together from one of the latrines, and then the president rose, and in a quiet voice said that she would like to have the attention of the assembly for a moment. Activity soon ceased, and a few minutes later I found myself surrounded by all the members present. Never had I been so closely scrutinized, nor by so many people each delivered an opinion. And I believe I can assert that the view generally expressed was flattering there was whispering, glances, nods were exchanged, and clearly all sorts of fool. Little plots were being hatched against me, and I shuddered at the thought that I was about to have to subject myself to all the desires roused by my youth and my charms. At length the president bade me step up and stand on the day as opposite and there, a balustrade separating me from the very numerous company. I was upon her instructions divested of my raiments by two servants, who in less time than it takes to tell, had off every stitch I was wearing. When the servants withdrew and left me absolutely naked before the bold stares of those several hundred spectators, I was, I do admit, somewhat embarrassed. But that feeling was short-lived. My impudence was restored at once by the applause I heard ring out. These, such as I shall recite them to you, were the questions the President put me and my answers to them. Do you promise to live your whole life long in libertinage of the very extremist order? I swear it. Do you esteem all lewd acts, whatever they be, and including the most odious, to be simple and natural? They are all as one to me. Thus do I consider them. Would you commit each and every one of them if moved by the slightest desire? I would indeed. All of them. Do you declare your intention to adhere strictly to the sodality statutes as they have been read out to you by your sponsor? I do. And are you prepared to accept the penalties prescribed? Therein should you prove refractory. I am. Swear it. I swear. Are you married? No. Are you a maid? No. N have you been embuggered? Often. Fucked mouthwise. Often whipped upon occasion what is your name juliette de tonnen your age i am eighteen have you been fragged by women many times have you committed crimes a few ow stolen yes attempted the life of a human being i i have do you promise never to swerve from the path you have followed until now i do swear it here a new burst of applause. Will you bring into the sodality all those related to you by bonds of kinship? I shall. Do you agree never to reveal the secrets of the sodality? I shall never reveal them, I swear. Do you promise to exhibit the completest indulgence toward all the caprices and all the lewd whims of all sodality members? I promise it. Whom do you prefer, men or women? Where friggery is concerned. I am very fond of women where f I have a passion for men. My naivete brought forth a wave of laughter from the corporation. What sink you of the lash? I like to use it, and to have it used upon me. Of the two pleasures a woman can procure, which do you prefer, cut or sodomy? It has befallen me to disappoint the man who encunted me, but never him by whom I was but. This reply was much appreciated also. And your attitude toward oral pleasures? I adore them. Do you like to have your c licked? Infinitely. And do you lick well the c of others? With industry and enjoyment and, I have been told, with art. It may then be presumed that you enjoy sucking pricks. Draining them. You swallow. I gorge myself. Have you had offspring? No, none. Do you intend to refrain from having them? I shall do everything in my power to avoid them. You, therefore, dislike progeniture? I detest it. Were you perchance to become pregnant, would you have the courage to abort? Certainly. Has your sponsor with her the sum constituting your entrance fee? Yes. Are you wealthy? Exceedingly. And have you ever devoted any of your money to charity? Of course not. 
nor have you ever performed a religious gesture since childhood. Not to my knowledge. Clarewell handed the fee over to the executive secretary from whom in return she received a small brochure I was instructed to read it aloud. This printed document was headed by the title Instructions to Women Admitted into the Sodality of the Friends of Crime. From a drawer, Madame de Losange took an envelope, opened it. I have kept the paper, said she. For it is interesting. Listen to its contents too. The estate or condition into which was born, she who is to sign this matters, not in the least, she is a woman, and as such created for the pleasures of man. It were hence seeming to prescribe to her a mode of comportment which would enable her to make the rendering of her services advantageous to her purse and agreeable to her fleshly needs. We shall suppose her married. For those who, though unmarried, live nevertheless with a man, whether as his mistress or as his whore, are bound by the very same chains as those who exist in wedlock's irons, and they will be able to employ the following recommendations to similar purpose, that is, the escaping from those chains or the lightening of them, wherefore note will be taken that the word man as used here generically means lover, husband, or keeper, or in fine any individual arrogating to himself, writes to a woman whatever her sort, because, be she in possession of millions, yet she must still earn money from her body. The first law for all women, being never to f save through libertinage, or for the sake of gain, and as she is often obliged to pay those who please her, she must accumulate the necessary reserves, therefore, by means of her price to those others who do not please her. It being fully understood, that all that follows concerns her behavior in society only, the statutes she having just sworn to observe and uphold, fixing her behavior within the confines of the sodality. 1. To attain to the apathy that must be preserved, she will, regardless of whether it be for money she f or for pleasure, take constant care to keep her heart inaccessible to love for, if she f for pleasure, shall obtain little, if in love, love being the veritable and certain kiss of death, to enjoyment her inevitable concern to give pleasure to her lover, will prevent her from tasting any herself, and if she fuss for money. If in love, she will never dare squeeze it from her beloved, which, however, ought to be her unique object in occupation with the man who pays her. To own, eschewing all metaphysical sentiments, she will always therefore court preference to him, who, if it be for pleasure, she fuss, erects quickest and most sizably, has the prettiest prick, or the hardest, and if it be for gain, she fuss, to him who fees her most amply, Thremshan, Banuizazin, oh, she must scrupulously, and at all times avoid such personages as are called fops, idle fellows, dancing masters, and the like. That dronish breed pays as poorly as it fuss, let her resort rather to valors, stable boys, porters, drudges, butchers, such are the breaches, energy, and habits. Such souls keep secrets safe. Menials are plentiful, moreover. They can be changed like skirts, and with never a moment's fear of an indiscretion. Nua. Oa. Whatever be the man into whose clutches she falls, let her take care not to consider his proprietorship exclusive fidelity, an infantile habit, and romantic sentiment. Can bring about nothing but the downfall of a woman, can be nothing but the cause of woes without end, and never the source of a single pleasure and indeed. Why should she be faithful since, and she may be very sure of it, in all the world, there is no such thing as a faithful man. It is ridiculous, is it not, that the more fragile, the weaker sex, the one forever open to every enticement into every pleasure, the one whose surrender thereto is authorized by daily, the one whose surrender thereto is authorized by daily. And then if old seduction's absurd, is it not, that it should be this that resists temptation while the other has his means for evil doing, nothing but his unaided solitary wickedness, and more, what's the use to a woman of her fidelity? If her man loves her truly, 
he must be of sufficient delicacy to tolerate all her failings, and even to share vicariously in the delights she procures herself, and to rejoice therein if he loves her not. A silly creature she, who would be bound utterly to someone who deceives her day in and day out, woman's infidelities. Faults, if you wish, are natural. Those of a man proceed from his duplicity and his viciousness, the species of woman we have in mind. That is, a healthy and intelligent woman will hence spurn no occasion to be unfaithful. Rather, she will seek such occasions and exploit them as often as possible, and to the full. Five. Thou. Deceit is a characteristic no woman can forego. It has ever been the weapon of the weak always confronted by her superior. How shall she withstand oppression unless she have frequent recourse to lies and imposture? Therefore let her fearlessly use these arms. Nature furnished them to her, in order that she have some defense against her enemies men wish to be dupes. An agreeable illusion is easier for them to swallow than a bitter reality, and so ought she not disguise her wrongs instead of proclaiming them. 6. A woman should never appear to have a character of her own. She must, artfully, borrow that belonging to this or that person, whom it is to her greatest interest to flatter at the moment, whether it be for the sake of her lust or her greed. Seeing to it, nevertheless, that this flexibility does not deprive her of the energy essential for plunging into all such sorts of misdemeanors and crimes as are pleasing to her passions or apt to serve them, Examples being adultery, incest, infanticide, poisonings, robbery, robbery, murder, all those in fine which may be to her liking, and which behind the mask of deceit and the treachery we recommend to her, she may undertake without fear, pause, or regret. Because nature placed these impulses in woman's heart, and only false principles acquired along with education, prevent her from acting in accordance with them every day, as she ought to do. 7. Dainta. Far from alarming her, let the most extensive, the most sustained, the most crapulous libertinage become the basis of her most cherished occupations, if she lends an ear to nature. She will discover that from her she has received very pronounced leanings, very violent ones, toward this sort of pleasure. And there being no grounds, here, for fear, and fewer yet for restraint, she ought to indulge herself therein constantly. The more she fights, the better she answers nature's expectations of her. Nature is not to be outraged save by continence. 3. Stein. 8. Whatever the act of debauchery her man may propose to her, let her never balk readiness and goodwill are her surest means for maintaining a hold over him she wishes to keep. A man soon wearies of a woman's favors what happens if she lacks the ability to revive his interest. He ceases to care for her, begins next to loathe her, and abandons her shortly afterward. But he who remarks a woman devoted to the study of his tastes, to anticipating his desires, to kindling and to satisfying them, ah, that man, finding the woman in his possession always new, is much more apt to settle down to contenting himself with her, the woman is now in a position to deceive him. And deceiving her man is the fondest and the most unrelentingly pursued objective of the individual belonging to the sex whose duties we are sketching here. 9. Dada Wine Let this charming individual very assiduously avoid an air of prudishness and of modesty. When she is with her man, few. Indeed they are who appreciate such posings, and great is the risk of promptly alienating those who are repelled by them. Let her simulate them in public, if she deems this imposture necessary. Anything in the direction of the EU. Hypocrisy is to be recommended. It is one further means to deceit. And she should neglect none of them. 10. Tao Wo. She cannot be too strongly urged to avoid pregnancies, either by making extensive use of those various manners of fun which deflect the seed away from the vessel where conception occurs, or by destroying the photos once she suspects its existence. Pregnancy is telltale, spoils the figure, endangers the health, is bad from every point of view, let her indulge, preferably, in antiphysical pleasure. 
This delicious form of it assures her simultaneously greater enjoyment and greater safety. Nearly all women who have tried it will have no other the thought. Moreover, of the enormously increased pleasure they thus give men, ought surely. And here we consider their amor propre alone, to spur them to adopt it exclusively. Eleven. Let a very hardened heart be her protection against a sensibility which is certain to be her undoing a woman susceptible of sympathies, must expect nothing but the worst. For weaker, more delicate, thinner skinned than men, she will be rent much more cruelly by all that assails this sensibility, whereupon she may bid all pleasure farewell. Her complexion moves her to lust, if, owing to this excess of sensibility, we are seeking to destroy, she enslaves herself to one man only, as of that moment she deprives herself of all the charms of libertinage, the libertinage which, in view of the way nature has constructed her, alone befits her, can alone render her truly happy. Dels are Arnold. Let her meticulously avoid any practice of religion. These infamies, which she ought long ago to have spat upon, can only, as they affright her conscience, Recall her to a state of virtue she shall not re-enter without being forced to renounce all her habits, and all her pleasures those frightful platitudes are not worth the sacrifice they demand, and like the dog in the fable, she will, as she chases after them, relinquish the reality for the appearance. Atheistic, cruel, impious, libertine, wanton, insatiable, a sodomite, a tribate, incestuous, Vindictive, bloodthirsty, hypocritical, and false as such by and large is the description of the woman who will find her rightful place in the sodality of the friends of crime. Such are the vices she will have need of if she would find happiness within the sodality. The spirited reading I delivered of these precepts convinced the assembly I had taken them quite to heart, and amidst claps and hurrahs I stepped down into the press. The couples distracted from their proceedings by the rights of my admission now fell back to their merrymaking, and I was soon under assault at this point I lost view of Clarewell, and was not to see her again until supper. First to hail me was a gentleman of fifty. By Jesus, and blind if you don't have the look of a whore, he exclaimed, steering me toward a couch, and you talk like one, too. I liked your style, slut. It put my prick in the air. So saying, the lecher encunts me. He scrapes away for a quarter of an hour. The while kissing me fervently, then, claimed by a woman who plucks him straight off my belly, he deserts me without having discharged. It's next a lady in her sixties who approaches, and thrusting me back upon the couch before I can rise, she frigs me, and has me frig her at great length. Three or four men have been watching us, one of them suddenly moves in and embuggers the matron, who lets forth a screech of pleasure. Another of the men, noticing I had been entering into a sweat beneath the old lesbian's fingerings, had offered me his prick to suck, and now that the woman leaves off toying with me, the rascal glides from my mouth to my cunt. He had the prettiest prick in the world and wielded it like a god a girl steals it away from me and stows it impetuously. Into her slit, my rival nods to me. I answer the summons, and she sets to cunt licking me. She got his f from the man whom I de hope to drain, and by and by she got mine too. A pair of youths sauntered up and joining us formed the most pleasant group. In cunting us both, my companion went off with the lad who had just served her, leaving me alone for a moment. Here now was a personage I recognized as a bishop for whom I had toiled in the past, when with Madame de Virgie he incunts me also after having me piss on his face. The next to come, and this ecclesiastic was also a familiar face, popped his member into my mouth and let fly therein. A very engaging young thing arrives to have herself frigged. I suck her with all my heart. Her heaving flanks are caught firmly in mid-flight by a man of about forty, who bum-stuffs her. It is not. Long before the libertine has done the same to me, while tupping he reviled us most energetically calling us nuns, cunsuckers, and as he sodomized the one, he spanked the behind of the other. What are you doing to these two buggerises? asked a well-made young man who strode up then and Socratized him on the spot. Take that, 
villain. He went on. It's not woman ass that will cure what ails you. Once again I was left to myself and was recovering my breath when an elderly man presented himself. He had a fistful of wives and meant to warm my hind parts therewith and to have me warm his prick. You are the one they admitted tonight, are you not? He began. I am. A pity I haven't come across you until now, said he. I have been busy in a seraglio. You've got a damn pretty ass. Bend over. Let me get into it. And he stormed triumphantly through the gate. I got his f A delightful young man appeared and dealt with me in the same way. Though he lashed me far more stoutly next. One after the other, a procession of ten persons, six of them men of the law and four men of God, they all f me bumwise. I was quite a fire, I repaired to a public convenience, as women were using only those where men were in attendance. It was a lad who, after settling me upon the throne and helping me off again, asked if he could lend me his tongue. By way of reply, I thrust my ass at his nose, and so pleasantly did he clean it that f escaped me. Returning to the assembly hall, I remarked some men weighing about, apparently to waylay women emerging from the privies, and indeed one of them steps up and asks leave to kiss my ass. I wheel it about, his tongue probes a moment, he straightens up, and from his sorrowful expression I divine his disappointment at finding the cupboard so bare. It is without a word he hastens away from me to join a youth, just then entering the same privy, and I profit from a brief respite to survey the scene. Believe me when I say that there, in that spacious room, the overall spectacle was one such as distanced anything the most. Lascivious imagination could possibly conceive in the course of threescore years what a wealth of voluptuous attitudes. How many curious doings. What a variety of tastes and preferences. Oh, great God, I murmured. How wondrous indeed is nature! How splendid! And how delicious are these, all the passions she gives us! But everywhere my eye roved, it was to be amazed at the same extraordinary state of affairs, save for the utterances incidental to the action. Sometimes shrill exclamations of pleasure, and much blasphemy, sometimes loud. There was no other sound. One could have heard a pin drop. Over all that was astir the most entire order reigned, with some altercations to arise, and it happened very rarely. A gesture from the president or the censor restored peace and quiet in a trice. The most decent activities could not have transpired amidst greater calm, and thus I was made quickly to realize that, of all the things there are in the world, the passions are those that command the greatest respect from human beings. Men and women in ever-growing numbers were beginning to remove to the Seraglio's tickets, were being distributed by the president, a smile upon her lips. I was now had by several women then, by several more I frigged with no fewer than thirty-two of them. A good half of whom were past forty, they sucked me. F me frontwise and behind with dildos. One had me piss into her gullet while I lapped her cunt. Another suggested we shit on each other's bubs. She larded mine generously. I was unable to repay her in kind. Unfortunately, while a man labored in his asshole, a second man gobbled up the excrement steaming on my chest. And after that, he shat there in turn, as he did so discharging into the mouth of him by whom he had just been sodomized. The president developed a sudden craving for me, she appointed a man to relieve her at her post. And we came to grips, kissed each other, tongued each other, sucked and caressed each other nigh to death. With the exception of Claire Will, never had I seen a woman discharge so abundantly, nor so lewdly. Her favorite stunt was to receive a bum a while. Her c crushed upon a woman's face. That woman sucked her, and she herself cunt-sucked another woman. We went brilliantly through this exercise and the whore resumed her chair. Back came the men, in force. Among this second wave, I found few encounters but buggers aplenty. An occasional master botter, and a dozen or so mouth one of dozen or so mouth -fuss. The latter had himself pumped by a youth while snuffling under my armpits, licking them softly ever and anon, which procured me 
a very pleasant sensation. I was given five or six floggings, three or four rectal injections, which I flushed into the mouths of those who had administered them. I was got to fart. There were bitters for my spittle. I spent thirty whole minutes sticking thousands of pins into one squire's buttocks and balls, and thus bestudded did he keep himself for the rest of the evening. The mania of another was was. To run his tongue over a woman's body, he was two hours lapping my eyes and mouth, and ears and nostrils, and between my toes, and finally inserted his tongue in my asshole, and discharged. Several women insisted upon f me with great massive dildos. One let up a man, and had me heat his prick by chafing it upon her asshole, and next required me to push the f into it with the tip of my finger a dear little creature, utterly besmeared my buttocks with her shit. Behind her stood a middle-aged man. He embuggered her while eating the marred clean off my ass. I was informed they were father and daughter. There were other such couples I beheld brothers embuggering their sisters' fathers, in cunting their daughters' mothers f by their children. In a word, every possible scene of incest, of adultery, of sodomy, of lechery, of whoring, of foulness, of impiety, each under a hundred various forms, and a hundred various forms. Various colors took place before my eyes, and surely at no bacchanal of old was there ever such a concurrence of so much nastiness and so much infamy. Weary of the victim's part, I was eager to play an active role in my turn. I intercepted half a dozen young men whose pricks attracted me for size, and who now in this sector now in that, and sometimes in both at once, f me steadily for nearly two hours. At the close of that episode, a venerable abbot had himself frigged on my cl by his niece. A ravishing creature I sucked her cunt, and a handsome young fellow must kiss my behind while he embuggered his mother. Two pretty sisters got me between them. One frigged my cunt as the other fluttered about my ass. I discharged quite unaware that their papa was all that time in cunting them alternately. Another father had me embuggered by his son, and in the meantime enjoyed the boy in the same manner, and subsequently sodomized me himself while enduring at the hands of his son precisely what he had done to him shortly before. A brother encunted me. His sister nun simultaneously buried her cross in his ass. And all these supposed outrages to nature went forward amidst a serenity and with an orderliness such as might give a moralist pause, and perhaps turn him into a philosopher. For indeed, if one but reflects a little, one finds nothing odd and in nature allows it, encourages it only local. Legislation outlaws it, but may something tolerated in three-quarters of the world be truly a crime in the other four. He was an enviable act I had not the wherewithal to commit, and the thought saddened me. Ah! What would I not have given to have had a father or a brother? And how ardently I would have surrendered myself to the one or the other, entreated him to do with me all he wished. Soon I was surrounded by other objects, two pretty sisters of eighteen. They were twinsled me off to a privy, and bolted the door upon them I executed everything of the most piquant and the most disgusting lewdness can suggest. Were we to attempt to amuse ourselves this way in the assembly hall, they explained to me. Twenty of those dreadful men would soon be clustered around us, squirting their horrid sperm left, and right it's ever so much nicer to have a little privacy. Don't you agree? Whereupon the little minxes confess their tastes to me. Fastidious votaresses of their own sex, they found men unbearable even to their sight. It was their father who had drawn them into the sodality. Though distressed at having to submit to men, they found compensation in being able to have their fill of women. I take it then that you have no intention of marrying. Marrying? Never. Death would be a kinder fate than that of becoming slaves to husbands. As I plied them with questions, they revealed to me the rest of their principles. Uncommonly firm for persons of their age, brought up philosophically by their father. They were pure of any taint of morals or religion. All that had been skillfully weeded out of them, there was nothing they'd not done. Nothing they went ready to do again, and their energy amazed me such characters sorted too nicely with mine for me to keep from expressing my feelings. I overwhelmed those delightful girls with caresses, and after we had all three, 
loosed very floods of fuck. We promised to remain in touch and started back to the hall. A slender young man, noticing me emerge in their company, now came up to me in an anxious undertone. He requested a brief interview, and in his company, I retraced my steps into the privy. I had only just left. Great heaven, said he the moment we were alone. How I shuddered to see you with those two creatures. Beware of them, I tell you. Be on your guard. They are monsters, monsters, who, despite their youth, are capable of every conceivable horror. But, I put in, is it not thus one ought to be? He stared at me, to be sure. He nodded, but in one's relations with members, one ought to be kindly, respectful, affectionate. Outside, why steep your sword in blood? Of course, but not here. Believe me when I say those two bits take pleasure only in doing mischief to their brother's wicked. Cunning, treacherous. They have every trait needed for expulsion from this sodality. I cannot understand why the permanent committee does not act. Why, my dear? They amuse themselves with somebody. And that's enough. From then on their one aim is to destroy you, or to enslave you if they can. Be grateful to me for having warned you and thank me by turning your ass this way. I suppose he was going to fight. Not at all. This odd fellow limited himself to plucking out the hairs around my asshole, and to licking it to my protest that he was hurting me. He replied that, owing to his warning, I would be spared far worse. After fifteen more minutes of this vexatious business, we left the privy, although my young man had not a we parted, and shortly after I learned that everything he had said about the two sisters was utterly untrue. That calumniating others aroused him. And that, so he reckoned, her profound indebtedness to him would lead any woman to endure the treatment he subjected her to. Sweet music was now to be heard. It was supper being announced. And I went with the others into the voluptuous dining hall. It was decorated so as to appear a forest. Between the trees were countless little glades, within each of which was a table set for twelve. Garlands of flowers hung in festoons from the trees. Thousands and thousands of candles, disposed as skillfully as in the assembly hall, shed a soft light. Two servants delegated to each table served it promptly, cleverly, and in silence. Scarcely two hundred persons were present, the rest were all in the seraglios. You chose the table you wished, and there, among friends, splendidly regaled, to the sound of enchanting chamber. Music you gave yourself up simultaneously to the intemperances of Cumus, and to all the lewd riotings of Cyprus. Claire Will, back from the seraglio, had sat down next to me. Her manifest agitation betokened recent excessive behavior, the hard glitter in her eyes. Her flushed cheeks, her unloosened hair floating over her breasts, the obscene, ferocious language coming from her mouth. In everything there were reflections and echoes of the transport, which made her a hundred times lovelier to see. I bent toward her, and we kissed. Villain, said I, what ocean of horrors have you been swimming in? Be not envious, she returned, when next I plunge back into them, and it will be soon you will be at my side. The two little sisters with whom I'd been a frigging earlier in the day, two women of forty and of wit, two other exceedingly attractive ones of twenty and twenty-five, and six men made up our table. Owing to the studied placing of the glades, there was not one table from which you could not see all the others, and the cynical spirit in which the whole thing had been. Framed was also evident in the fact that no lubricity here in the dining room would be any less visible to the observer's eye than had been that in the assembly hall. By virtue of these arrangements I was witness to some unusual sights. There is no describing the reeling of a vicious brain at such times. I had thought myself thoroughly versed in libertinage, thought I had nothing further to learn, and that evening I was convinced I was yet a callow fledgling. Oh, my friends! What impurities, what abominations, what extravagances. Some of the celebrants were constantly leaving table and repairing to the latrines, and it was impossible to. Refuse to do their bidding the desires of sodality members were laws for the individuals they focused upon. 
The latter soon found opportunity to demand of others what had been demanded of them wherever you glanced. It was masters and slaves you saw. And the slaves, steadied by the knowledge that the roles would be reversed shortly, complied unhesitatingly with orders it would be their turn to issue in a moment. Raised upon a throne from which she could oversee everything, the President maintained order at the supper as before in the hall, and the same calm prevailed. Conversations were held in a subdued tone, one could easily imagine oneself in the Temple of Venus, whose statue, moreover, was visible inside a bower of myrtle and roses. And the foregathered worshippers, one perceived, tastefully avoided disturbing their rights by any of those rude vociferations which are proper only to pedantry and stupidity. Rare wines and succulent viands made the after-supper orgies even more luxurious than the preceding ones. There was a moment when the entire sodality united in a single immense group. Not a member was inactive, and nothing could be heard but a deep murmur of voluptuous moans accented by the gasps and shrill cries heralding discharges. I had further assaults, terrible assaults, to sustain... Individuals of every set passed through my hands. Not a spar on my body was left. Unsullied, and if I ended up with fearfully battered buttocks, mine also was the glory of having wreaked havoc upon innumerable others. Day dawned at last, and I came away so whelmed by fatigue, so dry from delicious exertion that I had to keep to my bed for a day and a half. My month-long novitiate seemed an eternity it came finally to a close, and mine now was the so hotly coveted right to penetrate into the Seraglios. Clarewell, eager to acquaint me with everything, guided me everywhere. Nothing could be as delicious as those Seraglios. And that holding boys being identical to that offering girls, the description of one will give you as well a picture of the other. Four large rooms ringed by bedchambers and cells formed the interior of each of these isolated wings. The large rooms were for the use of those who wished to enjoy themselves publicly, the cells for those who preferred privacy in their pleasure, and the inmates were lodged in the chambers. Taste and art presided over the furnishing the cells especially were of the highest elegance. So many little chapels consecrated to libertinage, where nothing lacked that might be instrumental to stimulating worship. Four duennas governed each seraglio they took the tickets you brought with you inquired of your desires, and saw speedily to their satisfaction also on hand. Ready to offer their services were a surgeon, a midwife, two fustigators, an executioner, and a jailer, all of prodigiously melancholy aspect. You are not to think, Claire will remark to me, that those individuals there have simply been picked at random from the class that ordinarily supplies them. They are libertines like us but less prosperous unable to pay the admission fee. They fulfill their functions out of pleasure. And just as you would suppose, the job is done better in this manner. Some of them receive a stipend. Others ask only to enjoy members' privileges. These are granted them. While on duty those personages wore awesome costumes, the jailers had on great belts whence hung rings of keys. The fustigators carried about a battery of whips and martinets, and the executioner, swart, bare-armed, fearfully mustached, had a cutlass and a stiletto at his side. Zane Clare will enter. The executioner rose from where he was sitting on a stool and greeted her with a kiss. Have some work for me today, buggeris. Look here, she answered. I've brought you a novice. Count upon it. Shall have at least as many chores for you as I and the wicked fellow, kissing me as he had done my friend, assured me that he was in every sense at my command. I thanked him, embraced him most warmly, and we resumed our visit of the place. Each of the four central rooms was reserved for a particular category of passion in the first. You gave way to simple ones. To that is to say, all the various forms of men and fu The second room was the theater of fustigations and other irregular passions the third of cruel proceedings, the fourth of murders. But as an inmate delegated to any one of these rooms might merit imprisonment, the lash or death, the staff of each included jailers, fustigators, and executioners. 
Women were admitted into the seraglio of boys, and into the other of girls. Men likewise could frequent either. Arriving, we found all the inmates being employed, or else in their chambers waiting to be put to use. Claire Will opened a few doors and showed me some truly heavenly creatures they were in gauze shifts, had flowers in their hair, and welcomed us with an air of profoundest reverence. I fell to toying with a lovely thing of sixteen. I was already handling her breasts and cut. When Claire Will scolded me for the delicate and unduly decent manner I was employing. That's not the way you behave with this trash, said she. They don't even deserve the honor of being selected for our consumption. Command. They obey. I altered my tone at once. And my orders were responded to with blindest obedience and inspiring alacrity. We entered other chambers, the same charms everywhere, the same beauty, everywhere the same submissiveness. You know, I confided to Claire Will, we really must not go away without leaving our mark. The thought occurring to me while we were in a chamber occupied by a thirteen-year-old girl, pretty as love herself, by whom for better than a quarter of an hour. I deep having my cunt asshole tongued, I immediately chose her for my victim, we summoned a fustigator, a duenna led the child off to one of the torture chambers, and there, having roped her fast, we bade the specialist perform upon the little miss and frigged each other, while the blood streamed down her body. Claire Will, perceiving the fustigator to stiffen, developed his arrest and snapped his device into her cunt, while, at that libertine's request, I bestowed upon him what he had just meted out to our young victim the scoundrel withdrew from Clarewell in order to stuff me, and then we returned to whipping the little girl, who, when we were finished with her, was in such a sorry state as to have to be conveyed to the hospital the following day. We removed to the seraglio of males. What have you a mind to do here? Clarewell wished to know. Get my hands on a lot of engines, was my reply. I like nothing so much as to squeeze a prick. For me it is a delicious activity, the gathering of human f- I love to glean it, harvest it, to see sperm spurt, to feel myself wet by it, to wade and bathe in it. Well, go ahead then, said my friend. Do as you like for my part, I require a stronger diet. May I make a suggestion? It's an arrangement I sometimes come to with a lady of my acquaintance, as I dislike having pricks unload in my body. I can nevertheless warm them in my cunt, and when they are hot, turn them over to you which will spare you the bother of tedious preliminaries. Excellent. We installed ourselves in the first of the main rooms, and were sent fifteen lads aged between eighteen and twenty. We ranged them in the... a line in front of us and then sprawled on couches. Then by way of defiance Claire will, and I struck the lewdest possible attitudes. The most poorly endowed of those boys had a mechanism measuring seven inches long, by five in circumference, and the best. Twelve by eight, one by one. They moved forward. Roused by the ardor we kindled in them, Claire will met each, dallied a little with it, then shunted it on to me. I made them flow over my breasts, between my thighs, my buttocks, on my neck and face reaching for the sixth. I felt such a furious itch in the neighborhood of my anus that from then on I presented my behind to everything. Which emerged from Claire Will's vagina, they filled out in her cunt, and emptied in my ass the tempo quickened. They redoubled their efforts, but one's hunger so to speak, grows from eating. There is nothing quite like a woman's temperament when excited. It is a sort of volcano you only further inflame in your attempts to appease it. We called for more men. A fresh batch of eighteen arrived for this second round. We changed roles these pricks, and they compared very favorably with the fifteen we had just exhausted. Caught fire in my cut and died out in the ass of my companion, but we divided the task of frigging and more than once it befell that. The order we had established upset by the excessiveness of our desires, we found ourselves with six or seven either in us or exploding all around us. When finally we got to our feet, spattered with f puddles of it on the couches, like Messalina rising from the bench after her lewd bouts with idiot Claudius guards, we had each been topped eighty-five tons apiece. My bum itches, 
Claire will declared. Whenever I have been grandly fucked, I always feel an incredible need of whipping. I admitted to the same longing. We had better send for a pair of fustigators. Let's have four, said I. My ass has simply got to be made a hash of this evening. Wait, said Claire Will, nodding familiarly to a man who entered just then. We can perhaps make something dramatic out of it. She went over to the newcomer and conferred with him in an undertone, he smiled. Adopted a threatening air, called to the fustigators. Zeit to them, he cried. We were seized, our hands were tied, and we were both beaten while this man looked on, palpetting his engine and fondling the buttocks of off. Our assailants, when once the blood was fairly flowing down our backs, we presented cuts to our tormentors who, monstrously pricked, fucked each of us twice. And now by way of reward for my cooperation, said the master of ceremonies, I merely ask you to hold one of these lusty fellows, while I give his bum a taste of meat. We comply with his request, he sheathes his weapon, the others flog him while he is fox, and we in seventh heaven suckle the whipper's pricks. I cannot stand it any longer, said Claire Will. When we found ourselves alone, libertinage leads me fatally to cruelties. Let us immolate a victim. Did you notice that pretty lad of eighteen who kissed me so feelingly? He was as sweet as an angel to behold, and gave me all sorts of ideas. Into the torture room with him, I say. Well cut the little dog's throat. Why, Claire Will, said I. Why didn't you propose something like that when we were in a female seraglio? It's simply that I prefer to butcher males. I've never pretended otherwise I enjoy avenging my sex. And if it be true that the other possesses a superiority over ours, is not the fictitious offense to nature all the graver when we kill men? One would suppose that you regret that this offense is null. You grasp me aright, my dove. For me, it is a source of immense despair, ever to seek the crime, and know where to find anything but the prejudice instead. Um, suck! By God's invenoming fuck! When she sighed. Oh, when shall I be able to do an authentic evil? They fetched us the youth. Shall we need an executioner? Don't you think we can dispatch the thing well enough by ourselves? Why, I believe we can try. Let us... We had our victim installed in an adjoining cell where there awaited us everything needed for the piecemeal destruction of the peace. Young man, his agony was slow. It was ghastly. The infernal Claire will drank of his blood and swallowed one of his testicles. Less given to these masculine murders than she. My transports were probably not so violent killing a woman. At any rate, would have excited me more be that as it may. I discharged copiously and, quitting that seraglio, we directed our steps toward the other. Let's go to the room where extraordinary things are accomplished, I propose. If you don't care to do anything, there is no reason why we must, but we shall be able to watch. A man in his forties, he was a priest, had a pretty little girl of fifteen hanging by her hair from the ceiling. He was stabbing her with a long needle. Blood covered the floor. He embuggered Claire Will, while gnawing my ass. Another was plying a whip over the breasts and face of a beautiful girl of twenty. He confined himself to inquiring. Would we like to have the same done to us? It was by one ankle the third had suspended his victim. Most ingeniously, we agreed. And laughed merrily at the sight she looked to be about eighteen. And superbly made the position she was, and caused her cut to start wide open. Into it... The villain was ramming a wooden member studded with nails. Noticing our presence, he invited Clarewell to hold the girl's free leg and to pull on it so as to open her cuff farther still, and he had me kneel beside him, ordering me to rub his prick with one hand, to massage his asshole with the other. It was not long before Clarewell and I were drenched in the blood gushing from the victim. The fourth person in action was an elderly magistrate upon a grill he had chained a delicious twelve-year-old, and by means of a huge charcoal brazier, which the scoundrel now approached, and now drew away. He was roasting her by inches. I leave you to imagine what were the screams the poor little soul would give vent to whenever her tormentor saw fit to resume the cooking of her flesh. When he saw us, he shoved the stove into place and asked for my ass, I present it, 
While he drives into it, he mauls Clarewells, but he discharges. Tis prematurely and a calamity thief. Torture is interrupted while there is yet an hour or so of life in the victim. The villain's joy is cut short. He curses us for having come along and spoiled everything for him. All this had put me in a sanguine mood. I insisted upon proceeding to the murder room. Clarewell was nothing loath to follow me, although she was not fond of killing women. Neither was she opposed to their destruction her native tigerishness leading her to accept whatever flattered her tastes. I had twenty girls stood in line, and from among them selected one of seventeen. She was as engaging a creature as any you have ever seen. A vacant cell was designated to me by the duenna, and in the three of us went. The wretch I was about to sacrifice, fancying I would be sooner moved to pity than a man, cast herself at my feet in a ludicrous effort, to sway me a very angel. For beauty and full of grace, her methods would certainly have succeeded with a less toughened adversary, with someone whose soul was less corrupt than mine. I had developed beyond the point where pleas are heard. Rather, the only effect her wiles had upon me was to fan the flames of my irritation. And indeed, even had it not been so, would I have dared relent in Claire Will's presence? After having this lovely girl suck me two hours straight, after having slapped, buffeted, beaten, and thwacked her, after having maltreated her in every conceivable way, I had her bound upon a table and drove a dagger again and again into her body, while my friend, squatting over me, simultaneously titillated my clitoris, the interior of my vagina, and my asshole. Rarely had I enjoyed a happier discharge, I literally discharged myself dry, and afterward was so exhausted, I felt it would be useless to return to the assembly hall. Instead, I invited Clarewell to come home with me. We supped and then retired to bed together. It was then that charming personage, inclining to the belief I had lacked somewhat of determination in my latest performance, decided she had best speak to me. And this is what she said. The truth, Juliet is that, a certain undeniable progress notwithstanding, your conscience has yet to reach the stage I should desire what I demand of it, is that it becomes so warped as to be unable to reassume its former shape to achieve this there are means to employ. I don't mind indicating what they are, but I am not so sure you have the strength to apply them. Those means, my dearest friend, are simple in themselves. They consist in doing, immediately, in cold blood. That very thing which, done in the throes of passion, has been able to cause you remorse, when later on you recover your wits. This way you strike squarely and hard at the virtuous impulse the instant it bears itself, and this custom of attacking it head-on at the first sign of its reappearance. And it tends to reappear once the senses have subsided into calm. This, I say, is one of the most certain fashions of destroying it definitively employ this secret. It never fails directly a moment of calm favors, the resurgence of virtue, announcing itself under the colors of remorse, for that is always the guise it wears in its endeavor to regain ascendancy over us then, directly when you perceive it. Commit forthwith the act you are wont to regret by the fourth repetition of the trick you shall hear the nagging voice of conscience no more and you shall be at peace for the rest of your days. But this is no trifling matter. It calls for strength, discipline, and a certain ruthlessness with oneself it is, you understand. Illusion which invests crime with its attractiveness, and a weak spirit encounters greatest difficulty committing it when, totally self-possessed, illusion there is none. The means I propose are valid nonetheless, indeed. I may assure you that virtue itself will safeguard you from remorse. For you shall have acquired the habit of doing evil at the first virtuous prompting, and to cease doing evil, you shall have to stifle virtue. Oh, Juliet, be sure of it. This is the best advice you are apt to receive in this important connection, and you realize its worth. Since by carrying it out you surmount the most painful of situations, victory being yours, whether you choose to combat it by vice, or to annihilate it by virtue. Clarewell, said I to my friend, your suggestions are excellent, doubtless, but perhaps unnecessary. I am not without experience in the profession of vice, 
and the soul in me requires no fortification. Neither does my purpose. Rest assured. You shall never see me falter, whatever the deed to be perpetrated, whether for the sake of my material advantage or for that of my pleasure. Dear heart, said Clarewell, hugging me to her, I beseech you to have no other gods than those. Somewhat later, Clarewell called upon me and proposed an unusual exploit. We were in the season of Lent. Shall we go and make our devotions? Are you mad? Not at all. I have had a truly extraordinary idea in my head for quite a while, and you are the companion I want to have in this adventure. At the Carmelite convent there is a friar of thirty-five, the most gorgeous creature in the whole wide world, and I have had my heart set upon him for the past six months. I simply must be fucked by him. And this is how we shall manage it. We shall go to have him hear our confession. Tell him a few tales, lewd ones, hell become aroused. I am absolutely certain we need do no more to have him make us a proposition he will explain how we are to get together. Well, go to the rendezvous and well, drain the Holy Brother's balls. And more well, go to communion after that. Well, hide the hosts one way or another and bring them home and at lunch well, find some. Not very Christian use to which these abject symbols may be put. Here, I felt moved to remark to my friend that of her two schemes, the first struck me as far more sensible than the second. Once we have ceased to believe in God, my dear, I pointed out, the profanations you have in mind become so much pure childishness, the worse for being useless. Childishness, yes, she rejoined, that I cannot deny, but they excite me mentally, and for that I value them. Nothing, in my view, is surer proof against backsliding. One cannot accord any seriousness to objects one treats in such a manner. May I add that I suspect doubts may still be warranted of your firmness in these matters? Ah, Claire will banish them out of your mind, I retorted most energetically. You err. If anything, my atheism is perhaps solider than your own. At any rate, it is not to be bolstered by such nonsense as you have just proposed. I shall join you in these undertakings because they please you. But for me, they are mere amusements at best, and in no wise necessary, either to the strengthening of my opinions or to their demonstration. As you like, my beloved, said Claire Will, as you like, we shall execute them for pleasure's sake alone. Seducing the friar by means of a confession. This is worthy of us but my stars, Claire Will. Profaning a wee bit of a wee paste disc, which happens to be the idol of imbeciles, why that amounts to no more than tearing up or burning some scrap of paper. To be sure, but to your scrap of paper no meaning is attached, whereas the better part of Europe assigns a very holy significance to that host, to that crucifix. And that exactly is why I am fond of profaning them I hate at public opinion. That entertains me. I vomit on the prejudices they strove to inculcate in me when I was young. I obliterate them. That excites me. Let's be away, said I. We went by carriage, our simple, artless toilets conformed wonderfully to our designs. And Brother Claude, whom we asked for, and who quickly seated himself in the confessional, could not have taken us for anything but models of piety. Clarewell opened fire first. It was plain. The poor friar was listing very heavily when my turn came to loose a broadside. Oh, my father! I cooed. Grant me much indulgence, for I have horrors to divulge to you. Courage, my child, stammered Claude. Great is the goodness and mercy of God. He listens to us with infinite understanding. What have you to confess? Enormities, father. Sins which a frightful libertinage makes me commit every day young though I am. I have violated every commandment. I have ceased, yes, ceased to pray, and God has become a stranger to my soul. Oh, intercede in my behalf. Very sore is my distress. And my lewd doings, ah, you shall tremble when you hear about them. I hardly dare speak. Are you married? Yes, father. And not a day passes, but I outrage my husband by behaving in the very worst way. A lover, a tendency, an indomitable longing for men and in general, 
and a liking for women to a fondness for every possible variety of debauchery. You are then, I take it, hot-blooded. Hot-blooded? Insatiable, father, that's what I am. It's this hunger that is dragging me farther and farther into vice, hurling me so violently into it that I dread I must succumb in spite of all the aid religion can be. Must I avow it? Dare I? Oh, father, at this very moment, the pleasure of holding this secret conversation with you is upsetting me. I, convulsing me, counteracting the effects of pardon, I seek God in this holy place, and whom do I find? A charming man beneath his cassock, and, woe is me, I sense myself ready to forget the Lord. My daughter, said the poor friar, his voice shaking now, the state you are in afflicts me only great penances. Ah, the crudest for me would be never to see you again. Why is it the ministers of God are as though illuminated by charms that distract from the sole object which ought to occupy us here? My father, this sanctuary, this interview have not restored me to serenity. Instead, I, oh, heavenly man, your words speed to my heart rather than to my mind. I came hither in search of peace. But it is restlessness, excitement that has hold of me. Can we not meet elsewhere? Can we not flee this box? It frightens me. And will you not cease a little to be the man of God and take the part of Juliet's lover? Claude Erection stamped him as a true Carmelite, the milk-white and rose-tipped breast ID cunningly brought into view. My sparkling eyes, gestures, and fumblings which pointed to the emotions I was at grips with beside himself. The ecclesiastic capitulated. Fair lady, he replied. And his tone was impassioned. Your friend, in a case very like unto your own, has also proposed things. Ah, which your starry gaze inspires and which I I burn to do. I, your two sirens, your sweet words bewitch me, and I am no longer able to resist let's leave. The church I have a small room. It is not far from here. If you will consent to come, I shall do everything in my power to put you at ease. Then, stumbling from the confessional and grasping Claire will by the hand follow me. Ladies, come with me. The foul fiend has sent you to tempt me. Ah, was he not a match for God Almighty himself? He must then best a poor friar. And out we go. Night had fallen. There was no moon Claude told us to look sharply after him, but to keep twenty paces back. He set off for the Vaugirard barrier, and we soon found ourselves in a mysterious and chilly cell the good Claude offered us cakes and liqueurs. Excellent, sir, my companion said to him. Enough of this mystical chatter. We know the kind of man we are dealing with. We love you. Why, what am I saying? We are quaking from a frantic desire to be f by you. Join us in laughing at the ruse we employed to get this far. Contrive to make us feel our efforts have not been for naught. Speaking for myself, I tell you, I have worshipped you for a year, and I have been leaking for two hours in anticipation of your pri- There, went on our libertine, tossing up her skirts. There's where I de have you lodge it look. Is the cage not fitting for the bird? Promptly flinging herself upon the bed, the said the fellow's engine out in a trice. And an uncommon engine it was. Christ tears. Will you behold it, Juliet? cried Clarewell, already half swooning away. Here, catch this mast if you can get your hands round it, and steer it at me. Be dear ill, do the same for you in a moment. Clarewell is heated the bludgeon thunders into a cup which, already, had been yawning a welcome to it for fifteen minutes. Oh, my friends, how justly they refer to a Carmelite when wishing to describe the optimum in erected pricks. Our Claude's member, like unto a mule's, showed nine and three-eighths inches round the stem and thirteen inches in overall length. Head clear and included in that formidable head, my friends. I was scarce able to encircle it with both hands. Twas the noblest, the most rubicund mushroom the human imagination can picture. By a miracle of nature, a miracle nature performs only in behalf of her favorites. Claude had been furnished with three balls, and how full they were. How swollen. 
Twas he himself declared it, not a drop of sperm had he shed in a month. What torrents thereof he spewed into Clarewell's cup the moment he touched bottom. And into what transports this enormous had pitched my voluptuous friend. Fucking her, Claude handled me, and his dexterous manipulation of my soon wrung away from me too. The friar withdraws, I paw him. Clarewell remains in position. The tool dilates. Hardens anew, in response to my skillful attentions. For Claude, breaking away from the hand guiding him, would dive again into the gaping vagina. No, no, says Clarewell, fending off her impetuous lover. Juliet, make me desire him. Lick my clitoris. And Claude, rather than stand idle during these preliminaries, falls to caressing me while with one hand he holds Clarewell's cunt agape for me. He mounts me with the other. Like the fiery steed that will not be restrained by the bridle or bit, Claude leaps into the beckoning hole and stretching me out beside Clarewell. The rascal, gone quite berserk, while furiously f the one of us pollutes the other with equally prodigious effect. His assassinating me, the great swine, shrieks Clarewell, swearing like one of the damned ah by the balls of the Almighty. I can't resist this buffeting. Every blow is costing me a pint of sperm can. You not at least kiss me, pig that you are? Can't you stick your filthy tongue as deep into my throat as you've buried that club of yours in my womb? Ah, by f- I'm coming but you. Keep yourself in check, she adds, expelling him with a powerful heave of her flanks. Don't squander your resources. I am going to call upon you again. But poor Claude could not contain himself and prepared to unleash a second emission, seeing what he was up to. I seized his instrument and, stroking it, aimed the boiling flood into Claire Will's wide starting cunt. He was with f I tried to extinguish the fires, f ignited. Ah, double f my eyes, Claire Will expostulated, getting to her feet. This bugger here would fain break me in two. Juliette, you'll not outlive his attack. However, she catches hold of the friar begins to rattle his pike to hasten its elevation. The s endeavors to mouth him, but the engine of this servant of God is too massive to fit between her lips, resorting to another stratagem. She pokes two fingers into his vent with the true-born buggers that all friars are. Such means seldom fail. In response to Claire Will's libertine questioning on this head, Claude allows that, as a youth, he played the bardash to his confers. Why then, well, f you too, cried Clarewell, bringing Brother Claude's ass into plainer view, kissing his buttocks and tonguing his anus. Yes, we shall sodomize you, she went on, exhibiting a dildo. Your mistress will turn into your lover. Fuck, good friend, I am going to embugger you and afterward you'll embugger the two of us if you like, see here, she said, showing the Carmelite her behind. Isn't this as appealing as the cuve just rioted in? We're whores, you understand, a rant little whores. We're good for any purpose. And when we go somewhere to be fucked, it is with the intention of having no part of ourselves left untouched. To work, great beast. Your pricks aloft fuck this nice little novice who treated you to such a pretty little confession. Encur. Let that be her penance. And f her as hard and as roundly as you f me. She trundles the awful object toward me. I was lying on the bed, my thighs widespread. The altar offered itself to the sacrificer, but my thoroughgoing libertinage. Notwithstanding, and however, much I was used to accommodating the best pricks in Paris, I was simply incapable of coping with this one without preparation. Clarewell takes pity on me with her saliva. She anoints both my labia and the colossal knob, tipping Claude's device next. With one hand pressing my buttocks so as to close the gap between the target and the lance, she managed to bury it to the depth of perhaps an inch, perhaps two. And heartened by these auspicious beginnings, Claude took a firm grip upon my flanks. He swears, he sputters, he drools. The gates seed. The fortress falls, but his triumph costs me dear. I bleed as never I did the day I lost my maidenhead. And the pain is as great this soon transforms. 
However, into the sweetest sensation of pleasure, and to each of my conqueror's lunges, I reply with a telling ripos. Steady there, steady, cries Clarewell to my rider. Control those thrashings. I cannot take fair aim at your ass unless you hold still, and I promise to fight. You recall. Claude grinds to a halt, Clarewell. Parts two very fine buttocks. A dildo strapped around her loins. The wench bum stuffs my fu- This operation, so precious to a libertine, nay, so indispensable, serves only to increase his agility. He wriggles. He squirms, he sounds. He discharges I have not time enough to get out of the way, and even had it happened less rapidly, would I have fled to safety? Ah, one is blind to danger when one is drunk from pleasure. My turn, said Claire Will. We shall grant him no quarter. Here you are, bugger. My ass thirst for the mead. In with you, and draw blood if you can blood. What care I for the loss of a little? Clap on the dildo, Juliet. Sodomize him just as I did, and he'll reap the benefits you enjoy. Claude, aroused by my caresses, by the prospect of the fair behind Claire Will, presents him, and of the laughing hole in its center, is not slow to revive. I wet Claire Will's anus with my tongue and oil, the holy dart of Christ's well-furnished minion. Unimaginable the difficulties Claude encounters in penetrating. Twenty times over he quails before the Enterprise. Twenty times must he resume the assault. But most cunning is my friend. Subtle her maneuvers, ardent her desire of that prick. And in the end, it is every inch housed and to the hairs in her bowels. He's crippling me. She shrieks. She would escape. She would be rid of the gargantuan glaive run into her vitals. Too late. The fabulous weapon is ensheathed entire, and now belongs as intimately to her as to its wielder. Ah, Juliet, gasps the hard-pressed Claire Will. Leave this bugger be. Has excited enough as things are at present. I'm in far greater need of your hand than his bum is of your dildo. Come frig me, my child, for I am dying. Despite her pleas, it's to as fun the friar I devote my main attentions, howbeit. Reaching out an arm, I frig my companion who, thanks to a lively tickling, faces Claude's onslaught with truly admirable courage. Truly, I overestimated my capacities. She sighs, Juliet. Do not imitate my brashness. It could well cost you your life. Claude is discharging by now his performance, rare hitherto, continues to astonish. The villain bellows and brays, growls and grunts, and far, very far inside Clairwell's bowels, deposits certain proof of the pleasure overwhelming him. It was a much tattered and torn Clairwell who emerged from the fray I was bent upon, replacing her there. I refuse to permit it, said she, adamant. One must not, she added. Risk one's well-being for an instant's vain pleasure. This is no man we have here, but a bull. I am prepared to wager whatever you like that never before today... Has he been able to find a woman to fuck? And Friar Claude nodded in assent. In all Paris, he declared, only his superior's asshole had succeeded in compassing his prick. Eh, how's that? Do you then embugger, wretch? Claire Will demanded. Frequently. And thou sayst mass? Thou shrivest? Being withal soiled by thy dirty practices? Why not? Amongst men, the greatest believer is he who serves the most gods. Mesdames, went on the ecclesiastic, seated between us and fondling an ass with each hand. Mesdames, do you really fancy we set any more store by religion than you do? Dwelling closer to the being it presupposes, we are in a better position than others to perceive the features of the falsehood. Religion is all a shoddy fiction, true, but it provides us with a living, and the merchant must not disparage his wares. We traffic in absolutions and gods the way a pander sells whole for all that. Are we otherwise fleshed than yourselves, insensible to your passions? And do you think some ridiculous unctions, a few absurd affectations and smirks, are sure protection against the stings of human instinct? Far from it. The passions, writes a wise author, 
acquire additional force beneath the frock. The heart harbors those seeds. Example brings them to flower. Idleness fertilizes them. Occasion causes them to multiply or assist the passions. By what possible means? It is in the ranks of the clergy, my dear ladies, that you find the authentic atheist doubters you may be, you others, skeptics perhaps. But you cannot even begin in to realize the hollowness of the idol, whereas we, its ministers, we, to whom its care is entrusted, there's not a one of us who is not convinced of its inexistence. All the revealed religions you come across in the world are full of tenebrous dogmas, unintelligible principles, unbelievable wonders, astounding stories, the whole mumbo jumbo invented. Apparently, for the sole purpose of insulting the intelligence and flouting common sense without exception, they all announce an invisible God whose existence is unfathomable. The behavior ascribed to him is as puzzling, as inconceivable as his very essence if he existed. Would the divinity have spoken in such riddles? What's to be gained from revealing yourself? Merely to talk nonsense. The greater the freight of mysteries it carries, the less accessible to the comprehension a religion is, and the more it pleases the fools who wallow in it, as in their element, the more shadowy, obscura, and dubious a religion, the diviner it looks to be, the closer, that is, it conforms to the nature of a hidden and intangible being of whom no clear notion can be formed. Tis a characteristic of ignorance to prefer the unknown, the fantastic, the far-fetched, the incredible indeed, the terrible, to whatever is forthright, simple and true. Truth titillates the imagination far less than fiction. The vulgar ask for nothing better than to listen to the preposterous fables we retail inventing religions and forging mysteries. Priests and lawgivers catered splendidly to the desires of the rabble. By means of creeds and codes, they gathered a following of enthusiasts, women and simpletons. Such individuals dispense very easily with proofs. They are incapable of examining love, of the simple, love of truth, are to be found only amongst those, and they are few whose imagination is governed by study and by reflection. No, mesdames, no. Be assured of it. There is no God. The existence of that infamous phantom cannot possibly be imagined. And all the contradictions it is composed of suffice to explode. It to a need but deign to inspect it closely, and poof, it is no more. During this discussion, the friar seated between us, as you know, was palpitating our asses. Beautiful behind, he murmured, alluding to mine. What a shame not to be able to thread that straight. But perhaps if we were to try, oh, madame, with a little kindness on your part, for surely, one so fair cannot be so cruel. Ruta, said I, rising from my chair, he'll not even lend you my cunt. It still smarts from what you did to it, and I am not eager to subject myself to worse. Catch hold of him, Claire Will. We'll make him discharge till the blood seeps from his balls. Otherwise hell give us no peace. We laid him upon the bed. Claire will clamp his member between her breasts and I, squatting over his nose, had him kiss the door to the temple I forbade. Him to enter he tongued it timidly at first, then more boldly, and sliding a hand to my bush fell to exercising my clitoris, and once again we discharged. Claire will ask the friar whether there were other such libertines as he, in his monastery upon Claude's affirmation, that there were at least thirty. My friend wanted to know if it might be possible to pass an evening amidst the whole brotherhood. Certainly, Claude answered. If ever you wish a memorable f you have only to come, and you will be treated royally and to more than you bargain for, I dare say. Claire Will then asked if the impious revels she had her heart fixed upon could also be held at the monastery. Better there than elsewhere, said the Carmelite. You shall be able to do whatever you like under our roof. My dear, Claire Will said. Rather than join you only to be disappointed, pray go and speak to your superior, explain. The matter to him bring back his response. We shall attend you here. As soon as the friar had departed, Claire will turn to me, a wicked glitter in her eye. 
Juliet, said she, you will not be surprised to hear it that fellow f me well, too well for me not to desire his death. What? Are you already plotting the wretch undoing? The loathing I have for men once they have satisfied me is in direct proportion to the pleasure I have had from them, and it's been a great while since I've discharged so exquisitely. He must die, I say. Two means occur to me that of having him placed in pace by his superior to arrange. This we need merely intimate to that chief for that. Dunja is involved in having such a person as Claude at large, a person capable of blathering the secrets of the house to all and sundry. But by proceeding this way he is entirely lost to me, and I have designs on his wondrous engine. But how are these projects to be carried out if you have him put to death? I see no reason why we might not induce him to spend twenty-four hours with us at your country estate for the rest. Never fear. Ah, Juliet, what a dildo hangs under that bugger's belly. My friend declining to enlighten me further. While waiting for the friar, we passed the time inspecting his quarters. It was a mine of obscene engravings and literature that we turned up the first volume was La Portilla Chartreux. Five more, a bawdy production than a libertine one, and which, despite the touching candor and sincerity permeating it, was, according to rumor, disowned by the author as he lay on his deathbed. Nah, what folly! The fellow capable at such a time of repenting what he dared say or write in the course of his life is a rank coward whose memory ought to be execrated by posterity. The second was the Academie de Dames, a well-conceived work, but poor in the execution done by a faint-hearted man who seems to have scented the truth but was afraid to tell it and full of boring conversations. L'Education de Laura was the third book we found. Another complete failure, owing to extraneous and false considerations, dominating the composition. Had the author brought the wife murder frankly onto the stage, instead of leaving it off somewhere in the wings and made something substantial of the incest, which he hints at constantly, but never, explores had he increased the number of lewd scenes, shown in action those cruel tastes, he restricts himself to mentioning, abstractly, in his preface, the work, most imaginative. Would have been delicious, but tremblers are my despair. I lose all patience with them, and would prefer a hundred times over that they write nothing rather than give us bare ideas only. And in halves at that, Therese Philosophe was there. A charming performance from the pen of the Marquis d'Argens. Six alone to have discerned the possibilities of the genre though only partially realizing them alone to have achieved happy results from the combining of lust and impiety. These, speedily placed before the public, and in the shape the author had initially conceived them, finally gave us an idea of what an immoral book could be. The others were all examples of those deplorable little pamphlets commonly got up in coffee houses or in brothels, and which regularly reveal mean-spirited buffoons toiling at the instigation of hunger and under the guidance of some burlesque muse lust, the child of opulence and of superiority, cannot be treated save by persons of a certain condition, of a certain quality, that is, by persons who, favored by nature at the outset, have after that benefited from wealth enough to be able themselves to try what they describe in their lewd pages. Well, as we are reminded by their gropings and feebleness of expression, such experiences totally denied the smutty fellows who flood us with the low scribblings I am speaking of, among which I do not hesitate to include those of Mirabeau, who in order to be something would fain be a libertine, and who in fact throughout the whole of his life was nothing at all. 7. Pursuing our search through Claude's belongings, we came upon dildos, ketanani tales, articles from which we were able to deduce the extent to which the friar was familiar with libertine practices, and now, he returned. I have, he reported, my superior's formal consent. You may come whenever you wish. It shan't be long before we do, my friend, said I after being so liberally entertained by a single member of the order. We cannot but anticipate wonders from the Thay. Rest no need to tell you we have fiery cunts. From what you have already seen of them, you may judge what they will be able to undertake, when still better served. While waiting, Claude, let me invite you to pay us a visit, my friend, 
and I will be delighted to receive you at a pleasant little place I own in the country, and where we are going in three days' time. Will you come? You will enjoy yourself. Between now and then, let me recommend repose. Don't fail us. The opportunity being present, we thought best to have a word with the superior. He proved to be a handsome man of sixty, who greeted us with utmost cordiality. Ladies, we will be most happy to welcome you, he declared, among the thirty friars who are worthy to participate in these orgies. I promise you a score between the ages of thirty and thirty-five who, membered like Claude and possessing the vigor our vocation expects, will treat you according to your highest hopes. As regards secrecy, you have no cause for fears which may not be groundless when such activities are undertaken in mundane surroundings. You said, did you not, that you are interested in a few impieties? Ah, we know all about those little matters. Leave everything to us, ours are capable hands. Fools maintain that monks are good for nothings. We mean to prove to you, Mazdams, that Carmelites at least are excellent for fun. Language so forthright following upon our late trial of Claude eliminated any last vestige of doubt about the spirit in which we would be entertained. We therefore notified these honorable anchorites that we would avail ourselves of their hospitality and furthermore bring with us two pretty girls to collaborate in and further our amusements, the which, despite our vexation at having to postpone them, could not, owing to various pressing affairs that would detain us, be scheduled before Easter. That date was acceptable to our hosts, and, Clarewell remarked as we came away, appropriate to the impieties she was still meditating. I don't care what others say, she insisted. I am going to derive pleasure from profaning the holiest mystery of Christianity during that very period of the year when one of Christianity's great holidays falls. Easter lay nearly a month off, and this interval being marked by two outstanding occurrences. I believe I shall speak of them at this point, before relating what followed in the Wagar Libertinage among the Carmelites. The first of these events was the tragic death of Claude, the unlucky chap, arrived in the country. On the appointed day, Claire Will was there with me, we introduced him into the most pleasurable surroundings. He was in seventh heaven, and when his prick had attained to full and towering erection, then my wicked friend, signaling to the five women to seize him suddenly and pinion him, sliced that peerless member off with a razor, severing it close later, giving it close later, to be prepared by a learned physician. She thus acquired herself the most extraordinary, and I dare say the biggest dildo you have ever clapped eyes on. Claude departed this world in dreadful pain. His agony was not pretty to see the sight of it fed Claire Will's lubricious rage. And as she watched him expire, three women and I frigged her at a distance of two feet from her victim. So now, the whole said to me after having splashed her foe over us, did I not tell you a means had been found for doing away with the bugger without losing him altogether? I now come to the second of these two events, and I do not suppose it is any more to the honor of my soul than the stunt I have just finished describing was to my friends. Surrounded by a crowd of sycophants and clients who seemed to be thinking that their fate lay in my lap. I was occupied with my toilet when a servant ushers in a middle-aged man, visibly of mean condition, and who begs me for a brief private interview. I have it explained to the fellow that I am not in the habit of receiving such folk as he, that if the matter be one of aid or a good word spoken to the minister, the case may be presented to me in writing and I will consider whether anything can be done, but the shabby visitor will not be put off. More from curiosity than anything else, I decide to give him audience and have him wait in the little drawing room where I held private parleys at the time then. Instructing my servants to remain within call, I go to find out what business has brought this individual to me. My name, madame, is Bernol. The stranger begins, a name with which you are surely unacquainted. It would be less unfamiliar to the mother you lost, to that excellent woman who, were she alive, would not allow you to continue this however lucrative existence of shameless disorderliness and misbehavior. Sir, I interrupt, your tone does not strike me as fitting to somebody who has come to ask a favor. Softly, Juliet. Softly, Bernona replies.
It is nonetheless possible that I am going to ask you a favor, and equally possible that I have rights that allow me to adopt this tone which displeases you. Whatever be your rank, sir, I would have you know that. And I would have you know, Juliet, that if I have come to ask your help, you ought to be flattered by the request. Kindly look at these papers. Young lady, a glance will inform you of my need of that help, and at the same time of your duty to grant it. I had but to scan those documents. My God, I gasped. What? My mother? She was guilty? And with you? Precisely. Juliet, I am your father. And Bernal spoke most crisply. I brought you into this world. I was a cousin of your mother. My parents had prepared the match. We were already betrothed when the offer of another marriage, a more advantageous one, induced them to alter their plans. They sacrificed your mother at a time when she was pregnant. You were in her womb. She and I contrived to deceive the man whom you knew as your father. He was completely taken in. You are not his child, but mine I can prove it. Below your right breast is a birthmark, a brownish spot the size of a small coin. Juliet, have you one such mark? I do, sir. Then recognize your father, O oh, cold, unfeeling soul. Or if you are not willing to believe me, read through these papers with a little attention. They will banish every shred of doubt. After the death of your mother, and it was a horrible death. The vicious doing of one Norsu, the same with whom you... Excused by no ignorance of the facts, dare maintain a criminal relationship. And who would be broken on the wheel tomorrow if only we had the necessary evidence and, unfortunately, it is lacking after her death, I say. I was deluged by every imaginable piece of misfortune. All I had, I lost. I lost all your mother. Left me, as well. For eighteen years now I have subsisted thanks to public charity alone. But I have found you at last, Juliet, and all my sufferings are soon to be over. Sir, I have a sister who in all likelihood is still floundering amidst hardships caused by the prejudices I rid myself of very early on. Is she also your child? Justine? That is correct. She is indeed my daughter. The woman who bore her loved me. That love endured despite every obstacle I alone had the joy of making her a mother. Great heaven, cried the unhappy Justine. My father lived and I knew him not. Dear God, had thou but brought us together, I would have been a comfort to him, and soothed him in his distress. I would have shared with Av him the little I had, and my sympathy would have compensated for the unkindness which, sister, he had probably to endure at your hands. My child declared the Marquis, out of all patience with Justine after the night he had spent with her. If you are allowed the honor of being present at this gathering, it is not to afflict us by your Jeremiads. Pray, continue, madame. Knowing me as you do, my friends, you must realize that this affair was distasteful to me, inasmuch as there are few souls so poorly attuned to gratitude and filial sentiments as mine I did not. Dropped one tear at the loss of the person I had always assumed to be my father. Would it have been natural for me to be moved by the calamities which had befallen this other one fate restored to me? And the bestowing of alms, I need hardly remind you, was not a pastime to which I was much given. I considered charity the worst use money could be put to. And this insolent beggar might talk as he liked about being my father. The fact remained that to satisfy him... I had either to part with some silver or plead in his favor before a minister who, 